the Syrian frontier. Mac Bolan watched the desert landscape sweeping past beneath him, bathed in moonlight, seemingly close enough to touch. Ten minutes had elapsed since the Sikorsky Super Stallion helicopter crossed the border into Syria from Israel. There was no line in the sand to be observed by day or night, but Jack Grimaldi knew the score. We're in. In danger, that would be. In trouble so deep there might be no saving any of them if the operation blew up in their faces. David McCarter looked up from intently double-checking gear and guns. In the shit, you mean? We can deal with this shit, but are we in time? No one could answer that one until the chopper set them down and they covered the last two miles to their target on foot. They were three against fifty or sixty minimum, and Grimaldi had sworn to stay out of it unless he got the killing signal. Only then would he return with mini guns and rockets to mop up the target, and by then it would most likely be too late. Alive or dead, they would have failed. Seven minutes. Ten minutes since they crossed the border, running under radar, and seven more to reach their drop point. The Sikorsky's cruising speed averaged 173 miles per hour, which meant they were making good time. It would be all for nothing, though, the flight and what came afterward, unless they found Amar Saman, where the Rat had predicted he'd be. The Rat hadn't wanted to give up his info at first. Another Rat had given up his name for money. But the low man on the food chain was a fighter, committed to the cause he served. It had taken two days and part of a third to convince him that discretion was not necessarily the better part of valor. Rebecca Mindel's people handled the interrogation, hammering away at one question and only one until the young man broke. It was distasteful business, but they had the answer now for what it might be worth. Mindel's people had recommended a surgical airstrike. An F-4 Phantom in the night, perhaps, with fuel air bombs to fry the life from every breathing thing and fuse the very desert sand into a sea of molten glass. Bolin had argued long and hard against scorched earth this time, because it would have left him in the dark and let the enemy escape to plot another day, and that was unacceptable. He had a score to settle with the men he sought, wherever they had gone to ground. It was a blood debt, granted, but it went beyond revenge. Payback was only part of it, and not the greatest part at that. Bolin had reason to believe their grand design was operational despite setbacks, still more or less on track. Revenge was pointless if he couldn't stop them cold before they cleared the finish line. Unless he killed the plan, it made no difference what happened to the men. And to locate them, Bolin needed Amar Saman. One minute. Final check. Bolin went over his gear from habit more than from necessity. The AKS assault rifle was ready, cocked and locked. Likewise, the Beretta 93R semi-auto pistol on his right hip, tied down in a gunfighter style. The rest of Bolin's gear was ammunition and grenades, canteens, and basic medical supplies. He carried nothing in the way of food because he didn't plan on being down that long. If he was on the ground more than three hours, chances were that he'd be dead, and snacks would be superfluous. It's time. They could suddenly feel the chopper settling, vertical descent bringing Bolin's stomach into his throat the same way it had on his first combat drop. Some things never changed. Let's go! McCarter led the way with Mindel close behind him. Bolin lingered for a last word with their pilot, while the chopper hovered six feet off the ground, riding a swirl of dust. Remember what we talked about, Jack. I know, I know. Wait for the squeal. Whichever way it goes. Whichever way. I hear you. Bolin bailed out. <laughs> He dropped into a crouch and scuttled through the sandstorm created by the chopper. His eyelids narrowed to slits. When the Sikorsky lifted off and banked away, it felt as if the rotor wash might suck him after it. But gravity hung on, and Bolin cleared the settling pall of sand. McCarter pointed off to the northeast. This way. Bolin spent several precious seconds with his compass. That way. The three of them began to run. It was an easy run by moonlight over flat and fairly solid ground. The drill instructors, who had tried their best to break McCarter years before, when he was still a green recruit with SAS, would call it nothing but an easy lap around the track. Soldiers were driven to the limits of endurance in training for precisely that reason, so that they could run for miles on hostile ground and still reach their destinations, ready to kill or to die, whatever the mission might demand. McCarter didn't check his speed to let Rebecca Mendel keep up, and there was no need for it. After all they'd been through the past two weeks, her stamina was taken for granted, fueled by anger and a strong desire for revenge. He shared her feelings in that respect, 
wanting a chance to spill some blood on behalf of her uncle, his friend, but the mission took priority over vengeance. The Briton counted footfalls, judging every stride to be another yard behind him, closer to the target. Marking off the distance helped, along with regulated breathing. It gave him a sense of progress toward his goal, when all about him looked the same as far as he could see. Soon the enemy should be within reach. McCarter had memorized photos of Amar Saman, trusting that he could recognize the man on sight under most conditions short of pitch darkness. He had studied the face not to smash it, however. This time he was hoping to bring its owner back alive, for a while anyway. McCarter ran with simple grace, feeling the bandoliers of ammunition slap his ribs with every step. Their weight was comforting. Surveillance estimated 60 shooters in the Arab camp at any given time, and sometimes twice that many doubled up in crowded tents. No matter. With the gear he carried, if they didn't drop him first, McCarter could kill each mother's son among them three to six times each. Bolan and Mindel helping out meant they were into righteous overkill. And if that wasn't enough to do the job, he'd fight the bastards hand to hand. But one of them was meant to live, at least until he talked. Whether Saman was in the camp this night or not, they needed one live tongue wagging to send them on their way. Desert nights were cold. Whether a trekker found himself shivering on the Sahara, the Gobi, the Kalahari, or the alkali wastes of Death Valley. It was a cosmic joke of nature that desert wildlife had to hide from the relentless heat by day, then search for sun-baked stones to keep them warm by night. Cold or not, McCarter was sweating by the time he finished the first half a mile, and with the best part of a second well behind him now, he hoped the men he'd come to surprise wouldn't smell him coming. That thought led him to an image of Rebecca Mindel running on his left, but McCarter dismissed the thought before it could take root and distract him. She was a woman, certainly, but they were fellow soldiers at the moment, and she had her grief. Unfortunately, it was the worst possible time and place for a distraction. Rebecca Mendel seized the opportunity to catch her breath. She would have run all night if need be, but that form of exercise had never been her favorite. The gear she carried weighed nearly one quarter of her body weight, slim as she was, but no complaint escaped her lips. She was intent on listening, absorbing what she had to know and what she had to do, to stay alive to make it right. They had one target in the camp. The other 60 or 100 men were rifle fodder, but the trick was this. If they missed Amar Saman somehow, they'd have to choose another of his men to milk for information, and they couldn't know which was the best choice. It thus became a challenge, and she hoped she wouldn't let the others down. She owed this to her uncle more than anything, although he'd never know what happened here tonight. Mindel had no settled opinions on the afterlife, but she didn't believe the dead kept watch on those they left behind. If that were true, she'd have been paralyzed for fear of doing anything at all. The camp was spread before them in a natural declivity that hid the tents and single-story buildings from a casual observer passing relatively close to the east or west. It didn't spare the camp from aerial surveillance, though, nor did the camo netting stretched overhead between poles prevent infrared cameras from noting signs of human habitation underneath. Sun-warmed equipment, generators, cooking fires, and body heat all registered and were recorded on the fly. A missile or a smart bomb could have easily found the camp and leveled it, but this mission demanded the personal touch. Mindel was lucky after everything that she had been allowed to come along. Her superiors had initially protested, citing her uncle's death as a distraction and unsettling influence but they'd finally conceded that her established working relationship with David McCarter and Mike Blansky made it impractical to insert a new player so late in the game. They would trust her to a point, but if she faltered... They were splitting up again, the plan determined well before they boarded the Sikorsky for their moonlight run across the border. It was triply dangerous that way, but also more efficient. Amar Saman wasn't quite the proverbial needle in a haystack, but they still had better odds of spotting him and taking him alive if they divided forces and fanned out around the camp. Above all else, Mendel wanted to do it right, locate the men responsible for her uncle Yaakov's death and punish them, defeat their plan for wiping Israel off the map. Estranged as she had been from her religion for the past decade or so, the woman found time to offer up a silent prayer. She didn't know if anyone was listening, but reckoned it could do no harm. All right. Here we go again. Mindel, you take the southwest corner of the camp. Sure, Blansky. 
McCarter and I will circle away toward the east and northwest sectors, respectively. Cheers, mate. They synchronized watches, agreeing to step off at precisely 2.15 a.m. From that point, it was every soldier for him or herself until one of them found Saman and radioed the others to confirm it. Failing that, it would be the big American's call to disengage and call their pilot for a pickup that might save their lives. Mindel watched Blansky and McCarter move away in darkness, quickly lost to sight. They used the night effectively, accustomed to its moods and shadows even here on unfamiliar ground. Despite the hostile odds, Mindel was grateful not to be among their enemies this night. There would be blood before sunrise, and plenty of it. More blood. When would it ever be enough? They're all dead. A moment later it was time, and she moved in, a gliding shadow bearing death among her enemies. Khalik Faran was happy he'd been left in charge. It was a sign of trust that Amar Saman permitted him to serve as acting captain when Saman was called away to deal with pressing matters elsewhere. It was perilous, but promising, perhaps a taste of rank and new responsibilities to come. Granted, Faran would have preferred to be promoted under better circumstances. He'd been stricken, as they all had, by the news of Wasim Jabbar's death in Israel. Faran had known no other leader since he first joined Allah's lance at age 19. He had been on the verge of weeping when he heard about the massacre, but rage quickly replaced his grief. There would be vengeance soon when Saman returned. What was that? Faran was startled out of his cot by the scuffling sounds outside, behind the two-man tent he occupied alone. Frozen in place, the dirt floor gritty underneath bare feet, he listened, waiting for the sound to be repeated. It wasn't. It might be nothing, he decided, but a vigilant commander wouldn't let it go. The price of negligence was too high, and the cause had lost too many men already in the past ten days. Faran dressed swiftly, silently. He scooped up his pistol belt and buckled it around his waist, pleased with the 9 millimeter Tukagipt pistol's solid weight against his hip. Outside his tent, the night was cool and fragrant with wood smoke. Faran circled his tent, seeking the source of that elusive sound, suspecting that he was on a fool's errand. Trouble now meant he would have to deal with it, and for all his pride of leadership, Khalik Faran lacked confidence. When it came to combat with a seasoned enemy, he knew himself to be on shaky ground. Faran's eyes were still adjusting to the night when he stumbled over something in his path and fell sprawling on his face in the dirt. <coughs> Mindful of watchers in the shadows, he sprang instantly erect and dusted off his stinging palms. Shit! The young man now had a clear view of what he'd tripped on. It was a body, stretched out prone as he had been a moment earlier. He whipped out his pistol, grimacing as raw flesh met cold steel. He felt slightly absurd, but kept the silent form covered as he advanced, ready to fire at once if it appeared to be a trap. You there! Get up! The figure didn't answer, didn't stir. Faran crouched to its left, noting the khaki uniform before he reached out with his free hand, prodding at the body. Nothing. Not a flinch or whimper from the man whose face was still concealed. Faran probed for a pulse, recoiling as his fingertips sank half an inch into the dead man's open throat. His fingertips were crimson in the faint moonlight, dripping. That meant the wound was fresh, the killer doubtless still close by. Faran bolted to his feet, nearly losing his balance as he spun full circle, sweeping the night with his pistol. No one sprang upon him from the darkness, but he still didn't feel safe. One of his men was dead, the blood still fresh and warm, his throat slashed by unknown hands. He didn't know the dead man's name, but if he was in uniform at this hour of the morning, he had to be one of the sentries on duty. That meant he should be armed, but a second glance revealed no weapon anywhere in sight, and that, in turn, meant that the man who'd stabbed him now had a Kalashnikov assault rifle. Ferran made another full turn, scanning shadows, clutching his pistol in a two-handed grip to keep it from trembling. He was about to raise the alarm when someone beat him to it. Faran left the corpse where it lay and sprinted toward the sound of gunfire on the north side of the compound. Wake up! Attack! The enemy is here! Wake up and bring your guns! McCarter hadn't planned on firing, but the two young Palestinians had given him no choice. They were 20 feet or more away, both staring at him, breaking off their conversation as they recognized a stranger by his outfit and the war paint on his face. 
The stream of bullets from McCorder's AKS had cut through both men before they had a chance to raise their weapons. They were dead or damn close to it by the time they hit the sand. McCarter moved. There was no system to it, only instinct, backed by years of field experience and training. One second he was rooted like a statue where he stood, with the rifle warm in his hands. The next, he was away and heading through the shadows on his way to somewhere else, if not safety, perhaps the next best thing. He was hunting, with no idea of where his human quarry was, or if the man he sought was even in the camp at all. It was a gamble, information possibly mistaken, maybe obsolete, but it was still the only game in town. McCarter met two gunners bolting from a tent, lurching erect with automatic rifles in their hands. He scanned their faces swiftly, saw that neither one of them was Amar Saman. They died where they stood, falling together in a heap. McCarter was surrounded now. Spraying a camp with automatic fire was one thing, but the danger cranked up to another level when it came to going in and bringing out one of the enemy alive. The Briton wished he could have sat back on the rim and blazed away, or let Grimaldi hose the camp with fire from several hundred feet above but he would play the cards as they were dealt. Two more sentries came upon McCarter. McCarter gutted them both. There was no time for mercy now, no place for hesitation. It was do or die, and he could feel the bloody reaper breathing down his neck. Bolin butt-struck the sentry with his rifle, felt his jaw go as the AK's pistol grip made contact, following through with force enough to put the young man down and keep him there. Two more were rushing toward him through the darkness, firing as they came, and Bolin ducked aside, going to ground behind an empty tent. <clears throat> it wasn't cover in the strictest sense, as canvas wouldn't stop a 22 slug, much less military rounds from a Kalashnikov assault rifle, but all he needed was a moment of confusion. Time enough to make the play he'd worked out in his mind at lightning speed, even as he began the move. He rolled the full length of the tent, concentrating on the angle he would need when he came out the other side. He'd have a second, maybe two, before they recognized their danger and swung right around to bring him under fire. They weren't expecting Bolin at the west end of the tent, maybe believing they'd already cut him down. One of the shooters blinked and spun to face him as he rose from cover. The executioner raked him and his comrade left to right and back again, watching the points of impact blossom crimson in the firelight. He was up and moving even as they fell, not trusting luck to cover it. Bolin had no idea how many shooters still remained alive in the camp, but every one was a potential deadly enemy. Until he found their leader, or someone to put him on the leader's track, the only tactic that made sense was pushing forward, dropping any rifleman who crossed his path. Bolin knew much of the gunfire he heard was members of the opposition firing at one another or in shadows. If Mindel or McCarter had been singled out and cornered, He'd expect the shooting to be concentrated, more deliberate. Instead, wherever Bolin looked, he could see young men running about in various stages of undress, muzzle flashes from their weapons blistering the night. It covered the soldiers' passage through the camp, but it also made his work more dangerous, since stray rounds killed as quickly and efficiently as any sniper's well-aimed bullet. Bolin had covered half the distance from his entry point to Mindel's when he met Faran. Brandishing a sidearm and moving through the chaos of the compound, he was trying to rally the troops before they killed one another, grabbing a straggler here and there, dragging them into line behind him. He had picked up half a dozen in this manner, calming them enough to quell their random firing, moving on a course that would cross Bolin's in another 40 yards or so. Bolin knew it wasn't Amar Saman, too young, too lean, but Bolin guessed the man would have some idea where Saman could be found. First, though, he had to be disarmed and stripped of his supporters so that they could talk in private without interruption. He veered off to meet the little party as it neared him. Sheer ferocity was all he had to power through a confrontation where the numbers were against him. Guts and the precision of a master sniper who had made tough shots before when everything he had was riding on the line. He came against the party from its left, dropping the leader's men with three and four round bursts that toppled them like cutout targets in a shooting gallery. The leader of the slaughtered squad was stunned. He gaped and tried to raise his pistol, but Bolin was on him before he could make target acquisition. The AKS slashed down across his wrist and snapped it, numbing fingers on impact, dropping his weapon to the ground. The guy was brave enough to go for it left-handed, staring in the face of death, but Bolin caught him on the backswing, opening his right cheek to the bone with the rifle's blade sight. The Arab staggered, blood streaming from his wounded face and soaking through the khaki shirt he wore. Bolin reached out and caught him by the throat, slippery now, and jammed the auto rifle's muzzle underneath his chin. English? I speak. Amar Saman, where is he? Not here. 
You want to live? Make me believe it. Yesterday he went. Went where? I, I don't know where. We'll see about that. Bolin reached for the transmitter clipped to his belt. Shit! Grimaldi thought it was the killing squeal at first. They had two signals prearranged on different frequencies. One meant the probe had gone to hell, and he was wanted back there on the double, bringing fire from heaven to incinerate the enemy. The other meant his recent passengers were ready to dust off and hurry back to Israel. This was the pickup signal, though. Grimaldi saw that when he double-checked the frequency and felt his dread morph into pure excitement, jumping nerve synapses as if he were holding live wires in his hands. Ah, damn. Strangely, it had a calming influence, as if danger thrilled and relaxed him all at the same time. Grimaldi powered the Sikorsky, its six-blade main rotor a howling blur of motion, 36-foot blades holding the chopper 50 feet above the desert floor. At that altitude, the Stony Man pilot pulled a screen of dust and grit along behind him, as if laying down a smoke screen. In daylight, his adversaries would have seen him coming. But this night, with running lights switched off, the snarl of his twin GE turboshaft engines was all they'd have for warning. And from what he saw, at one mile out, that wouldn't be enough. The camp looked like a nest of fireflies gone berserk. The camo netting had been torn in places, shot to hell more like, and even where it held together he could see the muzzle flashes winking, knew that every shooter still alive down there was burning rounds on something, whether they had targets in their sights or not. That made it rough for anybody coming out, but Grimaldi had faith in Bolin and McCarter. If the woman was on par with either one of them, he guessed she'd do all right. At half a mile, he keyed the jungle penetrator's automatic winch, unreeling the steel cable with an object on the end that vaguely resembled an anchor or grappling hook. Its three flanges were seats, though, the probe designed specifically to be lowered through jungle canopy for extraction of personnel waiting below. Five hundred feet of cable waited on the spool, but Grimaldi wasn't deep-sea fishing this time. Ten percent of that would do it, once he found his comrades waiting for their lift. There, just ahead of him and slightly off course to the south, a plume of white smoke wafted from a marker. He spotted them a few yards farther out. He counted four figures and wondered how they meant to work the pickup, but his first concern was focused closer to the camp, where armed guerrillas were emerging from the gully, streaming from underneath the camo net like fire ants searching for the enemy who'd kicked their nest. Grimaldi reeled out the jungle penetrator's cable while he lined up on the hostile point man with his GE M134 miniguns. Electronic sighting did the work and Grimaldi manned the triggers, each six-barreled weapon spewing 7.62 millimeter rounds at a cataclysmic rate of 6,000 per minute. Living flesh could never hope to stand before that storm of fire and metal, each round traveling downrange at 2,850 feet per second. Grimaldi's targets weren't merely toppled, they were shredded and dismembered, painted on the slug-swept sand in shades of brown and crimson. Those who quailed and turned to run were cut down anyway, too slow in reconsidering their options. After seconds of ungodly carnage, when the last ranks broke and fled, Grimaldi swallowed hard and let them go. He held the chopper steady for another moment, feeling weight on the line as he reeled in the probe, waiting to see if the shaken survivors would counterattack. No shots were fired his way, and no one raised a head above the rim of sandy earth to test his marksmanship. McCarter and the woman scrambled through the open side door, reaching back for someone still outside. They dragged a weakly struggling figure through the portal, followed instantly by Bolin, rifle slung across his back. Grimaldi flashed a smile. Somebody call a cab? We're done. For now. Home base? No rush about it. We need to have a few words with our new friend here before we land. Bolin couldn't be sure what would happen to their prisoner on touchdown since captured terrorists had an uncertain life expectancy in Israeli custody. Liaison was another problem, even with Rebecca Mindel on the team. He took for granted that they'd lose custody of their prisoner on arrival at the Tel Aviv airbase, and there was no guarantee that anything he told Mossad's interrogators would make its way back to Bolin's ears. It was a one-shot deal, and with Grimaldi holding the Sikorsky to a steady cruising speed, Bolin knew they were swiftly running out of time. He sat himself directly opposite the hostage, watching the Arab nurse his fractured wrist. They hadn't bound his hands, small mercy, and his feet were likewise free. Where could he go, unarmed, with Mendel and McCarter flanking him? Look, when we touch down, you'll be delivered to Mossad. You know who they are? Butchers of my people. <laughs> I don't know what they have in mind for you, but there's a chance it might go easier if I could tell them you cooperated. 
The hostage smiled at him, a pained expression, but he seemed to find some cause for mirth in Boland's words. You think me so important? Perhaps I am entrusted with some knowledge that will help you to destroy my comrades? I don't give a damn about your friends right now. I'm looking for the men who use your people to further their own agenda. An American, a Greek, and a Chinese. Your trip is wasted then. I know of no such men. I didn't think you would. That's why I need to speak with Amar Saman. You lie! You would kill Amar, as you or others like you murdered Wasim Jabbar. The hostage was closer to the truth than he realized, but Bolan let it pass. You trust Saman? Of course! I guess you'd be surprised to learn he sold out Allah's lance and everything you're fighting for to fatten up his new Swiss bank account? More lies! We're wasting time on this one. Let's throw him out. The captive tried to edge away from McGarter on his left, but the move brought him closer to Rebecca Mendel, and she jabbed a sharp elbow into his ribs. <coughs> we radioed ahead that we were bringing in a prisoner. How would we cover losing him? An accident? Or better yet, a suicide. This sort all think they're guaranteed a place in paradise if they get killed in Allah's service. I don't know. All right, here's a thought then. We could strap him to the probe and do a little sand fishing. I've got a tenor says he can't run fast enough to keep up with the whirly bird. I never bet on a sure thing. Bolin watched the Arab's worried eyes. No money then? Just for the sport? Or, or for a round of drinks? I'll say our pilot's good enough to drag him ten miles anyway, before his legs drop off. Does that include his feet? Feet? Hmm, who knows? His boots aren't even laced, much less top quality. I'll give you three miles on the feet. What would we use to strap him on the probe? Duct tape ought to do it. Bound to be some tucked away in here somewhere. Okay, you've got a bet. The captive didn't panic until Bolin reached across to grab the jungle probe and lifted it across the deck, setting it between his feet. A carter rose and took a short walk aft, returning moments later with a roll of silver duct tape. Never fails. You need help getting on, Haji? You can't do this! Why not? Assad will likely shoot you anyway. We're saving them the trouble. Think of all those virgins waiting for you in the garden. Milk and honey. You're a lucky man. You've got your principles, and we're fresh out of time. I'll help you. McCarter gripped the Arab's broken wrist. Ah! The heavy roll of duct tape dangled from his other hand. You're making a mistake! Won't be the first time. I'll live with it. Here you go. McCarter tossed the roll of tape to Bolin, gripping the prisoner's right arm in both hands now, while Mindel took his left. Thanks. Ah! Together, they grappled the struggling Arab to his knees and edged him toward the slim yellow shaft of the jungle probe. Their prisoner fought back as best he could, but he was overmatched. Bolin peeled off a long strip of tape and held it ready to receive the captive's jerking hands. Ah, no! No! Please! I lead you to a man! We're not recruiting guides. Tell us where he is, and let it go at that. The Bikar Valley! It's not exactly pinning down coordinates, Haji. I only visited the camp one time. Give me a map. I'll show you where it is. One map of Lebanon coming up. Mindel had driven them in a gray Volvo sedan to a safe house with a small attached garage. It was situated two miles from the airbase where they had left their terrified prisoner. She had driven too fast and jumped the traffic signals, careless of police, even then. Now that they were settled at a table in the kitchen under bright fluorescent lights, she let herself relax, but not entirely. So, the bloody Bacar Valley. I'll call that pretty rich. You've been there? Haven't you? No. It's not the sort of place Mossad sends female agents. I can see that. Though well, you'd pass all right, I reckon, in a Shador. <laughs> Not my style. We can put wardrobe on hold. Bolin spread out the map their prisoner had marked. We need to know the ground first thing. Mendel was already conversant with the basic geography. Lebanon was Israel's northern neighbor, half the size of her homeland at 4,000 square miles. More than half the nation's 3.6 million people lived in Beirut, on the Mediterranean coast. Two mountain ranges ran north to south, cupping the fertile Baca Valley between them. The Litani River traveled south through the valley, then veered west to feed the sea below Beirut. The Baca was notorious for many reasons. As a launching pad for terrorist raids against Israel, it hosted training camps for a variety of militant groups. Hezbollah, Hamas, the Palestine Liberation Front, 
and two mutually hostile factions of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, to name only the most prominent or notorious. Shiite Muslims, under tutelage of Iranian intelligence units, also use the Baqa as a base for counterfeiting, producing super notes, American hundred-dollar bills so sophisticated that detection outside a crime laboratory was virtually impossible. In any given year, Mossad estimated, the Baqa Valley's craftsmen produce twice as many C-notes as the U.S. Treasury, shipping their product to Europe in wholesale lots for infiltration of the tourist trade. And politics aside, the fertile Baqa was a perfect place for cultivating poppies, refining their sap into opium base and then heroin, an illicit traffic protected by state-of-the-art weapons and security devices. Taken together, the Baqa Valley was a good place to avoid and an easy place in which to die. The site their prisoner had marked was midway up the valley, ten or twelve miles west of the Syrian border, some forty miles by air from Israel's northern frontier. An overland approach from Syria compounded danger of betrayal, meaning they would have to make another airborne run, and this time there would be no safe place for their craft to linger, waiting while they did their work. You think he told it straight? I think he told us what he knew. That doesn't mean it's accurate. Saman could have moved on by now, if he was ever in the Baqa to begin with. So you want to let it pass? We can't do that. I'm thinking maybe it's a one-man job. Except you don't speak Arabic. That means I'll have to go along. And leave me out? I don't much like the sound of that. After I booked a special tour and all. You both know what you're getting into. Nobody knows exactly with Bakar. That's the beauty of the place. Just when you think you've got it hacked, it turns around and hacks on you. Sounds like we need to brush up then. Why don't you start? The Bakar's unpredictable, except in one respect. If anything can possibly go wrong, who it will. You want to work out who's in charge of any given sector at a given time? Haul out a Ouija board or throw darts at a list of suspects? It's as close to anarchy as anything I've seen outside of Columbia, of course. You make it sound like the Wild West. I wasn't in the Wild West, but I've been in the Bacar Valley a time or two. It almost got me killed. I won't say it's the worst action I've seen, but it was damn well bad enough. No law enforcement as we recognize the term. It's more accurate to say no law. There's no dearth of official uniforms, per se. Too many sometimes if you're working on the covert side. The Lebanese army isn't good for much, but it makes the occasional sweep, mostly collecting payoffs for its officers and muscling any operators who won't come across on schedule. Then you've got the South Lebanese army to make things interesting. McCarter half turned toward Mendel. You'd know that lot, I think. Not personally. Of oh, course not. My mistake. The SLA was left behind when Israel pulled up states in 1985, and they've been a sort of early warning system for Tel Aviv ever since. It has uh, de facto control over 8 or 9 percent of a countryside below Beirut. In practice, small units probe northward whenever they can, sometimes as far as uh, the Bacar, looking for contact with hostiles. And since anyone they meet up there is hostile, they shoot first and pass on questions entirely. We'll be on our own. With every man, woman and child against us. America and Britain may still have a few friends in Beirut, but you'll play hell finding any in the Bacar. As far as an Israeli representing the Mossad, <laughs> I'll take my chances. We all will up there. Even in Mufti, there'll be no mingling with the locals. Not with a woman as our only interpreter. We'll be sounding alarms all the way if we're spotted. A quick in and out, then. In theory. Still, that means we have to cover half the length of a country undetected and make the insertion without jumping into an ambush. That done, we need to hit our mark on a first try. If this map is anything but spot-on accurate, we won't have any means of judging where we ought to go or how to get there. We'll be stuck waiting for pickup and damn lucky just to get out empty-handed with our skins intact. We've barely got a first chance. If there won't be a second. What happened to positive thinking? Oh, all right. I'm positive we won't have any second chance to do it right. It's down to trust, then. I could reach out and have my people squeeze the prisoner, see if he tries to change his story. That won't prove he lied the first time. Only that he'll say whatever is required of him to hold the pain at bay. What's then? I'd vote to go with what we have. I've seen men scared to death, and he was right there on the edge. I don't believe he lied. But was he right? 
You know the only way to answer that one. Go in and have a look. That's it. McCarter turned to Mindel once again. It would be nice to know we had some backup from your people if it starts to fall apart. I have approval for logistical support. They'll fit us out with costumes and disguises, weapons, anything we need in that respect. But there's an end to it. Your friend and the Sikorskis are our lifeline. If we lose them, we'll be on our own. Deniability will be preserved. Oh, that's bloody marvellous. No stain on Israel's honour then, I take it, eh? God forbid you'd cross a border without asking permission first. You understand the situation just as I do. We've crossed that border countless times. My point exactly. But this mission is strictly covert. You are aware of that, I think. There's been no overt act against my country, and Mossad won't tip its hand to global petroleum on our behalf. The powers that be would rather start from scratch with a new team and do it right if we go down. It's always nice to be expendable. That's nothing new. We've all been there. And done that, thank you very much. It doesn't stop one hoping for a change of pace. Maybe next time. If there is one. We either play the cards we're dealt, or else we fold. McCarter thought of Yakov Katzenelenbogen and the sacrifice he'd made to bring them this far. Right, I'm in. But you should know. If I get my fucking head shut off, I won't be pleased. Can't fault you there. Before we pin the details down, I'd better make a call. Hal Brignola was reading a report on illegal arms traffic and the Russian mafia. There were two telephones on his desk, placed side by side, but only the private line rang through without a heads-up from his personal assistant in the outer office. Marking his place in the eyes-only folder and stealing himself for bad news, Brignola snared the receiver on its second ring and brought it to his ear. Brignola! Stryker, are we scrambled? Just a second. Brignola reached out again and thumbed down a button on the telephone's chunky base. A green light winked twice at him, then shone steadily. The red bulb next to it remained inert, telling Brignola that the line was clear of taps. All set. What's happening? We missed Simon, but we've got a new line on him from the guy he left in charge. Reliable? We won't know that until we're on the ground. And where would that ground be again? The Bacaw Valley. Jesus... Brignola felt his stomach tighten, had to consciously relax his jaw to keep his teeth from grinding. There were certain godforsaken places on the planet where he wouldn't care to send an enemy, much less his oldest living friend. Calcutta's slums, Colombia's Guajira district, Sarajevo. The Baca Valley ranked high on any list he could think of. Are you there? Uh, sorry. Tell me what you need. Just Jack for now. I think we've got logistics covered. Back up. We're on our own, beyond material assistance. Mossad doesn't want to get caught with its hand in the cookie jar this time. Terrific. Anyway, I thought you'd better have a line on where we're going, just in case. Brignola sneered a ballpoint pen and notepad from the top drawer of his desk. Okay, let's have it. Bolin rattled off coordinates. How firm is that? I think the source was playing straight. Whether he knew his ass from a subway tunnel is another story. As I said, we won't know till we're on the ground and in the thick of it. It doesn't get much thicker than the Baca. We're taking every possible precaution. Short of staying home. I don't mind passing on it if you've got locations on our targets. Napier, Mach, Andrastus. Nothing yet. So, we're going in. If we can find Saman, Smart Money says he should be able to give up one of the three at least. From there, we just connect the dots. Brignola didn't waste his breath telling the warrior to be careful. Bolan knew the risks of every move he made, but danger seldom put him off. He'd risked his life for less important missions in the past. This time, the fate of nations could be riding on the line, Israel's at least, and there was still the vengeance factor, settling up the score for Yakov Katzenellenbogen's recent death. Bolin had known the old Phoenix warrior for years, had fought beside him more than once, and David McCarter had been Katz's companion on deadly missions without number. There was no good reason to suppose that either of them would let the matter rest without more blood. No damn reason at all. What can I do to help? It wouldn't hurt if you could spare Jack for a few more days. He's yours. Anything else? I think we're covered, hardware-wise. 
If we can find Saman and pin him down, we'll need transport ASAP to keep the ball in play. I'll reach out now and see what I can do. Appreciate it. That's all I can think of right now. Okay. I'm around if you need me. We'll be in touch soon. I hope so. It was bad, going into the Baka with no idea if your target would even be present. There were too many ways to die in that free-fire zone as it was, each new uncertainty only serving to make the risk greater, the peril that much worse. Bolan and McCarter were pros, of course. They knew what they were doing and how best to get it done in any given situation. But skill wasn't the only factor in a killing game. There was chance to be considered, or call it luck. Hell, call it fate if that helped the bitter pill go down. It all came out the same way, in the end. And it meant there were factors no amount of planning could predict or control. No degree of training or experience made the least bit of difference when a soldier's proverbial number came up. Brignola stopped that train of thought before it pulled out of the station, but it still left a sour smell in the room. Bolin had pushed his luck for so long now, each time he took on another mission it was like playing Russian roulette. So far, the hammer had always fallen on an empty chamber. If anything went wrong for Bolin and McCarter in the Baca Valley, it wouldn't spring from any omission or oversight on Brignola's part. He swore that to himself and hoped that it was good enough to let him sleep at night. Brignola snared the other telephone to call the Pentagon. It helped keep him from picturing disasters in his head if he was busy, and he still had promises to keep. The problem isn't getting in. Jack Romaldi scanned the large-scale map of Lebanon. It isn't even getting out. The problem's getting back in if you need the transport in a hurry. You can do it, though. Give it the college try and then some. It helps that they don't have an air force in the normal sense. Scout planes and that, but nothing in the way of modern fighters. Radar? Where it hasn't been knocked out. They want that early warning if Israeli jets come over. Not that it does them much good. Grimaldi felt the woman watching him, but didn't flinch from it. He'd meant no criticism, but if she was bound to take offense, to hell with her. He'd known her less than one full day, and she was easy on the eyes, but he was there for Bolin and McCarter, not to snuggle with Mossad. Stingers. That's what you'll need to watch. They might have grails or gremlins, too. Grimaldi was referring to the Russian SA-7 shoulder-launched surface-to-air missile and its big brother, the SA-14. With the American-made FIM-92 Stinger, any one of those weapons could bring his next flight to a sudden, fiery end in the Lebanese sky. He glanced up from the map and found the others watching him, and smiled. No worries. The Sikorsky's got a flare cartridge dispenser to confuse heat seekers. And they'd have to know I'm coming anyway to get a fix in time. That wasn't strictly true, Grimaldi knew. If any of the paramilitary groups whose territory he'd be crossing had lookouts posted, armed with any kind of decent SAM technology, the sound of his approaching helicopter would provide all the warning they needed to shoulder a firing tube and activate the sighting mechanism. He could vary his route between the first penetration and withdrawal, but after that, he'd be running short of options in a country the size of Lebanon. Granted, it wasn't a postage stamp like Liechtenstein, but if Bolin and the others needed him for pickup in a hurry, there'd be no time for elaborate evasive maneuvers or swinging miles out of his way around the target zone. He'd have to keep his fingers crossed, and maybe say a little prayer or two for what it might be worth, and he would fly like a bat out of hell. You'll have to get out right after the drop. That's affirmative. There was no place in Lebanon to safely hover, much less land the whirlybird and wait for his colleagues to complete their mission. It galled him to leave them that way, but variations on the theme had been Grimaldi's lot since he had volunteered for Bolin's war, back in the day when it was Bolin going one-on-one -on -one against the Mafia. He'd always found the big guy waiting for him, more or less intact, when he returned, running on guts and sheer audacity, so far. I'd like to get the chopper fitted with some rocket pods before we do this thing, Mendel. Can do? It's not a problem. Good. The quad mount hellfires are my first choice, but I'll take what I can get. Something with punch for air-to-ground engagement. I'll see to it. Leave the miniguns in place and top the ammo off. All right. Aside from that, it comes down to you three. I can get you in, fall back, and hold on station till you need a lift. I got the easy job. All present knew that wasn't strictly true. They also knew, without saying so, that if Grimaldi took a missile up his tailpipe on the flight back to Israel after the drop, 
they'd never know it. Not in time to help themselves, at any rate. They'd go about their mission, maybe even pull it off, but there'd be no pickup when it was time for them to go. And that, barring some kind of miracle, would mean they were as good as dead. There'd be no hiking out of Lebanon, not from the Bekaa Valley, eighty miles north of the nearest Israeli frontier. Syria was closer, a mere stroll by comparison, but they'd find no help there, only more peril. Escaping on foot with a prisoner in tow was unthinkable. Grimaldi was plainly and simply their only way out. They were trusting him with their lives and the fate of their mission, and he didn't mean to let them down. Okay, just so we're clear on everything, let's just go over it once more. Boland stole some time for himself when the meeting broke up. There was no more to say at that point. The mission had begun as a rescue effort ten days earlier. Yakov Katzenellenbogen, lately retired from Phoenix Force to ride a desk at Stonyman Farm in Virginia, had been visiting family in Israel when he recognized some faces on a busy street and tagged along to see what they were doing in the heart of Tel Aviv. His curiosity had put him in a cage, confined and tortured by a group of mercenary terrorists intent on learning what he knew about their latest plot. His disappearance had made waves back in the States, Brignola sending out two of his best to find cats and retrieve him if they could. They'd managed that all right, but rescue hadn't been the end of it. Cats knew enough to put them on the track of a conspiracy involving wealthy men from the United States, Greece, and the People's Republic of China. More to the point, while Bolan and McCarter were hunting, Katz had slipped away from his niece on the eve of a transatlantic flight and went to do some hunting of his own. When the smoke cleared, Katz was dead, with lots of company, but Bolan and McCarter were no closer to their quarry than they had been on day one. He had three names and faces to fit them. Arnold Napier was the jet-setting CEO of Global Petroleum, rarely at home in the United States these days. Christos Andrastos was the Greek shipping magnate, whose fleet carried much of Global's crude. Lin Yuan Mak was a Chinese trade official based in Hong Kong, scheming with the others to arrange a shift of power in the Middle East and thereby earn his nation access to the region's vast oil reserves. All three of them, it seemed, had disappeared. Running them down required information he didn't possess at the moment, and that in turn led them to Amar Saman, assuming they could ever track him down. The lead in Lebanon was promising, but they would have to play it out to know if it was just a lethal waste of time, a waste of life. Bolan thought of Katz and all the others who had died since Brignola handed him the ill-fated rescue mission. Going in, he hadn't known what it would become, but he would have taken the job anyway. There was no refusing when friends were in peril, no letting the killers walk because Bolan had failed to prevent Katz's death. The mission had evolved from that point. It wasn't simply payback anymore, although he had a debt to settle with the enemy that wouldn't be expunged as long as any of the principals were still alive. There was a great deal more at stake than sweet revenge. Justice was part of it, but only part. Peace was an issue, though the region where he found himself had known no peace for generations, going back three quarters of a century or more. More than either of those concepts, it had to do with keeping the predators in line, jerking the leash, and calling for a reckoning. It was what Bolin did best of all, addressing savages in the only language they truly understood. Negotiation was a futile exercise, because a predator by nature wanted it all. He, or she, was never satisfied with one score, one victory, regardless of its size. Sometimes they got what they were asking for. Sometimes they got Mac Bolin. The first round had been too expensive for Bolin to think in terms of victory just yet, but neither would he countenance defeat. A soldier who dwelled overlong on losing had already given up his edge. Defeatism was a disease, and no combatant was immune. Each warrior had to guard against it constantly, and pledged that if the battle went against him, he would take as many of the opposition with him as he could. Surviving in the Baka Valley wasn't easy, but it could be done. Finding their quarry wouldn't be a milk run— but they had a fix on him and carried the advantage of surprise. The rest of it came down to guts and skill, a willingness to do what had to be done and live with it for long years afterward, holding regret at bay with knowledge that some deeds were necessary. Bolin had come to terms with that mindset in his youth, and it served him well now. McCarter knew what had to be done and wouldn't hesitate. As for Rebecca Mindel, she had done her part so far without complaint— the trial ahead would test her further. She would either pass the test, or she would die. 
Bolin was hoping she'd survive. There was no time for him to start a Berlitz course in Arabic. Jakarta Arnold Napier sat before his computer, rereading the email from Damascus. It was cryptic, not so much coded as a string of euphemisms, seeming innocent to a casual observer, but the tale it told produced a sour feeling in his stomach. It read, Unexpected developments. Our field reps have met with surprise opposition from new competitors. We assume, but cannot document, a link to previous transactions in the area. A number of the sales force have retired. The foreman was on holiday and missed an opportunity. Your call on whether disciplinary measures are appropriate. Standing by. The email wasn't signed, but Napier recognized Worthington's style. The global petroleum representative in Damascus always phrased his messages as if he were dictating a telegram to Western Union. It surprised Napier sometimes that Worthington ended his sentences with periods instead of typing stop. For all that, the message required no codebook to decipher it. The field reps in Syria were soldiers of Allah's lance, the Palestinian guerrilla army Napier had recruited as part of his plan to destabilize Israel and thereby earn the gold-plated gratitude of certain oil-rich Arab states. Surprise opposition meant another in the series of attacks that had already decimated Allah's lance and killed its leader, Wasim Jabbar. Retirement of the sales force meant that a substantial number of guerrillas had been killed or gravely wounded. The missing foreman was Jabbar's heir apparent and Napier's new toady, Amar Saman. His holiday would be a bid to save himself by leaving the grunts to fend for themselves. Napier was on the verge of answering, fingers poised over the keyboard, prepared to order Saman's execution in bland, oblique terms, when he caught himself and leaned back in his chair. He swiveled toward the eastward-facing window. Thankful it was tinted as the tropic sun reflected from hundreds of windows in the office tower across the street. He could seal Saman's fate with a word, but what would it accomplish? Allah's lance might have some life left in it yet, and even if the group was finished, Napier knew he had to be cautious of appearances when dealing in the Arab world. Without the lance, he'd need another army to perfect his plan, and allies might be hard to come by if word got around that he was prone to killing those who let him down. A wiser course of action, he decided, was to simply let Saman fend for himself, wherever he had gone to ground. If the heir to Allah's lance could rally his forces and destroy their still unidentified opponents, the lethal shadows who had dogged Napier's tracks and tormented him for the past ten days— it would be self-defeating to eliminate him. By the same token, if those faceless enemies were too much for Saman, they would most likely do Napier's work for him, relieving him of any guilt among other Palestinian militants. That decided, he tapped out a short message in response. No action necessary at this time. Keep me informed. He read it twice, hit send, and waited for the task to be completed, then switched off his computer. Jared Wagner hadn't moved a muscle while Napier read and answered his email, planted in a seat directly opposite the massive teakwood desk, sitting ramrod straight in his chair. He was too nervous to relax, painfully aware that his predecessor had been shot to bloody ribbons less than sixty hours earlier. He didn't know, need never know, in fact, that those bullets had been fired by Napier's men on Napier's orders. Why disturb the young man's mind with trivia? Bad news from Syria, sir? Cigar? Uh, no, thank you, sir. <sighs> Napier chose a Havana from the humidor and lit it with his gold-plated desk lighter, careful to hold the flame an inch below the cigar's square-cut tip. He kept Wagner waiting, stretching it out until the tobacco was burning smoothly. Another strike against our Palestinian associates in Syria. I'd hoped this might be settled, but it seems we've still got trouble on our hands. I'm sorry to hear that, sir. Don't be sorry. Help me end it. Uh, yes, sir, if I can. First thing, we need to warn our friends. It wouldn't do to have them think we've kept them in the dark. No, sir. I'll let you handle that, Wagner. Jump in at the deep end, as it were. Uh, yes, sir. Wagner had lost a bit of color in his face at the prospect of dealing with Mock and Andrastus directly. They'll have questions, naturally. Don't feel obliged to answer them. We're waiting for details ourselves, that sort of thing. You know the drill. Of course. I'm unavailable, but I'll get back to them as soon as possible. 
tomorrow or the next day unless something breaks meanwhile. I understand. I don't anticipate Mock giving you a problem, but Andrasa sometimes likes to throw his weight around. Don't argue with him, don't be rude, but hold the line. You've told him what we know so far. Which is? Just the bare-bones basics. More trouble with the Palestinians. We don't know who's responsible so far. Could be the Israelis or some rival faction. They'll find out when we do. Yes, sir. In the meantime, there's no reason to believe they're personally at risk. Both have security in place. They don't need our advice on how to watch their backs. Shall I get started on that now, then? You may as well, in case I'm wrong. Wrong, sir? About the threat assessment. I'm not wrong often, Jared, but it happens. And I'd hate to see one of our partners get his ass shot off because I told him not to worry. Wagner lost a bit of color he'd regained. Napier watched him swallow some ill-advised comment, his Adam's apple wobbling up and down. No, sir. We can't have that. Damn right we can't. You go take care of it all, all right? Yes, sir. Napier maintained the smile until he was alone, then let it go. His natural optimism had taken a beating over the past ten days, and this morning's news from Syria was another sucker punch, landing where it hurt the most. He could have badly used a victory just now, but the Arabs had let him down. Again. It wasn't their fault altogether, but Napier needed someone to blame at the moment, and who better for the role than a troop of self-styled holy warriors who'd gotten their asses handed to them time after time, beaten bloody by a team of hostiles they couldn't even identify, much less pin down and destroy. It was embarrassing, a travesty, but Napier reckoned it was small potatoes for a people whose military history included being run out of their own homeland by poorly armed invaders and crushed in six days flat when they sent the massed armies of three nations against tiny Israel in 1967. Defeat was almost a religion with some Palestinian armies. He couldn't fault them for their nature, but it would have been a treat to see them kick some ass for once instead of getting pounded like a slab of beef. Maybe they need a little help. As Jared Wagner walked the corridor to his office, he decided that the problem with being promoted over someone's dead body was that it meant he could go the same way. In some jobs, when you got the axe, you really got the fucking axe, or bullet, as the case may be. He wasn't privy to the gruesome details, granted, but from what Wagner had heard around the office, and it wasn't much, his predecessor in the VP slot he occupied had soaked up something like a hundred bullets, maybe two hundred, and went to his reward in a closed casket, no viewing allowed. Wagner had only known Sterling Holbrook casually, wouldn't miss him to speak of, but he didn't relish going out the same way, not by a long shot pun most certainly intended. He was apprehensive about calling Lynn Mock and Christos Andrastus, but he would do as he was told. He was playing in the big leagues now, and there was no slack cut for squeamish members of the team. Napier would shelter him from any flack, he thought, unless... The rumor troubled him from the moment he'd first heard it whispered. Never mind by whom. The source was less important than the gist in this case. And the gist was that smiling Arnie Napier might have sacrificed his loyal number two in the heat of the moment, angling for a personal advantage in a deadly game. Truth be told, that notion bothered Wagner less than the idea that Napier had failed and the game was still going on. It was his turn to play now, and he couldn't help wondering how best to avoid Holbrook's fatal mistakes. He'd have to keep a sharp eye on personal security until the problem was resolved and avoid giving anyone a clear shot at his back, friends included. On second thought, make that friends especially. Wagner was proud of his promotion, looking forward to the pay raise and a chance to work with real movers and shakers, legality be damned, but he wouldn't sacrifice himself for Global Petroleum or Arnold Napier, no damn way at all. He'd made it this far in the cutthroat world of multinational business by striking a happy medium between loyalty and self-preservation. Now, when the term meant more than simply hanging on to a job, the costs of letting down his guard were all the more obvious, all the more lethal. Wagner had the contact numbers for Lynn Mock and Christos Andrastus memorized. It had been his first order of business upon assuming Sterling Holbrook's duties. They were cutout numbers, naturally set up to reach their principles anywhere on earth without giving their locations away. 
That was fine with Wagner, since he didn't want to know where they were. The less he knew on that score, in fact, the safer he might be over the next few days or weeks. His office was a loner, vacated on short notice by a dark-skinned man who bobbed his head and faked a smile on his way out the door. Wagner hadn't bothered to read his name on the door, and couldn't care less what the stranger was thinking. He needed a desk and telephone for the duration of their stay in Jakarta, however long that proved to be, and no one argued with the new vice president of international development. The newly acquired bodyguards were stationed outside his borrowed office. Wagner knew them as Lyle and Cage, last names irrelevant and of no interest to him whatsoever. They were tall men, muscular beneath their richly conservative suits, bulked up as much with hardware as with muscle. He didn't know what they were carrying. Guns had never been one of his hobbies, but he trusted Napier's word that they would kill or die for him as needed. Wagner expected nothing less from a pair of professional bullet catchers. Lyle, sporting a blonde bad boy ponytail, nodded to Wagner as he passed. Wagner tilted his chin in reply, but kept his face deadpan. He didn't court familiarity with subordinates, unless, of course, the subordinate in question was an attractive female, in which case he had charm to spare. As for these two, it couldn't hurt to be civil when his life might depend on them, but he refused to support the illusion of friendship. What was the point of promotion if he couldn't look down on those left behind? The borrowed office didn't suit him, but it hardly mattered. Settled at the desk, he didn't miss the view of London that his normal office windows offered. Here, with no windows at all to distract him, he could concentrate on his assignment, reaching out to God knew where and touching base with Napier's partners. His partners now. It struck Jared Wagner, not for the first time, that he was playing in a vastly different league. Running the London office was one thing, a sort of rear echelon command where shuffling paper and stroking egos was the order of the day. He'd now received the equivalent of a battlefield promotion, propelled toward the literal firing line by forces beyond his control. Wagner was as close to real danger now as he had ever been in his life, and it had never once crossed his mind to resign. You're stalling now. There was no room for hesitation in his new position. The vice president in charge of international development for global petroleum would be decisive, confident, aggressive, even if he didn't know what the hell he was doing. He picked up the telephone receiver, keyed nine for an outside line. Wagner tapped out the number from memory, reaching out halfway around the globe to give one of the world's richest men more bad news. Aboard the Aristotle, Strait of Bonifacio. Christos Sandrastus had chosen his small yacht, the Aristotle, a mere hundred-footer, for the sense of privacy and intimacy it afforded him. He owned two others, larger, which he preferred for parties and corporate functions. The Aristotle, named for his old friend and one-time competitor Onassis, was reserved for occasions when Andrastus wanted to get away from the world and his life, roughing it with only a dozen TV, VCR, DVD combinations, one modest satellite dish, one sauna, and a positively claustrophobic dining room that seated only 25. This time, He'd even left the whores at home. Their place had been taken by gunmen, standing aloof from the yacht's working crew. No task on their plate beyond making sure that Andrastus kept breathing. If they failed in that task, it was well understood, the corporation he commanded would stop payment on their checks and send better, more efficient men to hunt them down. Lounging on the yacht's foredeck, watching Corsica slide past to starboard, Sardinia to port, Andrastus felt no immediate threat to his life. He had enemies, of course, and bloody ruthless men among them, but those he feared most at the moment were far away, hunting one of his partners in the blighted Middle East. Or were they? The uncertainty dogged him, soured his mood, and put a frown on his deeply tanned face. Andrastus viewed everyone with suspicion as a matter of course, but the sensation troubling him now was something else, something more. He had begun to think one of his teammates in the bold new game might want him dead. There was nothing to support that notion yet. Indeed, for all he knew, it might be nothing but an idle fantasy. Still, much had happened in the past two weeks that made him wonder, made him doubt. Of the two candidates, Lynn Mock and Arnold Napier, he mistrusted the American more. Chinese were cagey, sly in business, 
but Andrastas thought Lynn Mach had far too much to lose by tipping the boat, as it were. Arnold Napier, on the other hand, was devious to a fault, entirely capable of manufacturing a threat and using it to help consolidate his power in their small consortium. But would he do it? Was it worth the risk? Napier had to know the consequence of betrayal at this rarefied level, when the stakes were nothing short of monumental. There would be no reprimand and no recrimination, certainly no litigation to resolve disputes. Betrayal meant death, carried out by professionals and without recourse to appeal. Andrastus took another slow sip of ouzo to calm himself, enjoying the licorice flavor on his tongue. It was early days yet to imagine himself at war with Napier and the marshaled forces of Global Petroleum. It might be a war to remember, but why borrow trouble when there was always enough to go around anyway? He would be ready if and when the trouble came, but it wasn't time to consider a preemptive strike. Not yet. A shadow fell across his face. Theron loomed above him, offering a giant hand in which the white cell phone looked like a toy. A call for you, sir. The oil man. Andrastus took the phone and waited for his valet to withdraw. Satisfied with his solitude, he brought the phone to his ear. Good afternoon, Arnold. Excuse me, sir. My name is Jared Wagner. I'm the new VP for International Development at Global Petroleum. I'm calling on behalf of Mr. Napier. At his instruction, actually. I suppose it's too much trouble now to make the call himself. Well, no, sir. Uh, there's been a problem that demands his attention elsewhere. I was asked to let you know and offer Mr. Napier's most sincere apology. The boy was lying now, Andrastus knew. Napier apologized for nothing, ever. It implied that he was fallible, and that would simply never do. It was now time for the Greek to lie. Apology accepted. What is the problem that bedevils him? More of the same, sir, I'm sorry to say. There's been another, um, incident with our Palestinian associates. Indeed? Andrastus didn't like the Arabs, didn't trust them. They were necessary for a job like this, and while his own success was bound to theirs, he couldn't find it in his stony heart to mourn whatever injury they suffered for the cause. Uh, last night in Syria. We just found out, and, and don't have all the details yet, but Mr. Napier wanted you to know first thing. Steps will be taken, I assume. They're in the works, sir. And will I be privileged to know what steps those are? As soon as it's been finalized, sir. I assume you'll be among the first to know. Among the first. I see. Does your employer recommend any particular precautions at this time? No, sir. We think the danger is localized. Containable. But not contained. We're making every effort, sir. Of course you are. I understand. What of Saman? I understand he missed the show, sir. We should all be thankful for small favors, I suppose. Yes, sir. If you have any need to get in touch with I me. doubt that very much, young man. If your employer needs to speak with me for any reason, I believe he knows my number, yes? I, I'm sure he does, sir. If I may just say... Andrasta switched off his cell phone before Napier's vice president for international development could pucker up and kiss his backside. There were times when he enjoyed obsequiousness, even needed it, but not this day. Just now, he needed time to think without some upstart droning on and on, tireless as some mechanical rabbit with everlasting batteries. He was safe for the moment, vulnerable only to airstrikes or submarines, and willing to assume that Napier's nameless enemies, his now by extrapolation, possessed neither the requisite technology nor knowledge of his whereabouts. While the foe was preoccupied 1,200 miles to the east, mopping up ragtag Arab soldiers, Andrastus had time to review his priorities and triple-check his security precautions. If trouble overtook him, on sea or land, he wouldn't be caught napping. One benefit of being grossly, extraordinarily wealthy was that virtually nothing lay beyond his reach. He had access to fighting men and weapons, armored vehicles, aircraft, luxurious hideouts. The world was literally at his fingertips. Christos Andrastus meant to use it well and to remain alive no matter how his adversaries schemed to bring him down. Good men had tried it in the past, but they hadn't been good enough. Nor, he was certain, would this lot prove equal to the job. Andrastus wished he knew their names, though, or at least where they had come from, whom they served. It would have made things so much easier in terms of dealing with the threat. Still, there were ways to get things done. 
At one time or another, Andrastus had mastered them all. He would survive because it was his nature, and the men who schemed against him would be sorry, screaming out the final hours of their lives. Andrastus sipped his ouzo in the sunshine, and he smiled. Macau. Lin Mock was sipping coffee laced with bourbon when his secretary knocked, then entered without waiting for a summons. Mock greeted the twenty-five-year-old man with a raised eyebrow, wishing for perhaps the thousandth time that the Communist Party could be somewhat less efficient in erasing gender traditional work roles. It would have pleased Mock greatly to have a twenty-five-year-old woman at his daily beck and call, but instead he had Zhao Peng. He looked as if an honest smile would cause his face to shatter. A phone call, sir. Who is it?、Uh, Mr. Wagner, sir, from Global Petroleum. Mark frowned at the name.、Mm, I'll take it. Line three, sir. Mark was reaching for the telephone, but hesitated, glowering at Pang in the doorway. Is there something else?、Uh, no, sir. Then close the door as you leave. Idiot. Mark lifted the receiver to his ear and pressed the only lighted button on the telephone. Line three, of course, as if he couldn't see that for himself. Hello, Mr. Mock. Yes, sir. My name's Jared Wagner. Mr. Napier asked me to call you on his behalf. I'm his new vice president for international development. A euphemism, Mock decided, as when spies attached to foreign embassies were labeled as cultural attaches. The man on the other end of the line would be what Americans called a gopher, though doubtless well paid for his efforts. I see. Mock had been expecting bad news from the moment he learned the call's source. Now, understanding that Napier couldn't bring himself to break that news personally, Mock guessed it would be even worse than he'd anticipated. Sir, I'm afraid we've had another spot of difficulty with the Palestinians. No great surprise in that, Mock thought. The more he heard of them, the more he was convinced that all Middle Eastern revolutionaries were incompetent or demented, with the worst a mixture of both. What is it this time? They've taken more casualties in Syria this time. Mock's mind leaped ahead, projecting results and repercussions. If their Arab strike force was disabled, it would set the project back at least six months, perhaps a year or more. If their security was breached above the local level, it could be the end of everything they'd planned and worked for over the past eighteen months. And if they couldn't identify the enemy, identify and eliminate the enemy, then it could be the end of everything, the end, perhaps, of Lin Yuan Mock. What is the assessment of exposure? We think the problem is contained, but that's a judgment call. We haven't managed to isolate the opposition yet, so nothing's definite. With luck, they'll focus strictly on the Palestinians and not pursue it any further. I would have expected your employer to deliver this news personally. No slight intended, sir. I'm taking over for Sterling Holbrook. The late Sterling Holbrook. Yes, yes. And Mr. Napier thought it wouldn't hurt for us to get acquainted, as it were. He's following the situation closely as we speak, and I was asked to reassure you that he'll be in touch as soon as possible. I don't need reassurance, nor am I much concerned with simple courtesy. It would displease me greatly, though, to think that Mr. Napier has abandoned his responsibilities to save himself. Believe me, sir, nothing is further from the truth. He has a firm, continuing commitment to the project. It's his first and last priority. The young man was an accomplished liar. Mock gave him credit for that, without crediting all that he said. It was Arnold Napier's nature to protect himself at any cost. He called it looking out for number one, and Mock expected nothing less from a wealthy man of influence. He had honed those skills himself through years of political intrigue and party infighting, carving a niche and defending it against all comers, accumulating and consolidating power in a system where paranoia ruled and every man was suspect. Lin Mock hadn't survived this long by fully trusting anyone but himself, and he trusted Arnold Napier only within narrow limits. Napier and Global Petroleum had influence in realms where Mock could never reach. By the same token, the ultimate success of their joint venture hinged upon him and his contacts in Beijing. Without him, the scheme was a dead letter, unless other arrangements had been made. Nonsense. Mock would have known by now if Napier had attempted to circumvent him, cut him out of the plan in favor of some less expensive lackey, wouldn't he? No special precautions are advised then. None needed at the present time, sir. Mister Napier has asked me to say that he'll be in touch personally within the next twenty-four to forty-eight hours.
Before any action is required on my part. That's affirmative, sir. Mock glowered at the telephone receiver, wishing the smug young upstart could see his contempt for the double talk so many Americans affected these days. He wondered sometimes if they were afraid to voice a simple yes or no, as if words of one syllable might somehow bind them to a course of action they would rather not pursue. Forty-eight hours, not a moment longer. That's a promise. I'll hold you to it. Goodbye. Mock hadn't asked about Amar Saman since the Arab's fate held no meaning for him, one way or the other. Revolutionaries were a yen a dozen in the Middle East, lining up to sacrifice themselves for Allah in true fanatic style. In Mock's view, they were living proof that Marx was right about religion. It not only lulled the captive masses into willing servitude, but also sent young warriors to their futile deaths, propelled by superstition to expect a glorious reward in the afterlife. What sort of fool believed that strapping C-4 to his body and blowing himself to bits in a crowded marketplace would guarantee passage to paradise and eternity in the arms of willing, nubile virgins? The very notion reeked of insanity, a product of peasant brainwashing from cradle to premature grave. He didn't worry, then, about Saman or the young men who served him. There would always be more, ready to squander their lives for a chance to uproot the Israeli state and recapture their ancestral homeland. The fact that they and their predecessors had failed to achieve the common goal, after fifty-odd years of ceaseless effort, spoke more to their resources and their innate ability than to the mission itself. There is still hope. If not, then his time had been wasted, too, and that was unacceptable. It made him vulnerable, placed his very life at risk. It made Lin Mock a fool. Scowling, he reached out for the telephone once more. Napier and his lackey might not believe increased security precautions were necessary, but Mock trusted his own judgment in such matters. What good was it being an official of the People's Republic if he couldn't flex his political muscles from time to time? Lin Mock would mount a defense. And if he found that Arnold Napier or Christos Andrastus were scheming against him, he could mount an offensive as well. In fact, it would be his pleasure. The Bacau Valley. Bolin was a hundred yards from the drop zone when Grimaldi lifted off and took the chopper back toward Israel, running low and dark. He waited in the darkness, hidden by a stand of trees, and watched the chopper go. He hoped Grimaldi made it back, as much for friendship's sake as for his own. One friend was more than Bolin cared to lose this time around. He saw Rebecca Mindel coming through the moonlight. Close behind her, bringing up the rear, was McCarter, sliding into cover of shrubbery. Let's go. He started moving north. Mindel gave him a twenty-yard lead before following, McCarter leaving the same space between himself and the woman, still taking rear guard. The drop was roughly two miles due south of their intended target, a patch of undeveloped scrub and woodland where no one had yet planted opium poppies or laid out a guerrilla training camp. They'd been lucky to find an LZ that close to their quarry, Bolin knew, since a longer walk through the Baca would have increased their peril and might have put them at the target after daybreak. This way, at least, they had the night to cover them. They were armed as before with Kalashnikov rifles, untraceable sidearms, and Russian frag grenades, the RGD-5 anti-personnel model. They wore generic fatigues in desert camouflage patterns, with labels removed. Their combat boots were army surplus, broken in by prior owners they would never meet. Combat cosmetics darkened their faces, and their fingers protruded from their cut-down shooter's gloves. It was an hour past midnight. A waning moon provided all the light Bolin required to hold his course. There was a road off to his right, but he kept his distance from the broken pavement, ready to go belly down and take the others with him at the first sound of approaching vehicles. They had no friends within the Bacaw Valley and if they met anyone along the way tonight, they could assume the chance encounter was with an enemy. Bolin focused on the ground ahead of him, ever watchful. Halfway to the target, he began to slow his pace, watching and listening for sentries. His first choice was a quiet probe, but that could go to hell in seconds flat if they ran into pickets on the outskirts of the camp. He didn't know how skittish Amar Saman might be, but with the recent losses Allah's lance had suffered in Israel and Syria, smart money said his nerves would be stretched tighter than piano wire. Assuming he was even there at all, Bolin dismissed the thought of missing his quarry a second time in as many days. He still didn't think their terrified informant had been lying, though the information might be out of date or simply incorrect. 
The soldier smelled the camp before he saw it, a lingering odor of fried meat competing with the smell of untended latrines. The combination would have made an effective appetite suppressant had Boland been thinking of food. As it was, his mind had zeroed in on another odor, sharper and closer at hand, tobacco smoke. Boland signaled the others to wait, drawing his knife before he followed the aroma to its source. He found the sentry idly smoking, staring back toward camp when he should have known the danger lay without. It was the young man's last mistake. Boland came up behind him in a rush. He swung an arm across his throat and drove the knife between his ribs, twisting hard and deep to make it count. The sentry shivered, then went slack in his grip. Gravity helped him set the young man down. He wiped the knife and sheathed it, motioning for Mindel and McCarter to close up. There may be more. You'll have to watch it going in. No sweat. Ready, then? Ready. As ready as I'll ever be. Bolin eased his rifle off its shoulder sling. Let's do it. Aerial photos had given them a clear view of the camp's layout and allowed them to estimate its population. Based on the number of tents and latrines, McCarter knew roughly a hundred fighting men of Allah's lands were currently in residence. Call it thirty to one, then, and there was only so much that Surprise could do to trim those odds. A man worried about his future would have likely let it pass, but McCarter still owed something to Yakov Katzenellenbogen and to the men who'd killed him. This night, perhaps, another overdue installment on that debt would be paid, and he would be that much closer to settling a full account. The Briton entered the camp from the west, slightly closer to the apparent command post than either Bolin, east, or Mindel, south. It was pure luck of the draw, maybe a break, and maybe not. Fortune was with him so far, no more sentries on his part of the perimeter, but the plan didn't rely wholly on stealth. They could search the camp all night, one darkened tent at a time, without finding Amar Saman. This time, to improve the odds, they had agreed to let Chaos assist them for a change, beginning now. McCarter's first stop was the motor pool, midway between his point of entry to the camp and the CP that was his final destination. The camp's rolling stock included two covered trucks, three old model military jeeps, and a half dozen mismatched civilian vehicles, ranging in size from a two-door subcompact model to an old station wagon with dramatic rust-flecked fins in back. Three dirt bikes at the far end of the line completed the collection. McCarter passed along the line of dusty vehicles, stopping at the first, the fourth, and so on down the row. Each time he paused, a gas cap was removed and twisted cloth inserted in its place. When one end of the cloth was soaked with gasoline, McCarter pulled out the wick and reversed it, feeling the brief chill of gas on his fingertips, breathing its fumes. He finished rigging all the chosen vehicles, including one of the trucks, one jeep, two cars, and one of the dirt bikes, before he started back along the line, lighting the fuel-soaked wicks in reverse order. No dawdling now, time to move. He broke cover and started for the CP, not running, rather walking with a purpose, as his SAS instructors used to say. Most of the compound lay in darkness. He couldn't escape a challenge if he met one of its tenants face to face, but from a distance, there was still a chance that he could pass. The dirt bike went up like a rocket on Guy Fawkes Day, bouncing on its shock absorbers as the fuel tank blew, then flipping over on its back. The station wagon was loud enough to rouse anyone in camp who wasn't on his feet already, scrambling for a weapon or a pair of pants. Bright arcs of flaming gasoline were sprayed in all directions, setting fire to vehicles on either side of Ground Zero. They were burning fiercely by the time a second car detonated, settling on melted tires in a lake of flame. McCarter's luck went sour when he was still 20 yards or so from the camp command post. The CP's door flew open and disgorged a slender rifleman. He wore a khaki cap and rumpled pants to match, but he was barefoot and bare-chested, clutching an AK-47. McCarter stood between him and the motor pool, backlit by fire, his face invisible, but something in his look or attitude alarmed the enemy. The gunman wasn't Amar Saman. That much was obvious. He began to raise his weapon. Shot it! McCarter fired from the waist, near enough to his target that aiming was superfluous. A short burst of 5.45 millimeter rounds tore through the Arab's bony chest and pitched him backward, bare arms flailing as he fell. McCarter glanced around, keeping the CP covered, still advancing. Nearly all the vehicles were burning now, only a matter of time before their gas tanks added secondary blasts to the confusion. One thing at least was obvious. Whoever fled the camp this night, McCarter and his friends included, would be traveling on foot. McCarter reached the CP, spared the young man he had killed a passing glance, and stood before the open doorway, ready for whatever lay within. Sod all, you bastards, then. 
Inside the CP, moments before, Saman had moved toward the window, mouthing a silent prayer. He had slid the window open, fumbling in an ecstasy of fear, and used the butt of his Kalashnikov to batter out the flimsy screen. He had leaned out and let the rifle drop, first making sure its safety was engaged. That done, Saman had edged head first through the window. The sill ground painfully against his ribs, his stomach, then snagged on his belt buckle. He rocked his hips with desperate urgency, sweat beating on his face despite the chill night breeze. Why had he even put the pistol on? It was about to get him killed unless he could... The sudden drop took Saman by surprise. The drop was no more than five feet, but he still skinned his palms, bruising his cheek on the Kalashnikov when his arms wouldn't hold him. Rolling away, Saman ate dust. He scrabbled for the weapon that had wounded him, knowing that it could mean the difference between life and death. Struggling to his feet, he used the rifle as a crutch to push himself upright. A burst of gunfire sounded from within the CP hut itself, shocking Saman out of immobility. He turned and ran. Safety lay elsewhere in the desert's outer darkness. He could reach it yet if he was resolute and didn't falter. Those he left behind could do without him. They need never know his courage had deserted him. Saman cleared the first row of tents beside his quarters, then glanced back to see if anyone was following. A dark shape backed by firelight stood in front of the command post. Was it staring after him or turned away? He couldn't tell and was afraid to wait. Saman faced forward, lurching in the split second before colliding with another form that barred his path. Ah! This one was smaller, verging on petite, but there was nothing small about the AKS rifle it held. Eden harm! What? The rifle swung and clubbed him down. Ah! Rebecca Mendel checked to make sure Saman was still breathing, then took a pair of handcuffs from her pocket and snapped one of the bracelets on Saman's left wrist. She pulled the arm behind his back and cuffed it to his right. It would have been so easy to finish him, but he was needed alive. Perhaps later, when he had spilled his guts, Mindel could put a word in someone's ear to see that he was shot while trying to escape. Or maybe Saman would simply disappear into a prison cell and be forgotten there until he died, one of the worst fates any ardent revolutionary could endure. But first, she had to get him out of there alive and back to Israel, where he could be questioned on the whereabouts of his associates, the men who paid the bills and kept their distance while the bloody war dragged on. Hey, come on. Wake up, you bastard. She suddenly saw a shape approaching through the darkness. In a heartbeat, she was ready with her AKS, tracking the form that filled her sights. I'd prefer you didn't shoot me if it's all the same. All right. You bagged him, Ben. I did. Good job. I got some of his papers from the CP, but I was afraid he'd given us the slip. Not this time. Help me get him up, will you? Around them, automatic weapons spewed tracers into the darkness. As before, most of the guns were turned outward, laying down fire on the perimeter, searching for enemies the shooters couldn't see. They'd have to clear that ring of fire to get out with their captive, but they hadn't reached it yet. Saman came grudgingly around after McCarter grabbed one of his ears and twisted it. The Arab tried to struggle free, and Mindel pressed the muzzle of her AKS into his groin. We're leaving now. Your life depends on making sure nobody tries to stop us. Understand me? He defied her for a moment, and felt the rifle gouge deeper. I understand. McCarter was half turned away from her, speaking into his microphone. Striker, we've retrieved the package. Do you read me? I read. Where are you? Thirty meters out from the CP, southeast. I'm halfway there. Make for the south perimeter. We'll regroup there. We're moving out. Mindel prodded her captive. Get moving. That way. McCarter joined them, flanking the prisoner, ending any feeble hope Saman may have cherished that he could escape. He was theirs now, and the only way Mindel would release him short of delivery to Mossad handlers was if Saman forced her to kill him. That could still happen, she knew, but it wasn't her first choice. Not while he could direct her to the men behind her uncle Yakov's death. She hated Amar Saman and all he stood for, but Mindel was ready to defend his worthless life against all comers if it would advance her quest. She pegged the distance they had to travel at 150 meters, more or less. The good news was that most of the guerrillas in the camp had gravitated toward the motor pool, either believing they would find live targets there or simply hoping to find out what produced the string of fiery blasts. That could be good or bad, depending on how many shooters lay between the three of them and their escape route. Mindel experienced a moment's worry for Mike Blansky, then focused with deadly clarity on covering the ground in front of her and getting to the other side of the perimeter alive. Call it 200 paces. On a city street or in a quiet park, it would be nothing. Here, surrounded by the enemy, each step could be her last. 
The split second she used to take that step could be a lifetime. Saman broke stride, and Mindel reached out to shove him forward, keep him moving. Move! Unless you want to die! Saman? There was someone behind them. Mindel leaned into Saman. Don't say a fucking word. Stop or die! Bolin moved through the semi-darkness like a wraith. In the confusion, Firelight did as much to hide his features from the enemy as to reveal them. Those who recognized him as an interloper and attempted to detain him had died before they recognized their critical mistake. Now three more spotted him. They had to have seen him coming, maybe watched him drop one of their comrades moments earlier outside the mess tent where a young gorilla with more guts than brains had tried to take him down. Ah! It wasn't even close, the Arab dead before he fell into the ash-strewn pit they used for roasting meat and vegetables. Bolin was past it, moving on when his two shadows came from nowhere, flanking him and tried to close the trap. They almost pulled it off, he gave them that. The set was adequate, their timing likewise, but he caught a break when one of them surrendered to a case of nerves and jerked the trigger of his AK-47, not remembering the slow and steady squeeze required to do it right. Bolin had seen the muzzle flash and gone to ground as hasty bullets fanned the air above his head. Between the AK's tendency to climb when firing on full automatic and the shooter's poor technique, Bolin had room to spare between himself and the first rounds that rippled past. The other shooter tried to compensate, but by the time he started firing, Bolin had rolled out of view behind a two-man tent. He found no safety there, canvas, no match for military rounds, but his assailants hesitated in the moment they lost sight of him. Instead of pouring fire into the tent and through it, as they should have done, they waited for a moment to find out if he would re-emerge. Bolin went left, rolling across the sand, and came up with a frag grenade already primed. <clears throat> He pitched it toward the gunner who had missed him first, crouched between the two tents, but making no real effort to conceal himself. The Arab either didn't see it coming, or he didn't know quite what to make of it. In either case, he stood his ground and let the green egg drop a yard in front of him, rolling almost between his feet. The blast tore him apart and left his partner suddenly alone. He was recovering after a fashion, trying to lay down a screen of fire and save himself, when Bolin framed the young man in his sights and cut him dead with half a dozen armor-piercing rounds. The executioner moved on, making tracks before any of their comrades could respond to the grenade blast and encircle him. Mindel and McCarter were already moving, counting on Bolin to join them and help move their hostage safely out of camp. He planned to be there when they needed him, even if it meant wading knee-deep through the blood of enemies to get there. Another shape reared up in front of him. Bolin chopped it down with automatic fire. He didn't have to see a face or uniform to know his only friends in camp were well ahead of him, embroiled in trouble of their own. Whatever moved between him and the compound south perimeter was fair game for the kill. The soldier picked up his pace, pushing it. If he was late and missed the others, it would be McCarter's job to leave without him, and he counted on the rugged Brit to do exactly that. The signal should have already gone out for Jack Grimaldi to meet them at the pickup point, but Bolin reached down to his belt and keyed his own transmitter just in case. He didn't think about the odds against them, or the risk Grimaldi faced in coming back across those darkened miles of hostile territory. So much could go wrong before the rendezvous that even thinking of it seemed to amplify the risk, as if he'd thumbed his nose at fate. Be there, Jack. Saman stumbled, nearly falling in mid-stride, furious that he couldn't use his handcuffed arms to catch himself. <laughs> Rebecca Mindel caught him instead, hauling him upright by sheer will alone. <sighs> Watch your step, idiots! McCarter covered them, spinning like a dancer and firing from the hip with his AKS and toppling two gorillas who were close enough to be a threat. Others were following, but they peeled off to either side and looked for cover as a second short burst from McCarter's Kalashnikov fanned the air close to their faces. Faster! He caught Mindel's baleful glare in return. Tell this one! You tell him! McCarter ah. struck someone across one shoulder with the barrel of his AKS for emphasis. Whatever happens, win or lose, he isn't staying here alive. Mindel shoved Saman in front of her. The ranking officer of Allah's lance picked up his pace a fraction, laboring to stay a length or two ahead of them. Some fucking commando. The Briton hoped he wouldn't have to haul Saman's dead weight across the desert to the rendezvous. A shadow moved to intercept them in the darkness, both assault rifles swinging around to meet the challenge before McCarter recognized Bolin. You made it, then. Looks like. Bolin fired a burst along their back trail, scattering pursuers. McCarter triggered a burst of his own, but the human targets eluded him, ducking and weaving like reeds in a windstorm. They were good at that part of it anyway. He only hoped their marksmanship wouldn't improve dramatically within the next few minutes. We're much farther. Another click, give or take. Three quarters of a mile, approximately. 
With sporadic gunfire snapping at his heels, McCarter knew he wouldn't hear the helicopter until it was right on top of them, assuming that Grimaldi could get through this time. If he'd been shot out of the sky somewhere along the way, they were as good as dead. Shit! McCarter ducked reflexively and palmed a Russian frag grenade from its loop on his combat harness, tearing the pin free as he turned and cocked his arm for the pitch. Their pursuers had closed the gap, some firing on the run without success, others dropping to one knee and trying for a clear shot at their zigzagging targets. Darkness and movement had foiled them so far, but McCarter knew it was only a matter of time before one of the Arabs got lucky. Yeah. He pitched the grenade, losing sight of it immediately as he raked the desert with another burst of auto fire. Most of his adversaries went to ground, but two or three were on their feet when the grenade fell among them. A storm of shrapnel turned them into pincushions, their comrades scrambling for better concealment in case a second blast followed the first. It didn't. McCarter was too busy running for his life, catching up with the others. Mr. Korski! McCarter couldn't see the chopper yet, but from the sound of it, they were on a direct interception course. Grimaldi would be running dark for safety's sake. He could be right on top of them at any time. Suddenly, a floodlight blazed in front of them, searing the desert sand a hundred yards away before it was extinguished just as quickly. Beside McCarter, Amar Saman stumbled again. The Briton grabbed the prisoner's right arm and tried to hold him upright, but dead weight defeated him. McCarter crouched beside Saman and found the wound between their captive shoulder blades. His life was shuddering away before McCarter's eyes, and there was nothing to be done. From the position of the wound, McCarter knew the spine was clipped, the heart and left lung almost certainly mangled by the projectile of bone fragments. Damn it! What? Mindel dropped to her knees beside Saman in time to watch him die. You bastard! You fucking bastard! Enraged, she turned back toward the trailing gunman. Leave it! Boland dragged Mindel to her feet and toward the helicopter where it hovered 30 yards in front of them. I can't believe it! Asshole! Mindel, it's too late now. Fucker! McCarter left Saman slumped in the dirt, pushing off toward the waiting Sikorsky. Inside the cockpit, Jack Grimaldi saw them coming and unleashed hellfire upon the enemy. McCarter felt the sheaf of papers slapping at his thigh inside the cargo pocket of his pants as he ran toward the helicopter. They had been a kind of consolation prize before Mindel had snagged Saman, and now they would be all he had to show for this excursion into hell. McCarter leaped aboard the helicopter. What a bloody waste! We're in. Get us out of here. Tel Aviv, Israel. There had been a brief dispute with Mossad over the disposition of Amar Saman's private papers, retrieved by McCarter from the Bekaa encampment, but Bolan had settled the matter by offering to give them up if the Israelis would pursue all principal conspirators regardless of their influence wherever they were found. The agents he'd faced off against would probably have liked nothing better, but they understood political reality and knew they'd never be unleashed against high-profile residents of China, Greece, or the United States. Mindel had made her stand with Bolin and McCarter at the airstrip, moments after they'd returned from Lebanon. Her handlers had been waiting to receive Saman, and failing that, they'd wanted to review his notes for anything of value for their long war against Allah's lance. Bolin had balked at handing off the papers without getting a translation for himself first thing, and when push came to shove, the Israelis had stopped short of forcing a violent confrontation on the helipad. It was agreed that Mendel would retrieve the documents and file them after Bolin's team had extracted the pertinent data. It was a leap of faith for Mossad, not known for trust at the best of times, but they had nothing to lose on the long run. The documents might provide no information of value. And if they paid off, Bolin's squad would be taking the risks, diverting attention and potential scandal from the Israeli regime. The most they stood to lose so far was one agent, covered with enough layers of deniability to satisfy headquarters on that score. If Bolin's people blew it, Tel Aviv could always find another way around the problem, using stealth in lieu of a frontal assault. But first, it had to be determined if the papers lifted by McCarter offered any hope at all, they drove from the air base to Mindel's apartment, the first time Bolin had seen where she lived. It was a small place, but homey, the female equivalent of a bachelor pad, he supposed. Mindel had decorated it with photographs of family and friends, including several shots of Yakov Katz and Ellenbogen taken during rare family reunions. From his hair and the lines in his face, Bolin guessed the photos spanned two decades, charting way stations in a transient life. At least he left something, Bolin reflected. His own photo album, had it existed, would have been blank since the day he'd supposedly died in New York. 
His new face, his new life, had left no more permanent trace than a handful of ashes tossed into the wind. Unless he counted graves. They sat around a table barely big enough for four, with coffee mugs in front of them, watching Mindel page through the sheaf of documents. Some of the items concerned camp logistics, an accounting of movements and material received. There was a record of guerrilla actions dating back some eighteen months that held Mindel's attention for a while, confirming official suspicion in several unsolved cases, surprising her in one instance, a school bombing that her superiors had blamed on Hezbollah. Eight children murdered. You paid them back with interest tonight. Now stay focused. I'm looking. She skimmed through the entries of a combination diary and appointment ledger next, written out by Saman in a spiral notebook, similar to those Bolin had carried to his classes in high school. It seemed out of place on the table, surrounded by loose fool's cap pages and flimsy invoices. Mindel riffled through its pages, pausing here and there to comment on some entry, noting Saman's movements and meetings with the late Wasim Jabbar. When she stopped, finger pinning a short entry written in blue ink. Listen. Received a message from Lin Mak in Macau. Delivery accomplished on schedule. Payment forthcoming. Delivery of what? It doesn't say. There's nothing in the notes beforehand to explain it. I suppose he didn't feel the need to note details that he already knew. Or details that could make things hard for him if they fell into the wrong hands. Like ours. In that case, why make notes at all? Payment forthcoming. My guess would be that he wanted a record of the date in case the money was delayed. Macau. Well, that doesn't tell us much. It still leaves what? I don't know, 600,000 targets, give or take? It's more than we had two minutes ago. Maybe something else in the notes pins it down. But it didn't. Mindel went through the rest of the diary without discovering an address for Lynn Mock. She found no mention at all of the other targets, Arnold Napier or Christos Andrastos. He's some kind of government official, right? Something to do with trade. Not ministerial, from what I gather, but he's got pull. So chances are that he'll have some kind of an official residence, maybe some primo office space. That has to narrow down the possibilities. It couldn't hurt. I find it strange that there's no mention of the others. That would depend on the transaction. It could have been something specific to China, or even a personal contract. Either way, it's some place to start. Bloody China. We'll fit right in there. At least it's Macau, not Beijing. How may have a connection we can use? There's no time like the present to find out. Rebecca Mendel didn't trust her cell phone for the call to Mossad headquarters. Blansky had balked at using the landline from her apartment, making some excuse about his scrambler unit when they both knew he was more concerned about the possibility of built-in traps that would allow Mossad to trace and monitor his call to the United States. Mindel had reason to believe her people knew Blansky's superior by name, or title at the very least, but she couldn't fault him for being cautious in a foreign land where even so-called friends seemed hostile. After Blansky left to find another telephone, Mindel retreated to her bedroom and called headquarters, waiting for the operator in her section to raise Gideon Herzhaft. Rebecca, how goes it? It goes east. We have a lead on Lin Yuan Mak. Ah, yes? He's in Macau, or was three weeks ago. Macau? That's outside our normal sphere of operation, as you're well aware. Yes, sir. You don't exactly fit the standard profile over there. Nor do the others, sir. Uh, that's not our problem, is it, Mindel? I suspect the wisest course of action now would be for us to watch and wait. If they proceed and are successful... Then the issue should resolve itself. And if they fail... She knew the rest, although he didn't finish it. If Blansky and McCarter failed, Mossad could reconsider its options, decide whether a covert operation with Israeli personnel was wise or even possible. Mindel knew that she couldn't let it go at that. Sir, I have a special interest in this mission, as you know. A personal involvement, I believe you meant to say... The loyalty to your uncle does you credit, Mindel, but we still have rules. I've risked a reprimand or worse by letting you proceed this far. As for Macau... You know me well enough to realize I'd never compromise the service, sir. I won't embarrass Israel or Mossad. You won't intentionally compromise the service of your country, Mindel. That I take for granted. What you fail to grasp in your excitement is that simply being found in China on whatever errand could be compromise enough. 
Don't mind that blather out of Washington about the axis of evil. They're as keen for trade with China as the Chinese are to gain commercial footholds in the West. They won't look kindly on us muddying the waters, I can promise you. She understood then that the choice had already been made. The men responsible for her uncle's death weren't to be pursued outside the Middle East, if there was any chance at all of Israel being linked to the campaign. In that case, sir, I think it only fitting for the service that I should resign immediately and continue as a private citizen. <sighs> Minto. Of course, I understand deniability must be preserved. I have replacement travel documents, Canadian and Swiss. There should be ample time to purge the necessary files and... Mendo, please. You must understand. I understand perfectly, as I've explained. You'll have my resignation via fax within the hour. I'm afraid that's unacceptable. And how do you propose to stop me, sir? It's well within my power, as you know. Best make it permanent. I won't forgive the interference if you understand me, sir. I think we understand each other, Mindel. Now, are you prepared to listen and be reasonable? I'm prepared to listen. As for reasonable, I suspect our definitions of the term may be at odds. <laughs> what is it? You make me proud, woman. Such fire, such dedication. If you weren't completely insubordinate, we'd get along much better, though. Sir, I don't mean to be... Spare me, for heaven's sake. I'm about to grant your wish, unless you muck about and make me change my mind. That isn't my intention. I shouldn't think so. Now, the compromise I'm going to suggest is this. Fax in the resignation you've described, backdated before this business started. I'll keep it on file until you're finished in Macau or... Wherever this business takes you in the end. If any mischief should befall you, God forbid, deniability will be preserved. Of course, I can't assist you once you've left our local sphere of influence. If you have certain contacts in the field who might be helpful, use them sparingly and leave no tracks. Yes, sir. Uh, I mean, no, sir. We have an understanding, then. When we speak again, if everything's all right, the resignation will be lost, shredded. If by some chance we never speak again... Yes, sir. Goodbye, sir. Make it farewell, Mindel. Farewell. Washington, D.C. Hal Brignola took the call an hour past quitting time. His secretary had left for the day, but since the call was on his private outside line, he didn't need her help to patch it through. Brignola! Working late? The usual... I guess I never shook J. Edgar's so-called voluntary overtime routine. That's why you get the big bucks. Don't tell the IRS, all right? They don't know anything about my oil wells or the diamond mine. Your secret's safe with me. Speaking of secrets... Right. We lost the package, but we caught a lucky break. How's that? Our boy kept notes. They're not complete, but we have a lead on one of the players. Which one? Lynn Mock. If our source got it right, we should find him somewhere in Macau. Somewhere? It's not exactly GPS precision. It's a start. Okay. It makes me nervous, though. I know the feeling. China was nearly impossible to infiltrate. Forget about the vast interior where any Western face stood out like the proverbial sore thumb. Macau, Hong Kong, and Guangzhou, formerly Canton were cosmopolitan enough for foreigners to pass without creating a commotion on the street, but round-eyed visitors were still monitored by local authorities. Any unorthodox behavior reported to Beijing with all dispatch. Unless local authorities screwed up, that was. Unless they could be bought. I may know someone in Macau. It's a bit of a stretch, but I'll put out some feelers. What kind of deadline are we looking at? ASAP. Mac may be in the wind already. I don't want to give him any more time than we have to. Right. I'm on it. You'll need visas? Something along those lines? I was about to ask you. Right now, all we have is passports. Well, that's the easy part. Give me a couple of hours, then swing by the embassy in Tel Aviv. You'll find them holding paperwork for three. We'll need a fourth. I thought Mossad would drop you flat. They did the next best thing. The niece gets a green light, but no field support. If the Chinese ask questions, she doesn't exist. We've got some nervous Nellies here in D.C., too. I'm not sure how much I can do for you beyond arrangements for a local contact. If the contact knows Macau, that should be plenty. Brignola hoped so, but he wasn't long on confidence where mainland China was concerned. 
Whole armies could be swallowed up there, much less four field agents operating on a shoestring, bucking killer odds. If Bolin or his people dropped the ball in China, it would take a miracle to get them back for burial, much less alive. The big fed checked his watch and wondered if he'd have to call his CIA contact at home. If so, too bad. A lifer in the cloak and dagger trade should know there was no such thing as being off the clock. I don't suppose you have a contact number there. I'll have to call you back. Okay. I'll get the wheels in motion for your travel documents first thing. The contact in Macau may take a little time, say 90 minutes for the sake of argument. If I don't have an answer for you then, I'll light a fire under some lazy asses PDQ. Appreciate it. If you come up with someone, great. But we can't pass on Mock regardless. No, Brignola thought. You couldn't do that, just this once. I'm working on the others. Andrastas took one of his yachts out for a spin around the med, but so far, we can't pin him down. Nothing on Napier anywhere we look. Which only makes Macau more critical. You'll have support, even if I have to learn Chinese and do the job myself. We need to get it done this year. Nobody likes a wise ass. Sorry. That's 90 minutes. I'll have something one way or another. Home or office? Office. If anybody tries to slow me down, I've got a nice fat stash of midnight oil. Nobody sleeps until they come around. Okay. I'll be in touch. Brignola was conscious of a sudden hollow feeling underneath his ribs. He had the Langley number memorized, tapping the digits out before he had a chance to think of what he'd say, how he'd approach the matter of procuring assistance from a contract agent in Macau. He only knew he had to get it done, and soon. Grimaldi waited until Bolin, fresh back from his call to Washington, had finished speaking. While he listened, the pilot had eyed the map spread out before him. It portrayed Macau in fair detail, enough to make him feel like a fifth wheel with a flat tire, destined to make the team more vulnerable than it had to be. Questions? Call it a command. I am with you 100% if you want me, but looking at this map and knowing what little I know about China, something tells me I won't be much good on this run. Don't say you're tired of us already. I'm thinking I might be a liability. It's not an airborne mission, and unless you've got a carrier floating around somewhere in the South China Sea, the nearest friendly air base will be on Taiwan, 500 miles away. That's damn near useless for a hurry call, assuming I could sneak in past the Chinese Air Force in the first place. I was hoping for a bit more subtlety, to get us started anyway. Okay, break it down. Macau comes close to rivaling Hong Kong in terms of international finance. They've got round eyes in and out of there like a revolving door. Four more won't make a ripple, if we have the paperwork in order. Would the four have wings by any chance? I'm working on it. Something in a nice Learjet to get us started. Maybe with a chopper if we need to make side trips. High ticket items. Can we swing it? Washington still wants results. As long as there's no paper trail, I think we've got a decent shot. There's still a matter of contact on the ground. I know English is like the second language where we're headed, but I never feel quite right if I can't eavesdrop on the locals. You afraid they'll talk behind your back? I don't mind. It's the sticks and stones that worry me. In the bullets. Bullets are a problem, too. I make an effort to avoid them when I can. We have a contact in the works. I'll know more details when I check back in an hour. Trusting anyone in China would be problematic, Grimaldi thought. The communist regime had deviated so much from its former hard-line stance in recent years that it was sometimes difficult to separate the party spokesman from dedicated capitalists. But any one of them could spring a trap if he or she was so inclined. The vast nation still nurtured a thriving network of spies at all levels, from high-rise office suites to steaming rice paddies. Reds aside, there were also right-wing Chinese nationalists with their own axe to grind, triad gangsters, party loyalists, or straight-up businessmen, and enough outsiders to maximize confusion at the best of times. The old rules had been cautiously relaxed, but China still reminded him of a bear trap, cocked and ready to snap shut on the first unwary soul who brushed unwittingly against its trigger. And once the trap closed, getting out alive would be next to impossible. Grimaldi kept those worries to himself and gave the map another look. Okay, Learjet or Chopper, take your pick. Unless they got MiGs waiting for us on arrival, I can get us in. As far as getting out, it may be touch and go. One step at a time. Unless we have a clear fix on Lin Mog, it's all for nothing anyway. And how's that coming? 
It's confirmed he has an office in Macau, as well as Hong Kong and Beijing. He obviously gets around. Hal's working on a confirmation of his present situation as we speak. Sooner the better. If the mark gets wind of what's been happening out here and takes a powder, finding him in China will be damn near impossible. I'm counting on a fair amount of arrogance. He should feel reasonably safe at home, particularly if he thinks we're busy tearing up the Middle East, looking for Napier. Someone ought to be. No word on that one yet. Let's hope we're there to greet him. Bloody right. Let's hope we're somewhere, anyhow. We made it this far. True enough. But I'd hate to see the cost go any higher, if you get my drift. I hear you. When they took a break, McCarter helped himself to a soda from Mendel's refrigerator. Unlike most people he knew, the caffeine seemed to help him relax while sharpening his wits at the same time. Draining a quarter of the can's contents in one long swallow, he leaned against the kitchen counter, thinking about what was supposed to happen next. They would be leaving Israel, which was good news anyway McCarter looked at it. The team had worn out its welcome, with allies and adversaries alike. Mossad had suffered their presence out of respect for Yaakov Katzenellenbogen, and a desire to have someone else do the dirty work for a change. But there'd been so much killing now, without concrete results, that official patience was nearly exhausted. China would be another kind of war zone altogether. Instead of hunting terrorists with the covert collaboration of the government in power, McCarter and his colleagues would be operating as illegals, covert agents with no official allies to help them if the mission began to unravel, stalking a member of the Chinese communist establishment. It was a rough way to go, exacerbated by the drawbacks of ethnicity and language. Bottom line, there was a solid chance that none of them would ever leave Macau alive. McCarter didn't take such things to heart in normal circumstances, but the present situation wasn't normal. Gruff old cats had once seemed indestructible, but he was dead. McCarter got the message loud and clear. None of them was invulnerable. Anyone could die at any time. The choice of action they'd just chosen brought death closer to them, virtually breathing down their necks. McCarter knew the feeling, was experienced enough to cope with it, but nothing in his training said he had to like it. Going into China meant they'd have to fly unarmed and trust a contact still unknown, a person none of them had ever met, to hook them up with gear and weapons on the other end. If anything went wrong, say their connection proved to be a traitor, for example, they'd not only be on hostile ground, cut off from any kind of help, but they'd also be unable to defend themselves. Luck of the draw, McCarter thought, knowing he'd go ahead with it regardless of the odds, the risks, the chance of never coming home again. Besides, he wasn't sure where home was anymore. He was a British citizen who didn't live in England. He was divorced, without children. His closest friends were warriors, constantly at risk, their meager number recently reduced by one. McCarter could have counted those who'd mourn his passing on his fingers, but he also knew how they'd react in that event, the same way he was doing now for cats. A soldier's code of honor would permit no less. He drained the can of soda, crumpled it in one strong hand, and dropped it in the kitchen wastebasket. When he rejoined the others, they were running down potential arms sources in the Far East. The Philippines are easy. They've been stashing military hardware on the islands there for 50 years. For all the good it does us. If we have to go that far afield, we still have import problems. And we can't expect to catch a break at customs while we're at it, either. Macau may yet surprise you. My people work through contact agents there from time to time. Also Hong Kong. We take advantage of the European influence whenever possible. The triads haven't been suppressed by any means, and there are dissidents who trade in contraband to fund their causes. Same thing anywhere you go. Except in China, if they're caught, it could mean more than prison time. I heard about their organ donor program. <sighs> That's pretty cold. Some feel a criminal should have no rights. I hear you, but I still don't want to wake up on a gurney someday with some murderer's kidney. Ah, a man of principle. Good taste. It's not kidneys we need, people. Try Kalashnikovs. We're working on it. Wings and weapons. Is that so much to ask? I hope not. I hope not, too. Brignola had the name waiting for Bolin when he called again at the appointed time. Their guide would be one Ming Cho Hei, described by the contact at Langley as reliable and trustworthy. What's that worth in the real world? I guess it means he hasn't screwed them lately, but where they haven't caught him at it. I was hoping for a little reassurance here. I'd give it to you if I could. The company works through him, and he's not officially connected to the other side. Some kind of merchant in Macau, from what I gather. 
Triad? They tell me no. Of course, that doesn't mean he's strictly on the straight and narrow, either. Bolin hoped not, for his own sake. A completely honest man wouldn't have the connections he required for weapons and the rest of it. I guess I'll take my chances. Where's he meeting us? He'll be there when you land and help you get through customs. What I'm hearing at this end, it's not too rigorous for Western business types, unless you've done something to get your name put on the shit list. Speaking of names, the passports and visas look fine. You must have turned the heat up pretty good to get them done that quickly. Nothing to it. A word in the right ear gets the job done. Bolin knew there was more to it than that, but he didn't challenge Brignola's humility. Will he have what we need? Should have connections to supply you anyway. I gather that he's not an arms dealer himself, but that he knows someone who knows someone, that kind of thing. That kind of thing was common in the Far East, and around the world for that matter. Wherever Boland's war had taken him, there were always people with illicit connections, some of them doing more good in their own way than those who were oath-bound to uphold the law. And some of them would stab a stranger in the back without a second thought. Boland didn't know which kind of person Ming-Cho Hei would prove to be, but they were short on options at the moment and would have to play the cards as dealt. If Ming betrayed them, Bolin would exert himself to pay the stranger back, even if it turned out to be his final act on Earth. That covers the hardware on the ground. Jack's a little curious about the air. He would be. I've lined up a Lockheed Jetstar, coming your way out of Cyprus. Should be landing in an hour or so. Cyprus? Don't ask. The pilot's already been paid. He doesn't need a tip. You've got a long trip still ahead of you before it hits the fan. You'll have to do this thing in hops. Bolin guessed they were looking at 6,000 miles, one way from Israel to Macau. He didn't know the Lockheed's range, but left that part of it to Jack. If a machine had wings and engines, odds were excellent that Grimaldi could handle it as if he were born in the cockpit. As far as fuel stops were concerned, there were various airports en route from Israel to Macau, where money talked and all comers were welcome as long as they'd filed a flight plan. Barring extraordinary, unexpected difficulties with the weather or machinery, their trouble wouldn't start until they touched down at the other end, on Chinese territory. Bolin had scores to settle with the men responsible for Katz's death, and not entirely for the fact that they had killed one of his friends— Lin Mok and his accomplices had more to answer for than one man's death. With Napier and Andrastus, he'd been playing God, manipulating governments and armies, terrorizing thousands, pushing nations to the brink of all-out war. It had to stop, and Bolin meant to see that done. The executioner was pulling out all the stops and shifting into scorched earth mode. Jakarta Arnold Napier glowered at the screen of his computer monitor, reading through the cryptic email message for the fourth time. The message hadn't changed, of course. It never would, no matter how long he sat there, staring dumbly at the screen. It wasn't Worthington this time. The action had apparently moved on to Lebanon, and this email had come from Dandridge in Beirut. His style varied from Worthington's, but, like all Napier's spotters, he played his cards close to the vest. Reports of contact from the Baka AL unit are officially confirmed. No final tally, but I'm told the group has been downsized. Late word has AS among those cut. No lead so far. Advise at your convenience, D. AL was Allah's lance, and Napier didn't need a crackerjack decoder ring to know that AS was Amar Saman. Make that had been, since he was dead now just like Wasim Jabbar before him, not to mention several dozen of their best commandos. Napier glared daggers at the flat computer screen. He would have loved to smash it, pick up the damn thing and fling it right across the room. Instead, he read the message one more time, then tapped out his response on the keyboard. Maintain contact with locals and advise on any new developments. No further action indicated. That was starting to feel like his personal mantra. No action... Napier prided himself on his prudence, minimizing risk whenever possible. But he hadn't built a multi-billion dollar empire from scratch by sitting on his hands. The Palestinians were getting their asses kicked right and left, compromising their effectiveness as a strike force, assuming they had any left by now. And so far, his one attempt to help had only made things worse. The ambush he'd planned in Israel had gone bitterly awry costing him one expendable vice president of Global Petroleum and half a dozen high-priced shooters in addition to God only knew how many Arab allies. All to kill an aging, one-armed ex-Mossad agent 
whose role in the fiasco was still undefined, a mystery that tantalized Napier and enraged him all at once. He had the old bastard's name from a contact inside the Tel Aviv legal establishment, but who in hell was Yakov Katz and Ellen Bogan anyway? The name meant nothing to Napier, and the dead man's files were sealed, classified beyond the ability of his toadies to crack them, so far. He'd keep trying, of course, but in the meantime, someone else was tearing up the allies he had left in Israel and environs. Try as he would, even after speaking to one of his adversaries on the telephone, Napier still had no idea who the shooters were or who had fielded the team. He switched off the computer and spun his swivel chair to face Jared Wagner. The new VP was holding up all right so far, but he hadn't come under fire yet. With any luck, Napier thought that was a test they could avoid. But if it came to that, he was prepared to make another sacrifice. Saman? Dead, Wagner. More of his men as well. Jesus. I doubt he had anything to do with it, Jared. Unsure how to take the comment, Wagner nodded as if some great insight had been shared between them. So, what next? I believe we need to reassess our options. Keep it low profile, nothing that would draw attention to ourselves. I've still got some people working on the Middle Eastern problem, trying to learn more about this Yakov what's-his-name. Nothing so far? A one-armed senior citizen, for God's sakes. What is this, a remake of The Fugitive? I swear, sometimes I feel like giving up and letting somebody else handle the dirty work. You don't mean that, sir? Of course not. Napier watched a spark of hope extinguished in the depths of Wagner's eyes. You'll have to wait a damn sight longer, son, before you take my place. I didn't mean... Please don't embarrass either one of us with an apology, Jared. You wouldn't have come this far without a healthy dose of ambition. Well... False modesty has its place, I suppose, but uh, save it for someone who doesn't know your life story, chapter and verse. Yes, sir. Our Palestinian associates are in a state of total disarray. If we want to save the operation, and I don't see any choice in that regard, agreed? Yes, sir. Then what we need to do is quietly divorce ourselves from Allah's lance and find another team that's worthy of support. I take responsibility for any setbacks that we've suffered up to now. It's not your fault, sir. When you steer the ship, Jared, it's all your fault. That's lesson number one. Make no mistake on that score. No, sir. But responsibility is only part of it. The more important part, in situations like the present one, is smooth recovery. Unless we want to lose the confidence of our associates in Greece and China, we must turn this thing around without delay and get the operation on solid footing, right? Right, sir. Okay, then. We can't change the basic goals, but maybe we can fudge the game plan without taking any more decisive hits. You see where I'm going with this, Jared? Well... He didn't see a goddamn thing, but that was understandable. The plan had only come to Napier in the past few moments. There'd been no discussion of it, nothing to prepare Wagner for Napier's leap. We need new allies, someone with more staying power than the Lance. Maybe an outfit on a par with Black September or Hamas. They all need money, they all hate Israel. How resistant can they be to new investors with a plan for victory? Good thinking, sir. My big mistake, I think, was trusting in the Palestinians to do the job alone. Hell, they've been trying to get rid of the Israelis since 1948. There's obviously something wrong with their approach, agreed? Yes, of course. So, here's my thinking on the matter, and correct me if I'm wrong. They fail because they're in a rut, committed to these endless hit-and-run techniques that only make Israelis more determined to stand fast. Deep down, I have a feeling they're afraid of victory. How's that? Now, look at Arafat. After he went legitimate, he was nothing but a tired old man, a whipping boy for Tel Aviv whenever militants slip off the reservation. He was about as influential in the Arab world today as T.S. Lawrence. Who, sir? Uh, never mind. Just follow me on this. Whoever we're allied with in the next half of the game, let's take for granted that they need a jump start and some technical assistance. Excuse me? You, uh, keep in touch with any of the Russians you got acquainted with while you were working on the Eastern European beat? Yes, sir. Reach out to him. See if you can find someone with excess hardware on his hands. Hardware? Nothing extravagant. I'm thinking of a compact unit, portable, simple to operate. Uh, a couple of megatons should do the trick. Tel Aviv. The aircraft Brignola had sent from Cyprus was a Lockheed Jetstar C-140, 
instantly recognizable from its four rear-mounted engines and the massive fuel tanks attached to each wing, resembling Exocet missiles without the tail fins. The Jetstar was shorter than some jet fighters at that, a few inches over 60 feet from nose to tail, but with a 54-foot wingspan that dwarfed any fighter flying today. It cruised at 508 miles per hour, carrying a maximum complement of 10 passengers. The C-140 was built for a two-man crew, but Grimaldi had flown larger planes alone and knew he'd have no trouble handling this one. There would be no in-flight service for his comrades, but the team was seeking speed, not luxury. The jetliner would get them where they had to go if Grimaldi could hold fatigue at bay for 12 more hours in the air. No sweat, just like falling off a log. Hey, except the fall in this case will be 30,000 feet if anything went wrong. Grimaldi spent ten minutes with the pilot who delivered the jetliner, looking over charts and flight plans, running down the pre-flight checklist. It was standard for a pressurized high flyer with complete airliner appointments, including automatic oxygen mask delivery in case pressure was lost at maximum altitude. After that, he watched an airport ground crew going through its paces, taking care of maintenance, topping off the plane's long-distance tanks. When they were done, Grimaldi spent some time inside the cockpit looking over the controls. They could have carried guns aboard the jetliner since there would be no customs hassle on departure, but arrival in Macau would be another story. Bolin didn't want to risk being caught with hardware on the plane when they touched down. It would mean expulsion at least, with no chance to re-enter China openly and damn poor odds of sneaking past Titan security. At worst, they could wind up in prison, charged with spying for the West, which even with deniability in place would mean red faces all around for Israel and America. Grimaldi dismissed that part of the mission from his mind. He was the pilot, and as such, was presently concerned more with mechanics than strategy. They would be covering 6,000 miles in the next 14 hours, give or take, if the refueling stops went smoothly. The Jetstar had a cruising range of 2,200 miles, which meant two stops en route from Israel to Macau. Grimaldi's picks had been Karachi and Bangkok, because the airports were reliable and fairly well maintained. They were less likely to be hijacked, sabotaged, or otherwise detained in either place than if they stopped at Kabul or Tashkent. It was a choice of lesser evils on a jaunt like this, and Grimaldi would have felt better if they could have traveled armed, but he would do his best with what they had and on arrival he would take a back seat to the infantry. Bolin was waiting on the tarmac for Grimaldi when the pilot stepped down from the jet. All ready? We're good to go. How soon? We're scheduled to lift off in 27 minutes. Good. We need to do this thing. For cats. For cats. For all of us. Macau. It was a point of pride with Lin Yuan Mak that he never lost his temper. He was subject to anger, of course, but the trick lay in rigid self-control. The moment any man revealed his secret feelings to another, Mock believed, that man was lost. He didn't curse or shout, therefore, when Jared Wagner telephoned from Jakarta to report the latest in a growing series of disasters. Instead of flying off the handle, demanding empty assurances or threatening to withdraw from the project, he listened carefully and questioned Wagner briefly in a civil tone. He made a point of cradling the receiver gently, even though he longed to smash it down with crushing force. Bad news again from the pathetic Palestinians. Sometimes it seemed to mock as if no other kind of news ever emerged from the benighted Middle East. Turmoil was constant in the region, and despite his recognition of the fact that violence was essential to their plans, Mock wondered why his allies, or their stooges, always seemed to be on the receiving end. There was a flaw in Napier's plan somewhere. If only Mock could put his finger on it, he might be the hero of the hour. He might even save himself before it was too late. He wasn't pulling out, of course. The plan had progressed too far for that, and Mock still hoped the plan could work, if not exactly as conceived, at least to the extent that none of the conspirators was damaged by it. Truth be told, he only cared about himself. But if the others toppled, Mock knew he would be less likely to survive. Beijing appeared to favor dealings with the West, for now at any rate, but there was zero tolerance for private operators who sought profit solely for themselves. Mock had pursued the risky avenue because he knew his government wouldn't approve, and the amount he stood to earn was too seductive to refuse. Billions. The very word itself was succulent. It had a texture and a flavor all its own. Beside it, tawdry millions paled to insignificance. 
Mark thought of all he could do with such a fortune, all the places he could visit, all the women he could have, and nowhere in his thinking did the sacred people's revolution play a part. The money and the power would be his, assuming that his partners didn't get him killed. That image drew his thoughts back to the blighted Middle East, where all their fortunes lay beneath the soil, waiting to be extracted, processed, sold to greedy nations that could never get enough black gold. China itself would be a vast new market, and his hand would be the one that turned the tap, if they succeeded, if they managed to survive. Mach wasn't clear on every detail of the problem, but he knew their plans had hit a major snag in Israel and environs. First, it seemed, some meddling Israeli had stumbled on the scheme, and Napier's efforts to eliminate the threat had been spectacularly unsuccessful. Now, instead of killing one man, they had a small war on their hands, and from the periodic bulletins Mach had received, it seemed that they were losing. Adding insult to the injury, Napier and his associates had thus far been unable to identify their enemies, much less destroy them. They could write off Allah's lance. That much was clear. Within a week, two leaders of the Palestinian guerrilla army had been killed, along with dozens of their soldiers, and they had nothing to show for it. Their allies were disrupted and demoralized, unable even to describe their enemies coherently. And Napier had decided that enough was enough. He was initiating the contingency he liked to call Plan B. So be it. It was dangerous, no doubt. Thousands would die, and some form of retaliation was inevitable, but it wouldn't touch Lin Mach. His hands, if not precisely clean, at least had left no fingerprints behind to link them with the plot. Or had they? That, above all else, troubled his mind. If Napier left a trail, and it was true, one of his aides had already been killed near Tel Aviv, and if the nameless enemy tracked down Napier, what might the oil man do or say to save himself? Or if he kept his faith and silence to the point of death, what evidence might be uncovered in his files, extracted from subordinates to jeopardize the other principles? Lin Mok had been invited into the cartel because he had influence with the Chinese government and held a post that let him carry out certain maneuvers without being caught. He had already paved the way for trade agreements with the new state that would rise from Israel's ashes. After public lamentation and condolences, self-interest would assert itself once more, as it had always done. Money would talk, and men would fall in line with its demands. Mach had accepted Napier's invitation to the game because he wanted to be rich beyond his wildest dreams, beyond the dreams of any proper socialist raised on Marxist doctrines from the cradle onward. But the money would be useless to a corpse. Plan B was set to roll, and there was nothing Mach could do about it now. He could, however, take preemptive steps to save himself if this, like Napier's other foolproof plan, should go disastrously, irreparably wrong. Plan B would set the Middle East ablaze. Lin Mach decided it was time to take out fire insurance, just in case an unexpected wind should blow the flames his way. Aboard the Aristotle, Tyrrhenian Sea. You're certain it's the thing to do? We're confident of ultimate success, Mr. Andrastus. Andrastus didn't know this Jared Wagner, had spoken to him only once previously, and was disinclined to trust him. If he hadn't given Napier's password to authenticate himself, Andrastus would have switched off the cell phone and ordered Nikos to block all incoming calls. Plan B. Yes, that's the one. A shadow seemed to slide across the sun, although no clouds were visible for miles around. Andrastus felt a sudden chill, entirely unrelated to the brilliant day. Is there a schedule, then? Uh, not yet, sir. You will be apprised, of course. Of course. There's no reason to be concerned. I see. Thank you. Good day, sir. Yes, good day to you. There'd be no reason for concern if he was sitting in Sri Lanka or wherever Napier had gone to ground after the bloody mess in Tel Aviv. Andrastus wasn't halfway around the world, however. He was 12 miles out from Naples, homeward bound at a lethargic pace, and when his yacht reached the Aegean, he would be within 500 miles of ground zero. Too damn close for comfort. Even if Napier was right, and the payload was clean, a fact Andrastus couldn't take for granted in the circumstances, it still made him nervous. The Israelis might be taken by surprise, their government decapitated, but they were tenacious fighters, and a strike on Tel Aviv wouldn't prevent them from retaliating. As to where and whom they struck, that would be anybody's guess. 
It made no difference to Andrastus. He imagined the destruction, chaos, loss of life, and cared for no one but himself. Returning home placed him at risk, and he wasn't prepared to take that chance. Not now, with so much still at stake. Andrastus retrieved the compact two-way radio he used to speak with members of the crew. His thumb depressed a button labeled three before he spoke into the mouthpiece. Kolya! Yes, sir? I've changed my mind. I feel like visiting Tangier, perhaps Lisbon. Adjust our course accordingly. Yes, sir. The captain had learned that working for Christos Andrastos meant all plans were fluid. Anything could change at the last moment. It played hell with private lives, but the rewards were such that few complained and fewer still saw fit to throw their jobs away. Andrastus felt the yacht start its long, slow turn westward, leaving Naples and the boot of Italy behind. The Med lay glistening before them, with Sardinia to starboard, Sicily to port, North Africa barely a shadow on the far horizon, still 300 miles ahead. Andrastus would feel safer in Tangier than at his home in Greece, and safer yet in Lisbon if he chose to sail that far. He didn't know when Napier meant to activate Plan B, but he could wait it out. And in the meantime, he would issue orders to recall his cargo fleet from any point within 300 miles of the selected target zone. That meant the eastern quarter of the Med, along with the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf. How many ships in all? No less than half a dozen, he supposed, at any given time. Andrastus thought of sacrificing one to divert any vestige of attention from himself, but just as rapidly dismissed it as a foolish notion. Why should he lose anything when he had joined the game to make huge profits for himself? When histories were written of this moment, as they would be after he was dead and gone, Andrastus knew his critics would attempt to make the worst of it. They would discover that his father had collaborated with the Germans during World War II to make a profit and had suffered for it afterward. Which was to say he lost respect and certain friends, but kept the cash. They might suppose that he'd inherited some strain of anti-Semitism from his parents, predisposing him to use his wealth and power against Israel all these decades later. When the presses rolled, it would become a grand conspiracy, something he'd dreamed up to avenge his father's honor. As it happened, nothing could be farther from the truth. Thanos Andrastus had collaborated with the Nazis, it was true. He'd seen a chance to make a fortune from the war and seized the opportunity without a second thought. That didn't mean he hated Jews, of course. In fact, he cared no more or less for them than for the members of his own devoted family, which was to say, not very much at all. Christos would have been very much surprised to learn his father thought about the Jews at all. His mind was always on the money, and in that one aspect he had schooled his only son to emulate the old man he despised. Christos Andrastus hadn't missed his father once in 27 years since the old man collapsed and died atop a whore one-third his age. He had ascended to his father's seat of power in the shipping trade and then expanded to a point the old man never thought attainable. He wouldn't willingly surrender any of it now. Andrastus felt a stirring, palmed the walkie-talkie once again and thumbed another button. Irina. Yes, Christos? Meet me in the sauna. Ten minutes. Of course. Andrastus sipped his uzo, smiling. God damn it, life is good. Macau. Ming Cho He lit a fresh cigarette from the butt of his last one, chain smoking in a vain attempt to soothe his nerves. It wasn't working, but he had no other antidote for the uneasiness that plagued him. Drinking would be foolish in the circumstances, since he needed all his wits about him when he met the foreigners and put himself at their disposal. Ming didn't know exactly what the foreigners required of him, but it would almost certainly be dangerous. His contact at the U.S. Embassy only reached out for Ming when he, that was the CIA, had need of special services beyond the scope of normal burglars, pickpockets, and thugs. He had contacts the agency couldn't maintain without endangering its people in Macau, risking exposure of their function and a deportation order from Beijing. Instead, Ming Cho He was retained to risk his life for strangers, facing life in prison or a firing squad if he was caught. It pleased him to subvert the masters in Beijing, who had labeled his parents politically unreliable in the late 1970s, packing them off to a re-education camp in Mongolia. There, his father had been shot while trying to escape, or so the bastards said at any rate. Ming's mother had returned a broken woman, 
mind and spirit shattered, which was doubtless what her persecutors had in mind. It was a secret blessing when she took her own life six months later. Ming Cho He had wept with shame because he felt relief, and he had turned his full attention to revenge. Ming was a translator for China's Tourist Bureau, which explained his work with sundry foreigners. Part of his job was watching, eavesdropping, and then reporting back what he had seen or heard. Sometimes Ming told the truth to his superiors. More often, and particularly if he learned of some activity inimical to the Beijing establishment, he lied to help the outsiders maintain their secrets. And for six years now, he'd been a contract agent of the CIA. It paid more than his day job, but Ming told himself the cash was secondary. He was fighting for his parents and for friends who had fallen before the communist guns at Tiananmen Square. Ming didn't delude himself into thinking that anything he did would topple the communist government, but he did what he could, one man working alone, until now. If he understood the latest mission, it might involve more than simply translating or giving directions. He'd been warned that there would be hazards above and beyond the usual, and that his compensation would be increased accordingly. He'd even been given the opportunity to decline, with an understanding that no one would hold it against him. And he had accepted the mission, regardless. Ming felt a sense of having crossed a line, working without a net, as the Americans might say. He didn't know exactly what the mission would entail yet, but Ming knew what he'd be risking. The same thing as always, his life. Ming had a flight schedule for the incoming strangers and the number of their party, three men and a woman, all round eyes. His contact had given him names, which Ming assumed to be false. Never mind. He would address the newcomers however they preferred. Such things were standard in the world he occupied, a precaution against betrayal. Ming checked his watch, nine hours before he had to meet the Westerners whose lives were in his hands. Meanwhile, he took the lockbox from its place beneath the flooring of his tiny bedroom closet, placed it on the narrow bed where he habitually slept alone, and used a small brass key to open it. Inside, the Type 59 semi-automatic pistol lay wrapped in an oiled chamois cloth with six spare magazines. Two pasteboard boxes of 9mm cartridges filled the rest of the box, but Ming left them alone as he took out the weapon, unwrapped it, and prepared to wipe it with a paper towel. The Type 59, like all state-produced Chinese weapons, was a copy of a Russian gun, in this case the venerable Makarov PM, itself patterned on the German Walther PPK. Each magazine held eight rounds, the loaded weapon weighing a solid two pounds in Ming's hand. When he was satisfied in terms of cleanliness, no risk of gun oil staining his clothes, Ming jacked the pistol's slide to put a live round in the chamber. It was double action, safe to carry with the safety off and hammer down. Ming didn't have a holster, but the pistol fit nicely inside his waistband, at the back, or he could hide it in the pocket of an overcoat, depending on the weather. Usually he left the gun at home, but this wasn't a usual situation. If he had to fight, at least he'd be prepared. And if he had to die, perhaps he wouldn't go alone. Ming Cho He had never shot another human being, or attempted to, but in his mind he had rehearsed the moves a thousand times. When he put faces on the targets in his mind, he visualized the judge and prosecutor who had sent his father off to die, the captain of police who'd smiled and made suggestive comments to his mother afterward. There was no shortage of potential targets in the workers' paradise. The strangers who were coming would need weapons, he'd been told, and that spelled trouble. There were weapons to be had, of course, for those with ready cash, and Ming knew where they could be found. He'd purchased his own pistol from one such black market dealer, though not in Macau. There were others, much closer to home. Ming was surprised to find himself smiling. He crossed the room, confirmed it in a mirror. Yes, that was a smile. It felt suspicious on his face, an alien expression that belonged to someone else, stolen for him to use as a disguise. And in that moment, Ming knew he wasn't afraid to die. Karachi, Pakistan. Their first stop for refueling was a choice of lesser evils, as far as Bolin was concerned. Pakistan had been a tinderbox of violence for more than half a century, created as a refuge for India's Muslim minority, battling through long generations along the ragged border with its mother country. Military coups and a flood of Afghan refugees in the 1970s had done nothing to ensure national stability, 
while a nuclear arms race with India in the late 1990s brought down U.S. sanctions on both sides. The border wars continued into a new century with ambiguous reactions to the U.S. war on terrorism in neighboring Afghanistan and reports that die-hard al-Qaeda fighters were sheltered by elements of the Pakistani power structure. So why were they here, Bolin asked himself as he stood in shadow, watching technicians refuel the Lockheed Jetstar under Jack Grimaldi's watchful eye. And he already knew the answer, because it was the best of their several poor choices. Iran and Afghanistan posed even greater risks to Westerners in transit, while friendly India's nearest major airport was beyond their reach at Bombay. They needed fuel for the next leg of the journey, and Karachi had been chosen as the least likely scene of a major snafu. In fact, Bolin knew, Hal Brignola had been pulling strings from Washington to help them on their way. Uniformed Pakistani police had been waiting for them on touchdown to secure the plane and parking area while a ground crew did its job. There'd been no questions or hassles, but Bolin was cautious by nature, a trait that had helped him survive up to now. Unarmed though he was, He'd elected to stand guard himself outside the Jetstar, while Grimaldi supervised the refueling and maintenance, McCarter and Mindel lying in wait to surprise any saboteurs who might slip past them. The police left him alone, pretending not to notice Bolin as they stalked the perimeter, holding their Swiss SG-540 assault rifles at the ready. Commanded by a stern-faced officer who held himself apart from the others, they'd clearly been ordered to keep their distance from the Jetstar and ignore its occupants if they were seen. So far, so good. Grimaldi had told him to expect an hour on the ground, give or take, and they were coming up on the halfway mark without incident. Refueling was nearly completed, and aircraft mechanics were giving the Jetstar a checkup, inspecting the landing gear, rudders, whatever. Grimaldi crouched beneath the starboard wing with one of the ground crew, reaching up to wrap his knuckles on the metal there. As Bolin watched, the Pakistani frowned, nodded, and bobbed his head in something like a jerky little bow. Their conference concluded, Grimaldi duck-walked from under the wing and rose to full height, stretching to relieve muscle cramps in his legs. He crossed the tarmac to stand beside Bolin, flicking glances between their perimeter guards and the busy mechanics. About half an hour. What was that with the wing? The starboard ailerons are just a trifle sluggish. No biggie. He'll take care of it. It's not a problem? Shouldn't be, Mac. Bolin did everything within his power to blot out an image of the Jetstar plummeting to the ground, dense jungle rushing up to meet them at the speed of fright. It almost worked. Another time and place, he might have argued, but Grimaldi was among the warrior's oldest and most trusted friends. He had been there for Bolin when the chips were down on countless battlefields, and Bolin knew the pilot well enough to realize he'd never risk his own life, much less someone else's, for the sake of haste in checking or repairing some mechanical device. Grimaldi was a gambler, but he'd never be a fool. Bolin dismissed the matter from his mind, casting forward to their next stop, and the touchdown after that. They were still some 4,000 miles from Macau, and Lin Mok's power would increase the closer they came. An ambush was more likely in Bangkok than in Karachi, and more likely still at their final destination. Mok shouldn't know they were coming, but that was expectation fueled in equal parts by strategy and wishful thinking. They could still be wrong dead wrong. There were still too many ways they could die for Bolin to linger on any single hazard. Simple accident, equipment failure in mid-air, stormy weather, sabotage by the ground crew, surface-to-air missiles, interceptor aircraft. It was a veritable smorgasbord of death, but Bolin wasn't buying, not just yet, not if he had a choice. It was a challenge not to check his watch or mentally urge the mechanics to hurry. He watched a pair of techs working on the starboard ailerons, testing them by hand, one of them signaling Grimaldi to give it a try from the cockpit. Jack disappeared inside the jet star, and the wing flaps waved at Bolin, whirring smoothly up and down. Emerging from the aircraft once again, Grimaldi signed a sheaf of papers offered to him on a clipboard, flashed a thumbs-up sign at Bolin, and ducked back inside the plane. Crossing the pavement to rejoin his comrades, Bolin didn't ask himself whether the techs had done their job correctly. That part was out of his hands now. He was already beyond Karachi, winging his way toward Bangkok and the next threat assessment, wondering if their luck would hold. A few more hours. That's all we need. That and a world of luck. Macau International Airport. 
The airport layout was unique in Boland's personal experience. He'd never seen a runway flanked by water on all sides, linked to a terminal by taxiways that were, in essence, bridges spanning a thousand yards or more of open sea. He didn't want to think about the beatings aircraft and their passengers had to take when tropical storms came roaring out of the South China Sea to flog Macau and its adjacent islands with the wrath of God. They had clear skies, at least, for their approach. As far as what lay waiting for them on the ground below, Boland could only guess, and that had never been his style. His last check-in with Hal Brignola during a refueling stop in Bangkok had added no new information to the warrior's mental file. Their contact in Macau would have a line on Lin Yuan Mok, or someone who could find him. Otherwise, the team would have to forge ahead without a detailed plan, making up strategy as they went along. Touchdown was the usual Grimaldi special, smooth and gentle. Never mind the crosswind whipping east to west across the runway, or the flight of seagulls wheeling up in front of them. Jack made each landing feel as if there was nothing to it, a routine and simple exercise. It was part of his magic, taken for granted by those who'd flown with him repeatedly. We've been directed to the northern taxiway. Call it another three clicks before we reach the terminal. Grimaldi Airways recommends that everyone stay seated till we've parked and shut the engines off. Keep us in mind for your next jaunt to the inscrutable Far East. Bolin watched through his window as the Jetstar taxied north, then eastward, never more than 30 yards from water at the farthest. He imagined some fatigued or nervous pilot freezing up at the controls, dumping a 747 in the drink with several hundred passengers on board. Twenty minutes put them at the terminal. The Lockheed parked outside a hangar at the south end of the sprawling property. Boland picked out the black sedan with driver standing by before he left his seat, trailing McCarter to the exit with Rebecca Mindel on his heels. Grimaldi joined them from the cockpit, opening the door and lowering the Jetstar's folding steps. The ace pilot took the lead, and the sedan's driver was waiting by the time he reached the tarmac. Our welcoming committee's here. I am Ming Cho He. Their guide smiled mechanically and shook hands with each of them in turn. In line with their new passports and assorted other documents, Bolin was Mike Velasco, McCarter, Daniel Masters. Mindel became René Zellig, a British subject, while Grimaldi morphed into James Grafton, his ID including an international pilot's license in that name. Their contact didn't question any of it. He stood waiting while their luggage was unloaded, and Grimaldi made arrangements with the ground crew for the Jetstar to be fueled, serviced, and stored. Two customs men in uniform emerged from the hangar to inspect and stamp their passports, but declined to check their bags. That hurdle cleared, Ming showed them to his car and helped them stow their luggage, got them seated, Mindel in the shotgun seat, her three companions wedged in back. Now I now have sardines feel. More room at your apartment in Macau. You have a one-month lease, the shortest term available. I was instructed to avoid hotels. That's fine, but we need to do some shopping first. For weapons, yes? That's right. No problem in Macau. Sales and possessions are illegal, as you know, but many things are still available. And money makes the world go round. Of course. Aside from weapons, Ming, we need to know what you've uncovered on Lin Mark. He's definitely in Macau. His location is a closely guarded secret. But as Mr. Master says, money can open doors and loosen tongues. You've found him then? I know where he was staying yesterday. As for today, we'll have to go and see. Their target was a mansion on a hill. In former times, it would have housed a wealthy merchant or a western diplomat. This day, it was the home away from home of Lin Yuan Mak, a first assistant to the Minister of Foreign Trade for the People's Republic of China, their target. It had required some persuasion to obtain the address, but Ming Cho He was a man with connections. He'd impressed Boland favorably so far, with both his network of informers in Macau and his access to dealers in black market military hardware. They were armed at last, and none too soon, as they prepared to penetrate the mansion on the stroke of 2 o'clock a.m. They'd chosen Type 56-1 assault rifles, the folding stock models with 20.5-inch barrels and 30-round box magazines, capable of spewing 7.62-millimeter Soviet slugs at a cyclic rate of some 600 rounds per minute. Boland's crew had lucked out on their sidearms, bypassing the standard Chinese Type 59s in favor of a newly arrived shipment from Czechoslovakia, the CZ-100s, chambered in 9-millimeter parabellum with 13-round mags. 
For real punch, they'd purchased a case of Chinese Type 73 frag grenades, resembling the old Russian RGD-5s, with a stubby throwing stick attached in the venerable potato masher style. Low-powered, but still lethal at close range, the Type 73s were a bargain, selling for a mere two dollars each American. Ming found the target without difficulty. He had a taxi driver's knowledge of the winding streets and narrow alleyways, choosing shortcuts that actually saved them time instead of making matters worse. By 1.35 a.m., they were parked at the foot of the hill where their target resided, watching the last few lights wink out in the palace. Count on guards and expect them to be armed. You know the drill. Mark holds the key to Napier and Andrastus. If we miss him... Let's not miss him. Right, let's not. Bolin turned to Ming Cho He. You should be fine parked here, but if you see it going bad, take off. We'll meet you in the parking lot behind that restaurant, agreed? Of course. The restaurant was just under three-quarters of a mile due east of their target, and already closed for the night. Their escape route consisted of narrow back streets, alleyways, and a large construction site that could hide a brigade from casual search. Retreating on foot was the worst-case scenario, granted, but Bolin liked to cover all his options and have backup plans for all contingencies. All right, let's move. They climbed the hill together, flitting shadows, Bolin in the lead, with Mindel second and McCarter bringing up the rear. Mock's property was walled, but he kept no attack dogs on the premises, according to Ming's informants. Ditto on the high-tech security devices, they were told, but Bolin paused beneath the wall to scan for cameras, wires, and sensors all the same. It was better to be safe than sorry, especially when sorry in the killing fields meant dead. When he was satisfied, he faced the others with a curt thumbs up, received the same in return, and scaled the eight-foot wall. It was a measure of the crime rate in Macau that Mock had strung no razor wire along the top, planted no nails or broken glass in concrete to surprise trespassers. Bolin was pleased to think their target felt secure. It made him easier to kill, but not before they had a little chat. <coughs> Bolin dropped in a crouch onto the grass and moved swiftly to the shadow of a tree that grew beside the wall. He heard Mendel land and move off in the other direction, followed seconds later by McCarter. They had planned their movements with a rough diagram of the property before them in the small apartment Ming had rented for them, and so far the layout seemed to match the hand-drawn map. So far. They'd come expecting armed guards on the grounds, and Bolin met the first one seconds later as he closed in toward the house. The sentry had his back turned toward the wall, holding a submachine gun carelessly in the crook of one arm as he bent to light a cigarette. Bolin let him finish and pocket his lighter, then stepped in close and slammed the butt of his rifle against the lookout's skull with crushing force. <laughs> the second hard chop, this one to the larynx, made sure that he wouldn't rise again in this lifetime. There was no time to bother with concealment of the corpse, but Bolin pulled the SMG's magazine and tossed it into some nearby shrubbery before moving on. At least he knew another sentry wouldn't come along and use the dead man's gun to shoot him in the back. The trees ran out some thirty paces from the house, revealing open lawn. Floodlights were mounted at each corner of the mansion, but they weren't turned on, apparently reserved for outdoor parties or perceived emergencies. Someone inside would doubtless throw the switch as soon as any shooting started, but by then it wouldn't matter anyway. Bolin stepped out of cover, headed for the house. There was supposed to be a door beyond the nearest corner that would grant him entry to the kitchen if it wasn't locked, or even if it was. He didn't know if there were burglar alarms inside the house, but once they got that far, there would be noise enough to rouse Mock's distant neighbors from their sleep in any case. The executioner was halfway to the house. Si, si. He turned in that direction, saw a shooter sprinting toward him through the dark, and met his adversary with a burst of automatic fire. <laughs> McCarter had been about to spring from ambush onto a passing sentry when Boland's gunfire ripped through the night. Oh well, sod it. Bad luck, mate. McCarter turned to join the action on the broad south lawn. Another sentry tried to intercept the Briton as he cleared Mock's garden, overgrown with shrubs and flowers flown in from around the world. The second shooter had only a pistol, but the gun was aimed directly at McCarter's nose. McCarter gave himself to gravity, legs folding as he dropped below the shooter's line of fire. Ugh. He took the jarring impact on his knees, and before the sentry could correct his aim and try again, McCarter shot him in the chest. McCarter vaulted to his feet and moved around the corpse, closing the distance to Mock's lawn and the palatial house beyond. Christ! Oh, Mock's not doing too bad for a socialist. He cleared the garden and advanced into the open. Bolin had already vanished around the southeast corner of the mansion as McCarter set foot on the grass. 
Veering away to the southwest, the Briton raced to reach the front door and the curving asphalt drive that looped in front of it. Suddenly, two guards came around the corner. <laughs> McCarter threw himself face down, firing before he hit the turf. His first short burst was nearly wasted, but it spoiled the gunner's aim and sent them dodging off to either side. The shooter breaking to his left was slightly nearer, so McCarter took him first, tracking with his ersatz Kalashnikov and leading just enough that his next burst would meet the runner in mid-stride and drop him sprawling to the grass. It worked like magic, and his human target went down in a spray of crimson, dead before he fell. Mindful of danger on his right, McCarter wasted no time relishing the shot. Instead, he rolled away. A burst of SMG rounds plowed the turf McCarter had occupied a heartbeat earlier. The Briton fired at movement and a dancing muzzle flash, rather than any clear-cut target. The sentry was off balance, firing wildly as he ran, but from a range of less than 30 yards, it didn't take much skill to hose a target with an SMG. McCarter pushed off from the lawn and sprinted for the house. A shooter, dressed in shirt sleeves, with his tie undone and hanging limp around his neck, was opening the front door as McCarter stormed the porch. The houseman tried to close it, but he was too late. Without a pause to think or catch his breath, McCarter barged across the threshold, firing as he went. Leong Chun Sung had been delighted when he was promoted to command the household guards, but now the honor left a taste of ashes in his mouth. Gunfire from the surrounding grounds had reached the house, and when he tried the telephone to summon help, the line was dead. He tried a cell phone next, frustrated when the warning light told him the battery was low. Piece of worthless shit! He hurled the cell phone against the nearest wall. Instantly, a tremor rocked the house and staggered him. Leung blinked at the wall where he'd thrown the cell phone, looking for a hole, dazzled momentarily by his own display of strength, until he recognized the smell of smoke and cringed at his mistake. Explosives. Whoever the raiders were, they seemed intent on bringing down the house. Leong ran to a nearby standing cabinet and threw it open, reaching in to pluck a Type 79 submachine gun from the rack of weapons hidden there. He rummaged in a drawer, retrieved a magazine containing 20 7.62mm Soviet rounds and snapped it into the weapons receiver. Scooping out three more, he jammed them into his pockets, fumbling awkwardly. Leong didn't know who his enemies were, but he was ready to face them now and lay down his life if necessary for the honor of his master's house. Lin Mok would have been proud if he were present to observe his new chief of security in action. Thank goodness he's not here. That way, he could try to dream up a convincing lie explaining why his men were taken by surprise. Leong suspected they were using hand grenades, since plastic charges would have had more impact, buckling walls and dropping portions of the roof. A burst of gunfire from the parlor told him that the enemy was now inside the house. Embarrassing Leong as he repressed an urge to turn and run, he left the study. Come on, people! Time to fight or die! There were seven men, roughly half the force that had been left to guard the house in Lin Mok's absence. Where the others were, he couldn't say, but it wouldn't surprise him to find out that some were dead or wounded on the outer grounds. He hoped they were. It would be shameful for the enemy to slip past his first line of guards without a fight. The front door! Go on! His men were slow to move until Leong grabbed one of them and shoved him toward the sounds of battle, followed swiftly by a second. Ah, cowards! Finally, they moved as one to join the fray, with Leong behind them, blocking their retreat. He conveniently placed the seven men between himself and any hostile fire they might encounter on the way, which boosted Leong's courage as he moved along the smoky corridor. Passing the library, he suddenly remembered that his master kept another cell phone there. Watching his soldiers rush along the hall to meet their enemies, Leong hung back, then slipped into the library before one of them had a chance to turn and watch him go. Alone once more, he spied the cell phone resting on an antique end table and went to fetch it. Leong's hand closed on the instrument. The lights suddenly went out. Damn. He flipped open the folded cell phone, then realized he couldn't see the numbered buttons. Leong was on the verge of pitching this phone, too, to its destruction, but he stopped himself in time and fumbled back toward the library door. There was a flashlight in the kitchen, he remembered. Slipping the cell phone into a pocket with one of the SMG's spare magazines, Leong groped his way along a wall of bookcases until he found the door, then slid his fingertips along its frame to grasp the knob. More darkness waited for him in the hallway, lit erratically by muzzle flashes when he glanced down toward the parlor. Leong turned toward the kitchen, telling himself that it was his duty to summon police, that he wasn't abandoning his men. They were all trained with weapons. What more could he do than to call reinforcements before they were all overrun? How long before the police could reach the scene? 
Leong was nearly running when he tripped on something, lurched against the wall, then lost his balance altogether and collapsed. Oof! Groping across the floor, he felt fabric with something thick and warm inside it, then a wetness. Ah. <sighs> Leong violently recoiled as he realized he'd stumbled on a dead or wounded man. One of his own? An enemy? He couldn't tell, and he was in no mood to linger, trying to find out. He fumbled to retrieve his submachine gun and began to crawl along the hallway toward the kitchen and salvation. Rebecca Mendel had entered Lin Mok's mansion through a window, just before the lights went out. She didn't know who'd blown the fuse box, and she didn't care. The darkness was a blessing. Oh, damn it. She banged her shins against a bed frame and was limping slightly by the time she found the bedroom door. She hadn't fired a shot so far this night, but from the racket in the house, Mendel surmised that was about to change. She cracked the door an inch or two and listened, since she couldn't see beyond her nose. The blackout had its uses, but it also tied her hands as far as tracking down their prey. She couldn't hope to recognize Mock's voice or pick him out from conversations overheard in passing. Jehovah answered prayers, she thought, as someone in the outer hallway switched on a pen light. It wasn't much, but in the utter darkness of the blacked-out house, it shone like a beacon. Mindel watched it pass her door, then leaned out as the light moved farther down the corridor, tracking its progress. For an instant, two grim faces were illuminated by the beam, scowling against the sudden light. The light suddenly swung upward to reveal its owner's face. Even in profile, Mindel knew he wasn't Lynn Mock. Three targets, then. Holding her breath, she stepped into the hall. She had to take the shooter with the pen light first before he had an opportunity to illuminate her as a target for his comrades. Knowing that, she had already memorized positions for the other two before she sighted on the dim profile and squeezed the trigger on her automatic rifle, taking up the slack. The rifle bucked against her shoulder as she fired. Sighting down the muzzle, she saw the lighted profile shatter, dropping out of frame before her muzzle flashes lit the other startled faces, turning toward her their final glimpse of death. She shot them both dead where they stood, and felt nothing beyond relief that neither guard had managed to return her fire. Closing the space that separated her from the three warm corpses, Mindel knelt and groped along the floor until she found the fallen pen light in a pool of blood. Blanking her mind to the experience, she wiped it on a dead man's jacket and stood, ready to sweep the hall in both directions, then move on to seek and find Lin Mok, if he was still alive and present to be found. She stabbed the thin beam to her left, then to her right. She was alone with corpses, but another hallway opened several paces distant, just beyond the three men she had slain. More sounds of battle came from that direction, telling Mindel she'd found a path to reach the parlor and the true heart of the house. With one last flash of light to reassure herself that no ambush was waiting in the corridor, she thrust the automatic rifle in front of her and started moving toward the flash and crack of gunfire, walking swiftly with one shoulder pressed against the wall. Ming Cho Hei was ready when the first reports of gunfire sounded from the mansion. He had steeled himself against it, swallowing his fear. The strangers and his contact at the U.S. Embassy were all depending on him not to fail. He was determined not to let them down. The automatic rifle in his lap was a surprise addition to his former one-piece arsenal. Ming hadn't argued when the tall American, Mike Belasco, purchased five rifles instead of four. Ming understood the party's pilot would remain at the apartment in Macau while they went looking for Lin Mok, and since they had been joined by no one else, he knew the fifth rifle had to be for him. Ming recognized the trust implicit in the man's gesture, all the more remarkable because he hadn't proved himself as yet to any great extent. Ming had been grateful for the weapon, even as it frightened him. And now, it seemed, he was about to find out what the gun could do. Someone, either in Mock's house or among his scattered neighbors, had to have summoned the police. Ming recognized their unmarked cars, denoting special officers on call around the clock for actions that were rated sensitive. They were political police, distinct and separate from Macau's uniform constabulary, empowered to extract confessions or use deadly force on their own initiative to keep the lid on political problems. Ming knew them on sight, and he hated them all. Men like these had dragged his father away from home and family long years ago. Others had manned some of the guns in Tiananmen Square, exacting reprisals under cover of the larger military operation. And this night, they served Lin Mok, or would, if Ming Cho He permitted them to reach the hilltop house. On impulse, he decided not to let them pass. Ming had already switched off the sedan's dome light to prevent it from shining when the doors were open. Now, as the first response car approached him, starting up the hill to Lin Mok's house, he opened the driver's door and moved into a crouch behind it. 
sighting down the barrel of his automatic rifle. This is for you, father. The car swerved hard away from him and crashed into another vehicle at curbside. Two other cars were swerving crazily behind the first, their drivers pumping brakes and twisting steering wheels while passengers tried to discover the source of the gunfire. Ming strafed the second vehicle, his bullets etching zigzag lines along the driver's side. One of the black clad officers inside the car returned fire with a submachine gun, but his aim was hampered by the swerving vehicle, and Ming did better with a burst that turned the shooter's face into a crimson mask. Somehow the sudden violence didn't shock Ming, as he thought it would. He wasn't frozen into immobility or struck numb. The world didn't slow down as in a cinematic shootout where spent cartridges and falling bodies tumbled endlessly through space. If anything, the action seemed accelerated, as if some invisible controller's hand had pressed fast forward on a giant video cassette machine. Ming saw the third car swing broadside, then start jerking through a three-point turn as the driver tried to retreat. Ming's rifle stopped him with the last few rounds, the slide locking open on an empty chamber. Shit. He fumbled through reloading while shaken gunmen leaped from the second and third cars in unison, all seeking cover. Too many. Far too many. Ming heard the sounds of combat from the summit of the hill and started lining up his human targets, knocking them down on the run. Some stood and fought while others tried to hide. As Ming shot each in turn, he saw his father's face. At the explosion, Leong cringed, curling up in a tight fetal ball on the floor. Gagging smoke brought him out of the curl, but Leong was disoriented, crawling back the way he'd come, instead of moving toward the parlor where the action was. Leong noticed the sounds of combat were receding, and it didn't bother him. He craved safety, if such a thing could possibly be found here, in the midst of so much violence. But guilt and shame quickly overcame self-preservation as a driving force. Unfortunately, by that time, Leong Chun Sung had lost his way, and smoke within the burning house had thickened to the point that he could see no useful landmarks in the corridor he occupied. He knew there were three corridors on each of the mansion's three floors, each level laid out in the shape of a giant letter H. He'd been making his way from the north arm of that H to the south, across the shorter crossbar when he'd been diverted. Now, with that in mind, praying that it was true, Leong guessed that he was back in the administrative wing where Mach and others had their offices. But what if he were wrong? Suppose he hadn't doubled back at all but kept on crawling forward after the explosion. What if he was where he meant to be, but the combatants had moved on to fight in other parts of the house? In that case, the kitchen and the flashlight he'd set out to find had to be no more than 30 yards away from him in one direction or the other. At least he'd managed to retain his submachine gun, though he hadn't fired it yet. Why draw attention to himself, perhaps get shot by his own men when he could find no targets in the smoke? Someone was firing, granted, but the noises were surreal, as if Leong were camped outside a movie theater, with some outlandish action film playing inside. He had to do something soon if he intended to survive. Before moving, he took the cell phone from his pocket, once more blindly tapping out what he believed to be the police emergency number. Shenling massage parlor! Leong felt like screaming, but feared the results of a tantrum. Pocketing the phone again, he randomly selected a direction that he hoped was south and started crawling rapidly along the wall. He had covered 30 feet before a door swung open in his path and met his skull with stunning force. <laughs> Leong rocked backward on his haunches, then slumped over on his side. Dizzy and hurting, he was conscious of the submachine gun slipping from his fingers, but he couldn't hold it. Someone kicked him, more by accident than with the intent to harm. Who's that? State your name. Leong groped for his weapon, but a heavy boot came down upon one hand, grinding his knuckles. Fingers tangled in his hair and jerked Leong's head back while a vague face loomed in close to scrutinize his own. Ah, ah, you speak English? Leong stayed mum until he felt the blade sight of a weapon gouge soft flesh beneath his chin. A little. I want Lim Muck. Where is he? Lie and die, or tell the truth and risk the same. Leong chose a middle course. Not here. Gone. Oh, yes? Gone where, exactly? <coughs> oh, you're not getting out of this that easily. The intruder hauled Leong to his feet and drove him at a rapid, stumbling pace along the corridor. Volan was priming a grenade. Urgent, can you read me? Hang on a second. <coughs> Boland pitched the grenade overhand through an open doorway 20 feet distant. 
It bounced off the jam before dropping inside. His adversary scrambled for the wobbling metal egg, hands clutching and obstructing one another. Someone lost his balance, fell against the door and slammed it shut, costing them whatever grace they might have gained through speed. The detonation took the door down in a puff of smoke and flame. Two bodies sprawled across it like roast pig at a luau. Bolan stood waiting for the other one or two gunmen to surface, ready with his rifle, but the pantry showed no further signs of life. Thank you for waiting, sir. How can I help you? Money. I've got a prisoner. He tells me Muck's bugged out. Where to? He has a mental block on that part at the moment. Do you believe him? Yeah, I think I do. Damn. All right. Fall back. Does everybody read? I'm gone. I read. We're the drawing. Retreating from the house was no cakewalk. Boland's opponents had been decimated, but enough of them were still alive and armed to make withdrawal dicey. Eventually, he reached the line of trees and kept on going, following the slope downhill until he reached the wall. McCarter and Mindel were waiting for him there, standing like bookends with a sullen Chinese prisoner between them. <clears throat> this is him. In the flesh. Bolin addressed the prisoner directly. We want Lin Yuan Mark. You want to live? Where is he? Don't know. Maybe he doesn't know. Maybe not. But he's our consolation prize. He goes with us. We're running out of time. You go over the wall first. Silent Sam here will be right behind you. Right. Yeah. McCarter sprang atop the wall without apparent effort, rolling out of sight beyond it. Set. Your turn, Sam. Can't climb. How are you at flying? Seizing the startled captive's shirt and belt, Bolin propelled him toward the summit of the eight-foot wall. <laughs> Leong clung for dear life to the top of the wall. <laughs> the executioner pointed his rifle at the captive's head. The prisoner grasped hold of it to keep himself from falling. <laughs> A sudden solid jab from Boland's rifle sent him across. <laughs> I'll cover you, Mendel. <laughs> Boland watched the trees until she cleared the wall and then followed her supple form. <clears throat> Together they began to run downhill, driving their prisoner in front of them until they reached the bottom of the hill. It was a battleground with bullet punctured cars stalled in the intersection, bodies scattered in the street. Streetlights reflected crimson from the spreading pools of blood. Their driver, Ming Cho Hei, appeared to be the last man standing, covering the corpses with his automatic rifle. You all right? Ah, better now. Who are these blokes? Secret police. How do you say? In interest of homeland security. Uh, say no more. Bolin steered his captive to the waiting car. They'd crossed a line tonight, and there could be no turning back. They didn't go back to the flat after their raid on Lin Mok's house, since Ming Cho Hei believed their prisoner might raise a fuss during interrogation and draw unwanted attention from the neighbors. Mindel knew what that meant, and she wasn't looking forward to the next few hours if the captive tried to tough it out. She'd never cared for torture, though Mossad and Israeli military intelligence routinely abused prisoners, extracting confessions in defiance of the legal niceties. Mindel herself had seen two Palestinians summarily executed after questioning, and she knew from after-hours conversations with various comrades that her own observations were merely the tip of the iceberg. Mindel didn't criticize her colleagues' methods. She made no complaints. But sometimes, increasingly at times like these, she asked herself, at what point in the war do we become our enemy? Ming drove through the winding, darkened streets until he reached the waterfront along Macau's northeast shoreline. Cargo ships docked here, and there were warehouses aplenty in the neighborhood. One of them stood apart, perhaps a bit more shabby and disreputable than the others. Ming pulled his sedan around back, found a midnight blot of shadow to conceal the car, and parked it there. He had a large ring filled with keys, one of which fitted a padlock on a side door of the warehouse. Once inside, he threw a deadbolt, felt his way along the wall, and flipped a light switch. Sudden brilliance forced Mindel to squint, but only seconds passed before she checked the nearest windows, finding they'd been painted black inside. Ming had secured the necessary privacy for what had to happen next. The prisoner was frightened, and with reason. He'd already watched a number of his comrades die, and now he had to wonder whether he would ever see another sunrise. 
Ming conveyed him to a straight-backed wooden chair that might have been prepared especially for their gathering. It stood alone, nearly dead center in the empty warehouse, lit by floodlights as if waiting for an actor to appear and launch into a Shakespearean monologue. Instead, a trembling prisoner sat in it, surrounded by armed enemies. Ming approached. Who are you? Why should I tell you? No. Ming punched him in the face and knocked him sprawling from the chair. Blood dribbled freely from his flattened nose. Mindel stood fast and gripped her rifle, as if somehow drawing strength from wood and steel. <laughs> Ming gripped his adversary by the collar of his jacket, hauled him to his feet, and dropped him back into the chair. Who are you? Long Jun Song. Ming was still unsatisfied. <laughs> Slamming his fist into the prisoner's face a second time, he drove him over backward, chair and all. He'll speak soon, I believe. Not if you break his bloody jaw. All we need to know is where Mark went and when he left. Hmm. Nodding, Ming stepped over to the prisoner, bent and flexed his shoulders, lifting the man and chair upright together in a single move. <laughs> Mindel wouldn't have guessed he had the strength to do it, but their guide had already surprised her more than once this night. She bit her tongue as Ming reached underneath his jacket and drew a pistol. He pressed the muzzle hard into their captive's groin. Oh, okay, 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 I I'll talk. Where's Mark? He, he left this morning, early. Jakarta. That's where he's going, I swear. To Jakarta, he's meeting a an oil man. An American. Very big oil man. Napier. Yes, yes, that's the name I heard. Napier. Big old man, American. I don't know. What do you think, Ming? I think it's probably the truth. I think so, too. Finish with this one, then? We're done. And finish the Macau? It looks that way. Ming's shoulders slumped a little as he glanced from one face to the next. Too bad. Mendel wondered how long Ming would last after tonight, if he could keep up the facade of a loyal party member and deceive his masters in Beijing. Failing in that, she guessed his life would be a short, unhappy one. You want the airport now? We'll need to make some phone calls first. Use the office telephone. I swept the line this morning. Right. Okay. I'll take care of this one. Then come back to wait for you. He prodded their captive with his pistol and marched him toward the door through which they'd entered. McCarter trailed after them. I'll just catch that dead boat. What's now, Blinsky? I'd touch base with Washington. You do the same with Tel Aviv, if it's required. They'd rather not hear any more from me right now. Okay. I'll see if I can get cooperation on the ground at our next stop. As soon as Ming gets back, we'll pick up Jack and then be on our way. Jakarta? Jakarta. Washington, D.C. Brugnola's private line lit up at 1.18 p.m., Eleven hours, and a full day on the calendar, later than Boland's time in Macau. He'd been expecting the call, though it could easily have come from Phoenix Force or Able Team, embroiled with missions of their own. Brignola! We missed him. Brignola felt the remnants of his lunch begin to churn. Gave you the slip? Before we landed. And from what we gather here, he flew out to Jakarta for a meet with an American oil man. Napier? Sounds like it, but we can't confirm that from Macau. You're in pursuit, then? Pretty soon. We have a few loose ends to tie up here. Can I help? I thought you'd never ask. That's what I'm here for. The language shouldn't be a problem, but we'll need a contact for munitions when we land. No sweat. I'll line it up. And transportation. You want a guide this time? Not yet. It hasn't been that long since I was in the neighborhood. The pirate thing. God, that was a bloody one. Right. Okay. If you can get a line on Global's office in Jakarta, it would be a help. I'll run it through the mill. Location should be simple. Maybe we'll get lucky with a floor plan. And the residents. Right, I'll check for on-site global personnel at the same time. It couldn't hurt. Things are a bit erratic in that area right now. What else is new? Right. There'd been no end to chaos and bloodshed throughout the Indonesian archipelago for close to 40 years, beginning with the massacre of half a million dissidents in 1965 continuing on through the civil war and genocide in East Timor. Indonesia was the kind of place where itinerant villains could lose themselves in the crowd, or find steady work if they mouthed the right political slogans. When are you leaving? A few hours, around sunrise, our time. I'll get back to Grimaldi by satellite link on that info. Try to catch you in flight if I can. 
Sounds good. Watch your back while you're at it. We still don't know how our players are connected. I'm watching. It comes with the job. Later then. Macau. Grimaldi felt Bolin beside him, almost touching close before the tall man spoke. It was enough to spook him sometimes, even now, the way his old friend could pop up anywhere he wanted to without a hint of warning. How's the fueling? <sighs> Just wrapped it up. I got my final pre-flight checklist, and the only thing we need is passengers and baggage. I can help you out on that. No hassles on the flight plan? Nope. We're cleared through to Jakarta. All they want to see on this end are the paid-up transit fees. Same on the other end? Smooth sailing. From what I understand, the government's too busy mopping up the meals to worry much about China right now. Besides, we've got credentials up the old wazoo. That would explain my lower back pain. The others ready? Pretty much. I'll have them here within the hour, packed and ready. What's the word from Hal? He's looking for a hardware dealer in Jakarta, hoping to touch base with you by SATCOM while we're traveling. Okay, look forward to it. I hoped we'd have this wrapped by now. Damn thing's turning into a production of Around the World in 80 Days. Maybe we'll nail it in Jakarta. Maybe part of it. We've still got nothing on Andrastas. Hard to figure out how a guy like that can disappear. He hides behind his money. No one from the inner circle wants to blow a whistle and lose his place at the trough. Still, this guy's like Onassis was, or Trump. You figure he's got doubles to divert the press? If so, they're missing too. Hal's waiting for a rumble from the paparazzi grapevine, but it's quiet as the grave so far. Hey, that's a thought. What is? Maybe his playmates took him out. It wouldn't be the first time rats abandoned ship and let the captain ride her down. We can't rule it out, but Andrastus was never in charge of the show. Take it for granted that he's got security in place, keeping a watchful eye on friends as well as enemies. Right now he's got to wonder where the heat's been coming from, and Napier can't do much to clear that up for either of his partners. The divide and conquer ploy? It wouldn't be my first choice, and it's damn hard to control when you can't even catch a glimpse of our opponents, but it may be all we have. You'd better work it then. I'd trade it off for one clean shot at Napier. Better, ten minutes of his time. Maybe Jakarta. Maybe. I'll keep my fingers crossed. Unless it interferes with keeping this thing in the air. Glancing at his watch, the executioner seemed to shrug off the conversation. I'll get the others. Back in ten. Okay. Grimaldi started running down his checklist, preparing for departure. Boland would be back in ten, fifteen at most, with Mendel and McCarter, and he didn't want to keep them waiting. They had places to go and people to kill. Airborne, South China Sea. McCarter cracked his second coke since takeoff, watching through his eastward-facing window as the vast Pacific skyline caught fire in a blaze of gold. He knew approximately where the Philippines were located, but couldn't see them from 500 miles away. Ahead, due south, Jakarta waited for them at the limit of their standard cruising distance, still more than a thousand miles of open sea and craggy islands left to go. They were unarmed again, the weapons left behind in their temporary safe house, marked for disposal at Ming Chohei's leisure. Embarked on yet another leg of a journey that appeared to have no end in sight, McCarter took stock of the action in Macau and tried to work out what they had accomplished. First, they'd turned up the heat under Lin Yuan Mok. Although he'd managed to escape them, they had fouled his nest and left him with a long list of questions to answer if he ever made it home to China. McCarter hoped to spare him that, for Katz's sake. But it was good to know the bastard-faced official embarrassment at least, should he slip through their fingers again and go looking for shelter at home. They'd also got another lead to Arnold Napier's whereabouts, for what that might be worth. Granted, at this point in the game, McCarter took all information they received with a prodigious grain of salt, but it was possible they'd find both men relaxed and waiting for them in Jakarta like a pair of sitting ducks. Just barely possible. McCarter didn't buy it, though. The mission hadn't gone that way from day one to their late departure from Macau. Each time they made a move, the enemy was one long jump ahead of them. They'd kicked some heavy ass, but it had so far been the wrong ass, more or less. They kept on skirmishing with players from the junior varsity instead of squaring off against the pros. Not that the second string was getting any easier. There'd been some dicey moments in Macau the previous night, and none of it broke even in McCarter's reckoning for losing cats. The score was still unsettled and would dog him everywhere he went until the men responsible were laid to rest once and for all. And would that be an end to it? 
Would taking out the three prime movers nail the casket shut on Napier's plot? They hadn't even really glimpsed the fine points of it yet, although Israel was clearly earmarked for disruption, possibly destruction, and from there, what? It was easy to surmise the broad outlines. An oil man with a billion dollar company behind him had to have his eyes on black gold in the Middle East. The man who crippled Israel, or removed it altogether as a player in the region, could expect to write his own ticket with oil-rich sheikhs and warlords from Tehran to Tripoli. Andrastus and his shipping line could pick up hefty contracts for transporting shipments from the Red Sea or the Persian Gulf to... where? China. The People's Republic had oil of its own, an estimated 24 billion barrels in reserve at the turn of the new century, but it would never be enough for a nation of 1.2 billion souls and counting. The Middle Eastern states, by contrast, had closer to 700 billion barrels on tap. When it came to natural gas, the imbalance was even more striking. Forty-odd trillion cubic feet for China versus nearly two quadrillion cubic feet buried beneath the Middle Eastern sands. If Napier tapped that motherload, he could emerge from the transaction as one of the richest men on Earth. Anyone who went along for the ride would likewise bank more cash than a hard-living rock star could spend in a dozen lifetimes. And that included certain Chinese officials, led by Lin Mok, who greased the wheels of commerce from Beijing. If money weren't enough, the Reds could also congratulate themselves on finally liberating their Palestinian brothers from the cruel yoke of Yankee-Israeli imperialism. It was a two-for-one shot with no losers on Napier's team. Until, one afternoon in Tel Aviv, a grizzled warrior on vacation with his family had recognized familiar faces in a street-side crowd. The rest was history, along with cats and several dozen players from the other side. The lot of them together didn't measure up to Yakov Katzenellenbogen, in McCarter's estimation, but he wasn't finished yet. Another crop of targets waited for him in Jakarta, and he meant to see them all plowed under if he could, beginning just as soon as they were on the ground. Macau. The new day dawned without promise for Ming Cho Hei. The previous night had changed him most profoundly and irrevocably. He couldn't decide if it was wicked of the Westerners to leave him thus, after enticing him into an armed rebellion he hadn't anticipated, or if what they'd done ranked as the single greatest favor of his life. Driving south across the mile-long causeway that connected Taipa to the Ila de Kuloane, Ming knew the fault, if fault there was, lay not with any foreigner, but with himself. He could have driven off and left his charges to the tender mercies of Macau's security police detachment, but he'd chosen to react instinctively and thereby crossed a line from which he feared, or was it hoped, there could be no return. Shut up, you bastard. Ming's recent allies hadn't ordered the disposal, but he knew what had to be done. Leong simply knew too much to live. He might well have ways of reaching out to warn Lin Mok that he was now in danger. Ming wouldn't permit him to do that. He understood that Lin Mok was involved in something more important, far more dangerous than any of his normal duties in Macau. Ming didn't understand exactly what it was or how much was at stake, but it appeared that he could damage the Beijing regime by helping to unravel the conspiracy. And his last contribution to that cause would be accomplished when he dealt with Leong Chunsong. Leaving the causeway, Ming drove south for roughly another quarter mile, then turned eastward toward the water. A half mile short of the coast, he found a road that wound into the hills, so narrow that it had laybys cut into the steep banks every hundred yards or so, permitting one driver or another to pull off if two cars met, coming from opposite directions. Ming met none today, however, and proceeded at an almost risky speed into the hills. His destination was a place he'd found by accident some years earlier. The winding road reached a dead end atop a tall hill crowned with trees. It had an eastward-facing view of the South China Sea, but was concealed from prying eyes by trees and undergrowth. Mud from the previous weekend's rain had dried without new tire tracks, telling Ming he was unlikely to be bothered there. Taking his pistol and his car keys, he got out and walked around behind the vehicle. Unlocking the trunk, he stepped back a long pace before the lid rose, revealing Leong's pale, worried face. Get out! Leong stared at him, wide-eyed. <laughs> Ming felt foolish, remembering that Leong's hands were bound behind his back. He couldn't climb out of the trunk unaided, even if his heart was willing and his legs were steady. 
Cautiously, half expecting a wild kick or headbutt, Ming hauled his prisoner upright, drawing him clear of the trunk until he could stand on his own two feet, more or less. Leung was wobbly, as if he'd forgotten how to walk at some point during their hour-long drive, but it came back to him as Ming steered him toward the trees, following a discreet pace behind. Leong had to have known that he was finished, for he bolted at the tree line, running for his life without a backward glance. It made things easier for Ming. A clean shot in the back from 15 paces, just between the shoulder blades. Ming approached Leong. The coup de grace from 10 or 12 inches. Ming put his gun away and dragged the body farther on, careful to touch only fabric, leaving no fingerprints on the body. Perhaps they could still extract DNA samples from his perspiration, where sweaty palms clutched Leong's jacket, but what of it? Without a suspect for comparison, the tests were useless. Tire tracks? There was nothing he could do about them now. They'd be obscured with the next rain, or when the next car reached his hilltop hideaway. Ballistics didn't matter unless someone found his gun, and Ming didn't intend to give it up without a fight. What do they say in America? When you pry for my cold, dead fingers. Yes, that sounds right. There was a new day coming for Ming and for Macau. His masters didn't know it yet, but they would be made aware of the change in the fullness of time. Meanwhile, they harbored no suspicion that their faithful servant had the strength or will to lift a hand against them. They believed he was a sheep. Ming drove back down the serpentine track, heading home to Macau. He needed sleep before the advent of another day, but he wouldn't rest long. There was too much to do now that he had made up his mind. He would surprise them all and leave them wondering how he had passed unnoticed among them for so long. And by the time they saw him coming, it would be too late. Airborne above the Java Sea. Almost there. They'd bypassed the green hulk of Borneo now, Bolan peering from his window without glimpsing a single wild man. Granted, there could have been a naked army capering around beneath the jungle treetops 15,000 feet below them, but he still had to wonder what all the fuss was about. Somehow, real life never lived up to the advertisements, except, perhaps, where danger was concerned. Regnola had been right about the climate of violence in Indonesia. Portions of the archipelago had been reduced to virtual anarchy during four decades of purges, revolts, and oppression. Some of the killing was political, carried out between far right and left. Still more was religious, between misguided Christians and Muslims. Ethnic cleansing in occupied East Timor had so far killed off nearly one-third of the island's 700,000 inhabitants, with no end to the genocide in sight. Curing Indonesia's many ills was beyond Boland's power, but he might take advantage of the general chaos to complete his mission, if the targets could be found and isolated. As to whether that was possible, he'd simply have to wait and see. Seated near the back of the Jetstar's passenger compartment, the soldiers studied Mendel and McCarter. The Israelis seemed to be asleep, though looks could be deceiving. McCarter was using his time to skim a travel guide on Indonesia, brushing up on the geography and other basics. There'd be next to nothing in the standard tourist literature about Indonesia's endemic problems. Mass murder had a tendency to discourage group tours, after all, and Indonesia lagged in that department as it was. Most Brits and Yankees knew the country only from old movies, like The Year of Living Dangerously, which were likewise not inclined to start a rush of tourism. But Indonesia did have oil, somewhere between 5 billion and 9 billion barrels, depending on the source of published estimates. While tiny in comparison with Middle Eastern states, that crude reserve made Indonesia the second greatest oil producing nation in the Far East after China. It stood to reason that Napier and Global Petroleum would have a foot in the door, taking whatever profits could be found from the long chain of islands. The more important question now was whether they would find Napier on site and could they pin him down? If so, the campaign could be over in a day. If not, they would be looking at another chase, assuming they survived. Jakarta. Yes. Ah, oh, Comrade Mark, uh, this is Xiao. 
What do you want, Shao? The caller was a ranking officer of the security police detachment in Macau. Mach's private secretary had been wakened and commanded to provide a contact number under threat of being charged with an offense against the public safety if he should refuse. The caller was known to Mach as an ambitious man who had his sights on a higher office and more authority. Oh, you realize that this is a mere courtesy call, Comrade Mark? Yes, get on with it, Shao. I regret to inform you that your home was destroyed tonight. What? Yes, by incendiary fire. Several of your bodyguards are dead. A final count will have to wait until the ashes have cooled and can be raked for bones. You must be joking. Oh, I know. I I'm quite humorless. A party of security police who responded to the trouble were ambushed and shot by persons unknown within 200 yards of your residence, Comrade Mark. Do you happen to have any thoughts on who might be responsible? I most assuredly do not. Hmm. Any idea of why you might be targeted by terrorists? Again, I have no clue. Oh, and why indeed would you, eh, Comrade Mark? Uh, we will most assuredly need for you to submit a formal statement upon your return to Macau. Most assuredly. Good morning, Comrade Zhao. Merely a courtesy call. With his free hand, Mark found the button for a bedside lamp and pushed it, blinking like a cave dweller in the sudden glare of light. It was his turn to call, another's turn to lurch awake in fear. He had the number memorized, of course. It was a function of Mach's personality to always be prepared, at least within the limits of predictable conditions. Yes? This is Lin Mach. May I speak to Mr. Napier? Uh, yes. Uh, one moment, please. The best part of a minute passed before Napier came on the line. Good morning, Lin. Nothing wrong with your hotel, I hope? Not the hotel. Mark described the action in Macau as it had been relayed to him. Details were sparse, but he explained the gist of it, making his apprehension plain. Napier refrained from interrupting until the man was finished, passing thirty seconds more in silence after that before he spoke. I do believe it's time we thought about a change of scene. You think that we are in danger here? Why take the chance? Where would we go? I have some thoughts on that. Uh, for the moment, please just pack your things. I'll have a driver pick you up in half an hour. Lin Mock was confused and agitated. He supposed leaving Jakarta was the wise thing to do. But leaving for where? If he simply disappeared, his masters in Beijing would take it badly. At the very least, they'd call for an accounting, and it could be even worse. Mach could be stripped of all his power, charged with sundry crimes, even convicted in absentia. It would be totally in character for Beijing to dispatch assassins if it was suspected that he'd turned against the party. Rising swiftly from his bed and moving toward the closet, Mach was more than ever thankful for his numbered bank accounts in Switzerland and the Bahamas. There was a certain sense of irony in Mach, a lifelong communist, depending for survival on the services of Western bankers, but he couldn't find it in himself to smile. His Chinese bodyguards were sleeping in the room next door, relieved of duty for the evening on Napier's promise to ensure security. Mach paused to question whether he should wake them, take them with him, but he decided against it. They were party loyalists to the core, when all was said and done. Dragging them along would only place him in more jeopardy if they decided he had turned against the People's Revolution and was operating on his own. He'd go alone, then, trusting Arnold Napier with his life, as if he had a choice. Aboard the Aristotle, east of Gibraltar. Always the telephone plagued him, making Andrastus wish he could sever all links to the outside world and simply drift away from his responsibilities. Of course, that attitude hadn't made him a billionaire and wouldn't help him stay alive when things got rough. He was in his stateroom, where one of a half-dozen telephone scramblers aboard the Aristotle was installed. He saw the button blinking for line one and suppressed an urge to turn it off. His face relaxed. A carefully rehearsed smile came to his lips, and he picked up the headset. Yes? It's Napier. Ah, no, my friend. You've solved our problem, I assume. Uh, not exactly. Uh, there's been further difficulty, as a matter of fact. More trouble? I would not have thought it possible. Oh, it's possible, all right. In Macau this time. Lynn's own backyard? 
His own damn house, if you believe it. At this point, I'm prepared to believe anything. Was he injured? Oh, they missed him. He's down here with me. Down here, meaning Jakarta, in the miserable heat. Andrastus loved the sun, but loathed the oppressive humidity of the tropics, avoiding them at all costs. Lucky for both of you. Or not. If they could slip into Macau, I'm guessing they could track him here. When you say they, I take it that you mean... We still don't have ID on any of the opposition. I've been beating bushes from D.C. to Tel Aviv and coming up with squat. That is most discouraging. Tell me about it. Anyway, we're, uh... We're looking for some place to spend a little time. Let things cool down, get things sorted out. I see. Unfortunately, it was true. Andrastus saw where this was going, and it didn't please him. Napier waited for the invitation, dead air whispering between them, until it was clear he'd have to ask. He owed Andrastus that much, at the very least, a frank admission of his failure to this point. So, I was hoping, uh, it was not too much to ask that we could pass a few days on your island. Uh, what's it called again? Dira. It meant untamed in Greek. Andrastus had named the island himself after purchasing it from a bankrupt competitor. It lay midway between Crete and the southernmost point of the Cyclades, omitted from most maps of the Mediterranean. It was his private sanctuary. Until now. Tira! Yeah, of course, uh, you don't mind, do you, Christos? Andrastus scowled, hating the words before he spoke them. Of course not. What are friends for? Partners. Of course. You won't regret it, Christos. I hope not, Arnold. My word of honor. Ah, in that case... He left the comment dangling, incomplete. What could he say to a man whose word of honor counted for less than nothing? Excellent. We'll book a flight through to Athens. Can you have someone meet us for the final leg? Consider it accomplished. Marvelous. I'll see you soon. Too soon. This meant another change of course. But that was nothing. The yacht's captain and crew took uncertainty in stride, drawing comfort from the knowledge that they earned more cash for every day they spent at sea. This deviation from their westward course would be cause for rejoicing. They were turning back for home. But what will we find there, Arnold? Will you show this nameless enemy the way there? If so, come hell or high water, dear Arnold. You won't leave my island alive. Jakarta. Half asleep and still reliving portions of a vivid nightmare, Jared Wagner wasn't sure that he could trust his ears. I'm, I'm not sure I understand, sir. Well, snap out of it, boy. I said I'm leaving you in charge. Just for a few days. No need to get your knickers in a twist. No, sir. Lynn is a hankering to sit down with Andrasta, so we're going. When, sir? Now, within the hour. Wagner squinted at the bedside clock. Even without his contact lenses, he could read the time. 4.42 a.m. Not mine to question why, he thought, grateful that he had been excluded from this literal fly-by-night adventure. Right. I'll get the pilots hopping, then, and, uh... No, it's already done. No worries. All you have to do is keep your eyes wide open when I'm gone and make sure everything runs smoothly. Yes, sir. In regard to that... Chop, chop. Come on, spit it out, son. If I may ask where you're going, sir, in case I need to get in touch with you for any reason? Oh, sorry, I thought I told you. You remember Tira? No? Uh, of course you've never been there, have you? No, sir. Christus has a private island getaway, perfect for talking business when the walls at home have ears. Now, if something happens, and I have no reason to believe it will, just use the SATCOM link to ring me up as usual. Yes, sir. Okay, that's it then. Go on back to sleep. Yes, sir. As if I could, sir. Technically, it wasn't the first time Wagner was in charge. He'd been running portions of the global empire under supervision for the best part of a year. He'd managed the Jakarta office well enough, but this was different. Being in charge meant literally that. He had the driver's seat while Napier flew off to some tiny island in the Med to take a meeting on a whim. It should have been great news, but Wagner was already looking for the catch. He couldn't see it yet, but there was bound to be one ready to bite him on the ass when he least expected it. Still, he was playing in the big leagues now where whiners never prospered and were soon cut from the team. 
Wagner hadn't invested so much time in global petroleum, the tedium of micromanagement, backstabbing office politics, to simply cut and run the first time he was trusted with some real responsibility. It was his chance to shine, and if he had the opportunity to solve some problem that intimidated Arnold Napier, why, so much the better. In fact, he couldn't think of a better way to prove himself than under fire. It still worried him, though. The uncertainty guaranteed that there'd be no more sleep for him this night. Known threats were one thing. Every problem had a viable solution once all angles of attack were analyzed and placed into perspective. With the unknown, though, it was impossible to be prepared, and Wagner didn't like surprises. And tough, Jared. Just suck it up. He rolled out of bed and turned off the alarm clock, set for a perfectly civilized six o'clock wake-up. Sleep was lost to him now, and there was no point putting off the start of his day, finding out what it might hold in store. Washington, D.C. Yeah, boss? Put me through to the big guy. You are the big guy. Don't I know it. All right, one second. What's up? Two things. First, I've got a hardware dealer for you. Operating undercover as a jeweler. Smart Money says I'll bitch the name. He goes by Kuznadi Hulanapo. Name of the shop? Kuznadi's. The quote from my source says it's modest in appearance, but always well stocked. That's encouraging anyway. I can't confirm Napier's location, but I've ID'd his new number two. Name's Jared Wagner, 35 years old. He's got an MBA from Stanford and the morals of an alley cat, from what I gather. Anyway, he's bent enough for Napier to promote him after Sterling Holbrook bought the farm. Brignola gave Bolin Wagner's home and office address. No confirmation of primary targets? Sorry, no. From what I gather, Napier's always been tight-lipped, but it's changed from a habit to an obsession the past year or so. His movements are strictly need-to-know. Flunkies get summoned to a meeting, and it's, bam, drop what you're doing, folks. The boss is here to pat you on the back or chew you out, whatever. Someone always knows. Granted, he trusts the one VP with details. It used to be Holbrook, now Wagner. I guess we'll need to have a chat. Good luck. You still don't want a contact on the ground? We shouldn't need one, but I'll keep you in mind if it starts to go south. I appreciate that. Okay, I'll be in touch. In the meantime... No news is good news. I know the drill. Later. Above the Indian Ocean. Lin Mock was catching up on sleep after the early morning roust from his hotel. Despite his evident anxiety, he'd managed to doze off while paging through a Playboy magazine, presumably intent on checking out the thoughtful articles. Napier was pleased to have his guest unconscious for a while. It gave him time to think without incessant questions on security and what he planned to do when they arrived in Greece. The aircraft was a Gulfstream III, 83 feet from nose to tail, with a wingspan only five feet shorter than the jet's total length. It was built to carry eight passengers and three crewmen in the lap of luxury, the contingent for this trip consisting of Napier, Lynn Mock, and four of Global Petroleum's top security men. The bodyguards were an international mix, including a South African, a former Spetsnaz captain, a cashiered sergeant from the British SAS, and an ex-Navy SEAL. Among them, they were fluent in nine languages and qualified with every modern weapon known to man, particularly those they carried on the plane. There'd be no customs hassle when they got to Athens. Andrastus and Napier had enough combined influence to smooth that over, and his bodyguards were licensed to carry firearms in any case. Most governments acknowledge their deficiencies in the field of executive protection, granting broad leeway to the guardians of those with six-figure incomes and higher, as long as they paid certain fees and made an effort not to litter the streets with bodies. In security, as in all other realms of high-priced human endeavor, decorum and finance went hand in hand. Napier had been to Tira twice before, and he had requested it for a reason. The island was twelve square miles of sand and rock, civilized by Christos Andrastus when he built a palatial villa on its highest ground and shipped in the soil to support lush gardens, along with some strategically located trees. The place was a combination hideaway and fortress, staffed with a cordon bleu chef and enough hired security to staff a large maximum security prison, or to repel invaders if it came to that. 
Ideally, Napier hoped to elude his pursuers while pushing his effort to identify them, then either grease the right palms to call off the attack or hit back with all of the considerable force at his disposal. He'd been on the defensive so far, and it would stay that way until his enemies had names and faces. Only then could Napier do what he did best, applying any pressure necessary to defeat them, take them out. Until then, the best he could do was lie low and play the part of a filthy rich castaway. Andrastus had been reluctant to accommodate them, and Napier couldn't fault him for that, as long as he agreed in the end. Their fates were linked to an extent, for good or ill, as long as they were partners in the present operation. If and when Napier believed his partners were no longer serving his best interests, he'd feel free to change the rules and write them out of the script. But for now, he definitely needed help, and would do anything within his power to ensure that neither Linmach nor Andrastus got cold feet. Napier checked his Rolex watch, made allowance for the time zones they were crossing at 512 miles per hour, and reckoned that they'd be stopping for fuel in Bombay in another three hours. From there, it was on to Kuwait, then across the desert, where his troubles had started, to reach Athens near midnight. All he had to do was stay alive until then, and he'd be as safe as a diamond sitting in a jeweler's safe. No, wait, make that a brick of gold in Fort Knox. If need be, he could hide on Tira as long as it took to resolve his embarrassing problem once and for all. Napier wouldn't allow himself to be defeated. It was laughable, unthinkable. His wealth and power wouldn't permit it. He wouldn't contemplate defeat. Jakarta The rental car was a black Toyota Camry, the four-door model, with trunk space to spare for luggage and hardware. McCarter had taken the wheel to start, Grimaldi riding shotgun, while Bolan and Mindel shared the back seat. They had directions to Kuznati's jewelry shop, winding through streets with yard-long, tongue-twisting names. It seemed to Bolan that the locals had to spend hours just addressing envelopes, but maybe they got used to it. Kuznati's was located in a downscale commercial district, a mile south of the Jakarta fairgrounds and the American embassy. Kuznadi Hulanapo was a tiny bird-like figure, swimming in a baggy shirt and trousers, brittle gray hair poking out from underneath a sort of pillbox hat. Kuznadi Hulanapo? Greetings, friends. Shall we go talk? Of course. Artie, please mind this door. Of course. Jack, please keep her company. My pleasure. Shall we? The proprietor led Bolan, McCarter, and Mendel into the rear of his establishment. There, he opened a closet door to reveal a steep staircase descending below street level. Kuznati went first, the others following at intervals that placed no more than one at a time in jeopardy from an ambush below. In fact, they found themselves alone with Kuznati in a spacious chamber resembling a military arsenal. It was cool and dry, with weapons hanging from the walls, crated or racked in tidy rows across the floor. Bolan made out a fair variety as he moved up and down the aisles, inspecting Kuznati's inventory. Indonesia has no native arms industry to speak of, relying for its firepower on industrial nations of East and West alike. Since 1965, it had dealt primarily with the United States and Western Europe. That trade reflected in the range of assault rifles, submachine guns, and pistols displayed in Kuznati's basement armory. There were Kalashnikovs, of course, but they were heavily outnumbered by M16s, Steyr AUGs, various H&K models, Beretta AR-70s, even a couple of British SA-80s. The SMGs ran toward Uzis, Sterlings, and Berettas, heavy on the solid Heckler and Koch MP5s. Sidearms included Colts, Berettas, Brownings, Glocks, and a lone 50 caliber Desert Eagle. Beyond those standard items were shotguns and grenade launchers, a few sniper pieces, and a tripod-mounted GE minigun in 7.62 mm. Bolin tried not to wonder who would want the minigun, deciding that a country known for ethnic and political mayhem spanning half a century would find any number of takers for a weapon that spewed armor-piercing rounds at a cyclic rate of 6,000 rounds per minute. They settled on four AUGs, with eight transparent plastic magazines for each, 240 rounds per weapon, and a case of 5.56 mm in reserve. For sidearms, they chose Berettas, threaded to accommodate suppressors, with shoulder rigs and four spare magazines apiece. Bolin passed on the grenades this time, deciding they would be too risky in a crowded urban setting, and the deal was made. 
Kuznadi threw in four black duffel bags, and they were on their way. What now? Let's go have a look at Global's offices, then swing by and see where Wagner spends his evenings. They would have to start somewhere, and since there was no hope of tracking Arnold Napier to his hotel, apartment, or whatever without guidance from the home team, Bolin thought the next best thing was scoping out their access to the oil man's number two. Wagner could point them to the boss, but they would have to find him first and pin him down. Bolin expected some resistance, but he also knew that any opposition could be overcome, given determination and sufficient force. With any luck, they might find Napier hanging out with Wagner, and they wouldn't have to deal with his subordinate at all, except as a secondary target. That would be the easy way. But Bolin had already hit too many obstacles in the course of this mission to expect a sudden, fortuitous breakthrough. He fully expected to work, and work hard, for each advance they made. Why should today be any different than yesterday, or the day before that? There was a reason why they called it war, and not a picnic. This was where a soldier paid his dues, and there was still a chance that some of them would never make it home. Cats hadn't, after all. He never would, unless there was a place for battle-hardened warriors in the afterlife. Bolin left that to theologians, concentrating his attention on the here and now. Jared Wagner had already dictated nearly a dozen letters and memos that morning, assuring various department heads and major stockholders that Global was on solid ground, its future solid and unthreatened by the recent lamentable murder of Sterling Holbrook. There was no danger to the company at large, Wagner assured them, and stock prices, having dropped slightly over the past few days, were sure to rebound strongly with the culmination of deals even now in the works. Wagner hadn't mentioned what those deals entailed. He hadn't named the partners who were helping Arnold Napier make his grab for the brass ring. It might have been too much for some of them to swallow. And besides, Wagner had his own unwritten rule about evidence and witnesses. Don't leave any. Wagner couldn't make up for any mistakes Napier and the other principals had made up to the present time, but he could certainly avoid making any new ones of his own. To that end, he had increased security around his home and office as soon as Napier and Lynn Mock left town, drawing extra manpower from the elite force Global kept on tap in countries like Indonesia, where violence and political instability were facts of daily life. Eight gunmen were guarding him now, as he plotted his schedule for the rest of the week. Two were stationed in the office building's underground garage, two more in the lobby, and four on the floor where Global's suite of offices was located. They all carried pistols, one member of each pair sporting a briefcase that contained a compact submachine gun. Wagner didn't know the make or models of their weapons, couldn't have cared less for any of the paramilitary jargon they all loved, but he was fairly confident of being covered if and when some adversary tried to take him out. Wagner carried no weapon himself because he wouldn't have known what to do with it. Skeet shooting was one thing, another means of kissing well-placed ass on weekends, but he didn't plan on joining any war games. That's what ex-commando flunkies were for. Wagner checked his watch against the artsy sunburst wall clock, a garish monstrosity that had to have cost a small fortune but looked like something he'd have expected to find in a double-wide trailer parked on the wrong side of the tracks in some Dixie backwater. It was half an hour to quitting time, give or take a minute— and Wagner decided that he was done for the day. It was time to relax, unwind a little, maybe even rent a little female companionship from one of the takeout services he used on a bi-weekly basis. It would help take the edge off his nervous frustration, let him face the following day with a new, improved attitude, and he could put the whole damn thing on his expense account. Reaching across his glass-top desk, Wagner keyed the intercom. Yes, sir? I'm leaving for the day. Have security on standby in five minutes. They can bring the car around in front. Yes, sir. He'd put in an exhausting day, albeit seldom stirring from his desk, and only once emerging from his private office to join a pair of marketing executives for lunch. There was more to being in charge than just kicking back and enjoying the perks, Wagner realized. But the perks were definitely part of it. Like telling the shooters when and where to fall in, like good little soldiers... Smiling, Jared Wagner left his office, looking forward to the night ahead. With any luck, he would be working up a sweat before much longer, and he wouldn't have to come within a mile of the corporate gym. 
McCarter stood before the office building's glass-fronted directory, pretending to study names and office numbers while Napier security men studied him. He'd made them out as soon as he entered the lobby, a mismatched pair whose members were nonetheless obvious teammates. The glass in front of him showed both men watching from their stations on the far side of the lobby, but McCarter would have felt their gaze even if he couldn't see them. The one on his right, closer to the bank of elevators, was the older of the pair. He wore his graying hair buzzed close enough to show tanned scalp beneath the stubble, either ignoring or deliberately emphasizing the male pattern baldness that was overtaking him by slow degrees. He wore a lightweight khaki-colored suit with a moderately subtle bulge beneath his left arm, a pair of steel-rimmed spectacles perched on his beak of a nose. The attaché case planted beside his right foot was a no-frills model, black imitation leather with a plastic handle, large enough to hold one of the smaller SMGs, perhaps a mini Uzi or an MP5K. It could have fit two micro Uzis, but the older gunman stood too far away from his partner to make a second stutter gun worthwhile. The younger watchman had a sense of style, his blonde hair worn long in back and covering the tops of sunburned ears. His eyes were hidden behind mirrored sunglasses, large hands clasped in front of his groin as if to safeguard the family jewels. His suit was navy blue, jacket unbuttoned for easy access to the pistol he wore on his left hip, holstered butt forward for a cross-hand draw. That was an awkward way to go, unless the shooter practiced regularly, and McCarter was prepared to give him the benefit of the doubt on that score. The gunman wore no corporate badges, but McCarter assumed they were part of Napier's hard force. There'd be others he hadn't seen yet, at least two more upstairs, one or more in the garage if Napier knew what he was doing. How many guns in all? He wouldn't find out by loitering around the lobby. McCarter spent another moment in front of the directory, memorizing nothing. He'd known the floor number for Napier's offices, eleven, before he walked in from the street. His mission was simple reconnaissance, and there was little to be learned after he spotted the gunman, registered dual security cameras mounted at the northwest and southeast corners of the ceiling, and verified a set of service stairs beside the elevators. In order to reach those stairs, however, McCarter would have to pass within arm's length of the older gunman, and he didn't plan on trying that just now. Raiding the office was a last resort, recognized up front as a worst-case scenario. Any action in a public building meant civilian bystanders, restricted movement, and increased probability of police intervention before the raiders could accomplish anything. The office might be suitable for sniping. Bolin was checking that angle, while McCarter worked close up and personal, but long-distance elimination ruled out any chance to question the target before he went down. And before they started dropping anyone, they had to find out whether all their targets were in place. If they could tag Lynn Mock and Napier in Jakarta, they would have two out of three. Reflected in the glass, McCarter watched the older gunman slip a hand inside his jacket and retrieve a compact walkie-talkie that had been clipped to his belt. He listened for a moment, then spoke into the radio, a curt acknowledgment too low for McCarter to hear. The Briton chose that moment to glance at his watch, scowl in feigned frustration, and make his way back to the street. The gunners were in motion as he left, apparently satisfied with his departure. He dared not glance back to see if they were tracking him, but as he hit the sidewalk, turning left, he caught a peripheral glimpse of elevator doors closing behind the younger of the pair, while the man with the briefcase held his position. Something was happening, McCarter realized as he crossed the street to the Toyota, Jack Grimaldi at the wheel, Rebecca Mindel in the shotgun seat. The Briton checked his watch for real this time and guessed that someone had called down from upstairs, alerting the watchers that it was time to move out. Bolin appeared on the crowded sidewalk, reaching the Camry seconds after McCarter. Something's up. They're on the move. One shooter pulled out of the lobby. Quitting time? Could be. Let's wait a minute and find out. Three minutes later, a white limousine nosed out of the office building's underground garage and swung around to double park in front. No sooner was the sleek crew wagon in place than McCarter saw the older of the lobby gunmen emerge, making his way toward the car. Behind him came five more hard men, his young cohort among them, a sixth figure moving briskly in their midst. It isn't Napier. Wagner? Looks like it. So where's the boss? Not here, unless the bodyguards are leaving him behind. I don't buy that. No way. You want to follow him, Blansky? Looks like the only game in town. Let's roll and see where this one takes us. Aboard the Aristotle, west of Crete. Christos Andrastus despised living in fear. 
a billionaire several times over, he believed that wealth should insulate its owners from the daily trials and tribulations of the world at large. What good was money if it couldn't buy security? Lawyers, accountants, bodyguards, they all combined to form a shield around the filthy rich, protecting them from harm. Or, at the very least, it was supposed to work that way. Of late, Andrastus had been disappointed in the value he was getting for his drachma. Everywhere he looked, it seemed as if security was breaking down. First in the Middle East, with Napier's foolproof operation, now in China with Lin Mok. If their faceless enemies could invade Red China and tackle the state, for God's sake, where could a not-so-humble shipping magnet turn for sanctuary? To Tira, perhaps. He sat and sipped Uzo, willing himself to be calm. There was still no hard evidence of an organized military move against Napier or any other cartel member, but Andrastus believed there were few, if any, assassins capable of spanning such distances, striking with such precision and destructive force without some kind of official sanction and support. His first vote went to the Americans, impetuous as always, despite the fact that Napier's contacts had come away empty-handed from their inquiries to the FBI and CIA. There were always ways and means of getting dirty work accomplished outside the strict chain of command. Andrastus knew that well enough from personal experience. Reluctantly, he'd opened the yacht's arms locker and distributed weapons to all qualified crewmen. An attack at sea was unlikely, but Andrastus didn't believe in gambling where his own survival was concerned. If Napier and Lynn Mock had already been targeted, it stood to reason that his own time had to be coming soon. Coincidence on that scale was a myth. Andrastus had even armed himself for the occasion, fastening a custom-tailored ankle holster around his left leg, adjusting quickly to the 12.5-ounce weight of the Colt MK4 Series 80 Mustang pocket light pistol. If all else failed, and enemies somehow got past his bodyguards, Andrastus would have six shots with which to defend himself. He drank more Uzo, willing himself not to worry. His security force included some of the best gunmen money could buy, seasoned killers with decades of combat behind them, veterans of grim brushfire wars throughout the Third World and Eastern Europe. Andrastus ensured their loyalty with top dollar paychecks, demanding rigorous training as part of the regimen. On another island, several miles from Tira, he'd constructed a training facility that rivaled Fort Benning and Hereford. Sailing past Crete, he hoped the guns wouldn't be necessary, but his soldiers would be ready if it came to killing. They were always ready, day or night, to earn the cash and other privileges that he provided. None of them had ever failed Andrastus yet. Relaxing, finally, he allowed his thoughts to drift away across the Azure Sea. If danger waited for him, he would meet it in due time. Jakarta the limo led them back to Jared Wagner's home in an affluent suburb north of downtown Jakarta. More shooters were waiting outside as the vehicle pulled to the curb, disgorging Wagner and his armed entourage on the sidewalk before a ten-story apartment house, all burnished steel and tinted glass. Looks like a long way to the penthouse. They'll have a service elevator. We need to check it out. My turn. You sure? Positive. She'd come prepared, in fact, anticipating this moment. Between her feet, a plastic shopping bag held the bouquet of flowers she'd purchased from a street vendor, while Blansky and McCarter were sizing up the global offices. She'd had the stirrings of a plan in mind, and now she saw the chance to follow through with it. Grimaldi, driving, eyed the flowers as she pulled them from the bag. Good thinking. Thanks. Where do you want to start? Around this corner. She pointed to the cross street flanking Wagner's building on the west. Just drop me anywhere along the block. Can do. Grimaldi turned the corner and drove far enough down the block to ensure that no one loitering outside Wagner's building would notice when he braked the Camry long enough for Mindel to get out. He flashed her a smile and a thumbs-up salute, while Blansky and McCarter kept their eyes on traffic and pedestrians. Mindel took it as an encouraging sign that no one felt obliged to wish her luck. She crossed the street, holding the flowers in her left hand, her right hand free in case she had to whip the newly purchased pistol from underneath her jacket. She doubled back to the main entrance of Wagner's apartment building. There were no guards on the street outside, a hopeful sign. The doorman was a swarthy type who didn't smile at women if he wasn't being paid to do so. 
He was ready to ignore Mendel until she stepped in front of him, demanding his attention. If a smile could generate raw heat, hers would have melted the impassive doorman where he stood. She shoved the flowers in the doorman's face. Delivery from Mr. Jared Wagner? The doorman took a backward step, frowning as if suspecting that the flowers might be dangerous. You, friend? It's a delivery. Flowers. Indeed. Delivery use service elevator. Excellent. And where is that? He aimed a stubby index finger past the glass revolving door, across the lobby, toward a bank of elevators set into the northern wall. Despite the tinted glass, Mendel could see the elevator farthest to her right was labeled service. Thank you. She brushed past the doorman with another smile. Delivery. Ha! Stupid American. Go see Mr. Wagner. He got package for you. Mindel stepped into the revolving door and let it carry her through half a circuit to the air-conditioned lobby. One foot on the carpet and Mindel had the gunman spotted. Two on station at the Far East Wall. They tried to pass for visitors, inconspicuous in their side-by-side -side easy chairs, newspapers open for browsing, but it didn't wash. Mindel was conscious of the soldiers watching as she crossed the lobby with long, purposeful strides. She went directly to the service elevator, as if she'd made the journey a thousand times before and knew exactly where to go. She pressed the elevator's button, let the gunman study her without acknowledging their presence while she waited for the door to open. She stepped inside and pressed a button for the seventh floor, still perfectly aloof as the door closed again and killed her lobby view. The elevator wasn't one of those that signaled which floors it was visiting as it rode up and down the shaft, but Mindel took no chances. She imagined one of the gorillas in the lobby reaching for a two-way radio, alerting his penthouse compatriots to a potential problem. They'd be waiting on the ninth floor, she imagined, but her failure to appear would put their minds at ease, give them a reason to relax their guard a bit. She got off on the seventh floor and dropped the flowers in a wastebasket that stood beside the elevator doorway. Checking both directions, she picked out the stairs a few yards to her left and went that way, relieved to find the access door unlocked. She checked the knob from both sides to be sure before she let the door close at her back. Taking her time, avoiding all unnecessary noise, she climbed four flights to reach the penthouse level, pausing at the final door. It had no window, but she pressed her ear against the panel, listening. No voices audible beyond, which could mean anything or nothing. It was time to take a chance. She drew the black Beretta, held it with the safety off, and turned the doorknob slowly, silently. With agonizing slowness, Mendel cracked the door a half inch, then an inch. The slice of hallway visible from where she stood was empty, quiet as a grave. Holding her breath, she pulled the door open and risked a glance around it, down the corridor, and froze. Kuwait City. Lynn Mark shifted restlessly in his seat. How much longer? Not long. Napier just wished Mock would read a magazine or go back to sleep, do anything, in fact, but make his pitiful anxiety so obvious. In fact, Napier wished that he'd left the Chinese diplomat behind to fret and worry in Jakarta, but it hadn't been an option. Not this time. But soon, perhaps. Napier imagined that Mock's stock was selling pretty cheap at home right now. After the bloody business in Macau, his disappearance from the scene and failure to contact authorities after the fact, the man had to be skating on the proverbial thin ice. One false step, or a helpful shove at an opportune moment, and he'd be history. But who would take his place? Better to wait until the deal was finalized. Then, with connections completed, signed contracts in hand, he could freely cut Mach loose and watch him drift. If he escaped to Switzerland or ultimately stood before a Chinese firing squad, what difference would it make? By that time, some other official would have stepped into the vacuum, tickled pink to cut a deal with Global Petroleum. It was a fact of life, whether he plied his trade in the East or the West. Self-interest always triumphed. Avarice always won out in the end. Mark swiveled in his seat, seemed on the verge of repeating his monotonous question, but he saw the look on Napier's face and reconsidered, scowling through his northward-facing window. With a telescope, he could have seen Iraq from where they sat, but as it was, his view was limited to blacktop runways and a portion of the airport terminal. 
Refueling had to be almost finished now, but still the minutes dragged, seeming to last forever. One more hop would put them on the ground in Athens, where Andrastus would have soldiers waiting to protect them, see them safely on their way to Tyra. There, with any luck, they would, for all intents and purposes, cease to exist. Wagner alone knew where Napier was going from Jakarta. Napier trusted him, his greed, if nothing else, to keep his mouth shut on that score. And just in case he faltered or fell into dangerous hands by some chance, Napier had spoken privately with Wagner's chief bodyguard, receiving strict instructions that there would be no repetition of the Sterling Holbrook sideshow, not this time. Napier left his seat and moved aft to the Gulf Stream's galley, where a well-stocked bar was located. He poured himself a double shot of single malt Irish whiskey, old Bushmills, and drank it down in two swallows, enjoying the fire it lit inside him. The tension in his stomach melted, uncoiling like a watch spring winding down. Napier was back in his seat as the pilots returned from their walking tour of inspection, satisfied that nothing had been overlooked, no crucial operation slighted. They'd be airborne in a few more moments, winging westward toward the Mediterranean and sanctuary. Flying over all that oil. And much of it would soon be his. Napier had suffered setbacks, granted, but his master plan was still on track. As soon as his men took delivery of the black market nuclear device, he would be ready for the last stage of the operation. Delivery of that package and the firestorm that would follow were not matters that concerned him now. He left that part of it to destiny and concentrated on the details readily within his grasp. Lynn Mock, for one, and how to keep him pacified until the smoke cleared and the black gold started flowing. By the time Mock realized he was expendable, it would already be too late for him to save himself. Fade accompli. What was that? Oh, nothing. Napier smiled as the Gulf Stream began to taxi toward takeoff. The French, he thought with private satisfaction, always had a term for everything. Jakarta. Here she comes. No tails as far as I can see. Bolin watched Mendel cross the street, Grimaldi slowing on his latest pass and waiting for her to catch up. He watched for any movement on the sidewalk that would indicate pursuit, but she was in the clear. <sighs> it's as we thought. Two watchers in the lobby... Two more in the hall outside the Pinto suite. You got that far? Barely. Enough to look around a bit before the goons came by. They didn't see you then? Only in the lobby, Blinsky. They didn't try to follow when I went upstairs. Hardware? Concealed sidearms. One of the lobby watchers had a briefcase standing by his chair. They take it for granted it held something larger than a pistol. Same thing as the office building. They're consistent anyway. The two outside the penthouse didn't carry any luggage, but they'd have backup close at hand. We can assume the in-house crew has more artillery. You use the service elevator? Up to the seventh floor. I took the stairs from there. No lookouts in the stairwell? Not from seven upward. Maybe lower, or perhaps they were between shifts. It surprised me too. We'll have to play that part of it by ear. How many guns is that? Six in the limousine and two more waiting on the street. We can assume he leaves a team upstairs to keep the home fires burning while he's at the office. Figure ten or twelve, minimum. And still no sign of Napier. Nothing to indicate he might be chilling in the penthouse? No. It's hard for me to picture him and Wagner sharing digs like college roommates. So where is he then? That's what we need to ask his number two. Sooner the better than I say. This shouldn't be a bloody marathon. It is what it is. We can't do anything before nightfall. Suppose he has a date, then what? We'll tag along. See if maybe we can go Dutch treat. Rich buggers never take the check if they can help it. Payday's coming. Our friend upstairs just doesn't know it yet. We get some time to kill. Three hours anyway before it's dark. Suggestions? Whatever we do, we need to keep an eye on Wagner until showtime. That's job one. There's a restaurant a half block down from the apartment house. It'd make a decent vantage point. Parking? Looked like they had a lot in back. Suits me. Who else is hungry? I could eat. Me too. Right then, it's unanimous. I'm on a case. Just watch the bloody speed limit. Relax, old chap. It's in the bag. They drove around the block once more, Bolan surveilling Wagner's building as they passed. No sentries were apparent from the street, 
but he supposed the pair Mindel had seen were still on duty in the lobby. Getting past them was the first challenge his team would have to face. Whatever happened after that would be determined in large part by whether they succeeded in avoiding violent clashes at the outset of their penetration. But once they were inside, he knew they could expect a warm reception from the enemy. Red Hot would be more like it, he supposed, and that could cut both ways. Grimaldi found the restaurant and turned into an alley west of it. The parking lot was small but nearly empty. He had room to turn and back into an open slot, ready to exit on a moment's notice. <sighs> Leaving the hardware in a car? I think the duffel bags might raise some eyebrows. Okay, no carjackers around this neighborhood, I guess. The parking lot was boxed in on three sides, no exit other than the alleyway by which they'd entered. Bolin calculated that they wouldn't find a safer place to park it in Jakarta, short of hiring someone to stand watch while they were in the restaurant. His first concern now was the possibility that Wagner might decide to exit while they occupied a window table, watching him depart but unable to overtake his car before he slipped away. Bolin trailed the others toward the sidewalk and the restaurant. They had three hours and change to kill before they made their move, and then the killing in Jakarta would begin. Rebecca Mendel felt overdressed for a killing. Her suit was too stylish, altogether too sophisticated for battle, and while the short skirt would be suitable for running or kicking an adversary in the groin, her high-heeled pumps would never take the place of combat boots or simple running shoes. Her knee-length raincoat was appropriate, given the weather in Jakarta, but its main function was concealment of the Steyr assault rifle she carried slung beneath her right arm, clutched against her side. She crossed the street with long strides. Mindel knew she might have to ditch the shoes when the shooting started, but for the moment they were part of her cover. They emphasized her shapely legs, naturally drawing male eyes away from her face, and she had untied her hair to let it fall around her shoulders, further shielding her profile. Mindel didn't know if the same two guards would be working the lobby, but if so, she hoped to slip past them without being recognized from her afternoon reconnaissance mission. If that failed, and they tried to intercept her, she would have to kill both of them. She would use the sound-suppressed Beretta nestled in her large handbag if possible, or even take them hand to hand. If all else failed, and strictly as a last resort, she would unleash the Steyr AUG. But that would mean she'd failed in her part of the plan, and Mindel wasn't ready to concede defeat. Not yet. She stood outside Wagner's apartment building for a moment, glancing back toward the alley where Blansky and McCarter waited for their turns to crack the enemy's stronghold. Mindel couldn't see them from where she stood, but she knew they'd be there, watching. Mindel dismissed them from her mind and pushed through the revolving door, her second visit to the apartment house lobby in five hours. It was still early evening by tropical standards, but she was relieved to see two unfamiliar lookouts in the lobby. Both tracked her as she moved with purpose toward the bank of public elevators opposite the door, their gaze like fingers roaming over Mindel's body, probing where the cold eyes came to rest. She was afraid they'd spot a telltale bulge beneath her raincoat or tumble to the fact that her oversized handbag didn't match the stylish outfit. Either way, they'd try to stop her or alert their friends upstairs that trouble was approaching. Mindel ignored them, hiding behind the easy arrogance that some attractive women hold in reserve for use as a weapon or as a defense mechanism. She knew they were watching her, trying to decide if she was danger on the hoof, but neither of them moved to intercept her before she reached the elevators. One of the cars stood open, waiting for her, and she entered it without hesitation, turning back to face the lobby for a moment as she pressed the eighth floor's button. The door slid shut in front of her, cutting off Mindel's view of the lobby. She imagined the two lookouts reaching for cell phones or two-way radios, warning their comrades on the penthouse level to stand ready. She slipped her right hand into the slit pocket of her raincoat, its lining cut to let her reach the AUG's pistol grip. If they stopped the elevator on another floor or had a shooter waiting for her on eight, she'd be ready. Mindel checked the watch on her left wrist, imagining the other members of her team as they moved into their positions. She wished them luck and hoped they wouldn't be cut off before the time appointed for their rendezvous. If she was forced to sweep the penthouse by herself, she put that deadly prospect out of mind as the elevator cleared seven and slowed on its way to the eighth floor stop. Standing to one side of the door, taking advantage of the small car's minimal cover, she was ready to return fire if a welcoming committee met her there. She was alone. 
Checking the hallway left and right, Mindel exited the car and moved directly to the door that granted access to the stairs. It was another point of vulnerability, but she pushed through the door boldly, following the stire, and met no opposition. Two flights of stairs rose above her to the ninth floor and their target, seemingly unguarded. Mindel stepped out of her shoes, picked them up with her left hand, and started to climb. As expected, the back door to Wagner's apartment building was guarded. One man had the duty, standing to one side of the doorway and its naked light bulb mounted on the wall overhead. It was a lousy job, but someone had to do it for the boss's sake. McCarter had closed to within 50 feet of his target, taking advantage of the trash cans and garbage bins that made the alley a poor man's obstacle course. He had rats for company, some of the largest he'd ever seen, and their scuttling movements helped cover McCarter's advance as he paced off the distance, keeping to the shadows, the Beretta in his fist muzzle-heavy with its fat suppressor. He could try a shot from 50 feet, but 40 would be better, and 30 better still. Closing the gap, McCarter watched his man in profile, silhouetted with the light behind him. When two reeking garbage bins lay between them, the sentry lit a cigarette and blew a plume of smoke into the night. McCarter found his target through the drifting cloud and waited while the guard glanced to his right, checking the east end of the alley, turning back when he saw nothing to alarm him. McCarter took him with a clean shot through the temple, rushing forward as the man collapsed in case a second bullet was required. It wasn't. The back door to Wagner's apartment house was locked, as expected. McCarter could have picked the simple pin lock, but he had neither the time nor the proper equipment to beat the deadbolt by stealth. He took a semi-auto pistol from the corpse and slipped it into his waistband for backup, then started turning out the sentry's pockets, looking for a key. He found it in a pocket of the lightweight vest the man had worn to hide his shoulder rig and pistol from casual passers-by if the alley got any foot traffic. McCarter tried the key and found it fit both locks. He paused long enough to drag his man behind the nearest garbage bin, then went back and slipped inside the apartment house. Bolan took the time to lock the door again behind him. The service elevator waited for him, unguarded. It was roughly three times the size of a normal passenger car designed to accommodate cleaning equipment and furniture deliveries. McCarter had the spacious car to himself as he punched the button for the ninth floor. Bolan entered the apartment building's lobby three minutes after Mindel disappeared through the tall revolving door. He made a point of pausing just inside and checking out the lobby, dismissing the twenty-something clerk behind the information desk and lingering deliberately as he locked eyes with the sentry stationed there, one after the other. They were instantly alert, suspicious, just the way he wanted them. He knew they were watching as he crossed the lobby, heading toward the elevators, and he could practically feel them leap from their chairs as he veered off course at the last minute, bypassing the cars and ducking through the door marked stairs. Bolan double-timed up the stairs to reach the second-floor landing ahead of his pursuers. He wasn't sure if both would follow, or if one had standing orders to remain behind and watch the lobby come what may. He wanted both of them, hoped he could neutralize the team before the upstairs action started. But Bolan was a realist. He'd take what he could get. Below him, the two pursuers entered the stairwell. Bolan held the sound-suppressed Beretta steady in a two-handed grip, sighting down the slide toward the point where they'd have to appear if they followed him upstairs. The executioner stepped into view, the Beretta seeming impossibly huge from below with the suppressor attached, its muzzle yawning at the first man on the stairs. Bolan didn't give the gunner time to think about it. The soldier drilled the shooter's forehead above the left eyebrow, spraying his partner with gore. The dead man tumbled backward, colliding with the other. He nearly took him down before the second gunman sidestepped and shoved him away. Number two was quick, but not quick enough. He raised his handgun on the rebound, seeking targets with the one eye that wasn't smeared with blood. He sent the second shooter tumbling downstairs after his companion, landing in a heap, the two of them resembling someone's cast-off laundry. Bolin waited for a few more seconds, making sure no one else from the lobby was trailing the others before he resumed jogging upward, taking the steps two and three at a time. By the time he reached the fifth floor, Bolin's thigh and calf muscles were burning, but he held the pace until he reached the seventh landing, slowing on his last approach to eight. Rebecca Mindel had him covered as he started up the last flight, lowering her pistol when she recognized him. Bolin covered the distance between them, glancing upward at the last two flights before they reached the ninth and final floor. Did they follow you? They tried. 
We're clear then. For the moment. If the gang upstairs phones down, it could get hot. We shouldn't keep them waiting. Right. Shoulder to shoulder, they mounted the stairs, moving with special care as they approached the door emblazoned with the yellow number nine. Mindel glanced at her watch, frowning. Another 40 seconds. Time enough. Bolin reached for the doorknob with his left hand. Oh, mm. that's right. Mm. Like that. Mm. Oh, oh, oh mm. right there. The hooker had her face in Jared Wagner's lap, doing her very best to please him for the second time since she'd arrived at the apartment. He appreciated zeal from his subordinates and didn't bother to persuade himself that she felt anything for him beyond an urge to make him happy and ensure repeat business. Oh, oh, so far, so good. It was the third time Wagner had employed this particular girl, a Eurasian in her late teens, provided by a service exclusive and expensive enough to provide attractive companions with minimal risk of disease. Wagner called her Lila, because the name appealed to him, and he couldn't wrap his Yankee tongue around the jawbreaker name she was born with. What was that? Gunfire! At first, he thought one of the stupid bodyguards was watching Schwarzenegger on DVD again, cranking up the volume. But then he heard his people scrambling for the door, grabbing their weapons on the way. Oh, shit! <gasps> Lila recoiled as Wagner vaulted upright on the mattress, groping for the bedside lamp. He was about to flick it on, then reconsidered, understanding that the light would only make him a better target. Instead of switching on the lamp, Wagner reached past it, dragging open the top drawer of his nightstand and reaching inside for the small pistol he kept there. He had never fired a shot in anger and never expected to do so, but in these troubled times it didn't hurt to keep a little hardware handy just in case. Lila saw the gun. What are you going to do with that? Will you shut up? Lila pulled the satin sheets around herself as if for modesty, though Wagner would have guessed she didn't have a bashful bone in her curvaceous body. If she thought black satin would repel a bullet, she was dumber than he'd thought. Wagner was rolling out of bed and reaching for his clothes when Eric Dempsey barged into the bedroom, brandishing a submachine gun. Dempsey was in charge of Wagner's bodyguards, the one man most responsible for seeing that he stayed alive in situations just like this. I need you on the floor, sir, right now. He didn't spare a glance or second thought for Lila, huddled on the bed. No one was paying Dempsey to protect a teenage hooker, and he plainly didn't care what happened to her one way or another. That was fine with Wagner, who would miss her for about five minutes if she stopped a bullet, knowing that he could replace her with a phone call any time he felt the need. Assuming he was still alive to place the call, that was. Who is it, Eric? Damned if I know. We've got two, three shooters in the hallway. They got past the boys downstairs, and we've got two men down outside so far. For Christ's sake, get me out of here! We're cut off from both the elevator and the stairs. Unless we get some reinforcements in behind them, we've got nowhere left to run. Do something, goddammit! Dempsey turned on him, leveling the submachine gun. I intend to. The shooting started as Blansky opened the stairwell's door. He then dropped into a crouch and lunged through the doorway, Beretta in hand. Mindel went with her Steyer AUG. All bets were off now, with weapons blasting in the ninth floor hallway, and she saw no further need for stealth. The rifle offered superior firepower, penetration, and stopping power, everything she needed for room-to-room -room fighting against a superior force. But as she followed Blansky through the doorway, smelling cordite in the air, Mindel saw the opposing force had been reduced by two within a few short seconds. McCarter was advancing from the west end of the passage, the direction of the service elevator, tracking with his AUG and watching out for targets on his way. Two men she'd never seen before lay dead or dying in his wake, and slamming doors along the hallway told her more had gone to ground. How many more were there? She wouldn't know until they'd rooted out all the gunners and disposed of them, and how long would that take? More time than they possessed, perhaps, unless McCarter and Blansky had some shortcut in mind for finding and extracting Jared Wagner. Even as the thought took form, a gunman craned out of a doorway on McCarter's right. He missed twice. As the shooter retreated, the Britons stitched a line of tidy holes across the wall that hid him. 5.56 millimeter bullets, drilling fiberboard and plaster as if they were paper. Blansky was firing too, his 9 millimeter rounds drilling the door some 10 or 15 feet downrange. Too late in closing it, one of the opposition fell against the inside of the door, his prostrate body blocking it, one lifeless arm protruding from the gap. Mindel knew there were four apartments on that floor, all rented to Global Petroleum, reserved for its executives to use while working in or visiting Jakarta. 
At the moment, it appeared that Jared Wagner was the only VIP in residence, although his bodyguards had access to the other flats. She lost the train of thought as a door swung open on her right, the stubby muzzle of an automatic weapon thrust into the hallway. It was following the carter, but the gunman never had a chance to fire. Mindel's bullets sliced through the wall and spewed plaster dust on impact. Her barely seen target lurched backward, triggering a short burst as he fell, his bullets peppering the ceiling. They were in the middle of a shooting gallery. It wasn't quite a trap since their arrival hadn't been anticipated and the guards weren't truly on alert, but the crossfire could still prove deadly if they didn't clear the rooms to either side. We find that girl who's screaming. I guess this will find Wagner. Right. Blansky was up and running toward the body jam doorway from which the scream had emanated. Mindel followed close behind him as he hit the door full force and drove it back despite the dead weight blocking it. <laughs> A bullet took a bite out of the door jam near Bolin's face. Bolin returned fire with his Beretta, switching to the Steyr as he cleared the threshold. Mindel was right behind him as a gunman rose behind the nearby sofa, lining up another shot. She fired with Blansky, short but well-placed bursts that spun their human target like a dervish, spattering the wall behind him with a crimson Rorschach pattern. What the fuck? Mindel rushed the door and kicked it barefoot with force enough to snap the simple lock. What are you doing, Eric? Following my orders. The muzzle of Eric Dempsey's weapon didn't waver. It was locked on Jared Wagner's naked chest. Whose orders, damn it? Spell it out. Whose do you think? Wagner was desperate to buy more time. He held his pistol out of Dempsey's view, beneath the tangled sheet, trying to thumb the hammer back without a telltale sound. You don't mean Napier. Who else? But why? Simple. It pissed him off when Holbrook spilled his guts to strangers and he doesn't want an instant replay. I was told to make sure you weren't captured. Get it? I can pay you. Give me a figure. Sure. You want to write a check or put that on your visa card? Try cash. And have the chief put out a contract on me when he hears I muffed a simple job? No thanks. It's checkout time. Dempsey raised the submachine gun. No! <laughs> Lila scrambled out from underneath the satin sheets in all her naked glory. Oh, for Christ fucking sakes. Dempsey swung his piece around and stitched her with a short burst to that perfect chest, driving her back against the wall with a pathetic, stunned expression on her face. Wagner seized the opportunity. His first shot missed Dempsey by at least a foot, the second furrowing his side an inch or so above his belt line. Ah! You bitch! Dempsey swung back toward Wagner and sprayed death around the bedroom. Wagner dove headlong to the floor, his feet tangled in bedding as he fell, landing painfully on his left shoulder. Ah! He clung to the pistol right-handed, firing a wild round to keep Dempsey off balance, even though he couldn't see his target now. Bullets flayed the sheets and mattress, blasting feathers from his pillows as Dempsey returned fire in a rage. The bedroom door burst open. Another automatic weapon joined the chorus, firing two short bursts that silenced Dempsey's gun. Wagner lay where he was, his shoulder throbbing, afraid to stir and thereby give himself away. It didn't matter as a woman whom he'd never seen before stepped into view, sighting down the barrel of a futuristic rifle toward his face. The pistol! Lose it! Wagner did as he was told. The woman came around to kick the weapon out of reach, beneath the bed, and Wagner saw a man behind her, armed with the same kind of weapon. He'd never seen either one of them before, but they hadn't shot him yet, which was a bonus in the circumstances. Who the hell are you? Your ticket out of here, unless you'd rather take your chances with the hired help. Wagner thought about it, picturing the sneer on Dempsey's face, his finger tightening around the trigger, seconds away from turning Wagner's brain into wallpaper. Screw that. Let's hit the road. You'll want to grab some clothes. Oh, right. Wagner staggered to his feet and moved off toward the bedroom closet. Only clothes. And make it fast. Bolin watched the suite while Mindel covered Wagner, making sure that he took nothing from the bedroom closet but sufficient clothes to cover him for their escape. Hurry it up! Relax. I'm cooperating here, all right? You think I'd cover for a man who tried to have me killed? Meaning your boss? Damn right. He told that thug you shot to take me out if things got rough. Nice friends you have. My point exactly. They're obviously not my friends, so you don't have to treat me like an enemy. Convince me later. Right now, put on your shoes and let's get out of here. I'm hurrying! Two shooters came in from the hallway, one checking the suite while his partner hung back at the door, firing an Uzi burst into the hall outside. McCarter's answer cut a zigzag track across the wall and sent the shooter in the doorway reeling for cover. 
Bolin took his best shot from the bedroom, taking down the Uzi bearer with a burst that swept him off his feet and left him draped across a stylish sofa, crimson stains marking the plush upholstery. The shooter's sidekick dropped behind an ornate coffee table, tipping it for cover, but the wood veneer provided no safety. Bolin's 5.56mm round straight the table left to right. Time to move, before we get more company. Right. Wait, wait, wait! Wagner hopped on one foot with a Gucci loafer in his other hand. Wait, my ass! Mindel shoved him toward the bedroom doorway, driving him before her while Bolin scanned the suite beyond. They passed four sentries, two eliminated when they entered, the two latecomers who had fared no better. Pausing at the bullet-punctured door, Bolin took note of deathly silence in the outer hall and hailed McCarter from the foyer. Three to go. We're coming out. Come ahead. The sooner the better. Bolin counted a half-dozen corpses in the hallway, crumpled where they'd fallen under fire. There was no more active opposition at the moment, but he knew that didn't rule out reinforcements from some other quarter, or police arriving to surround the building while they were upstairs. Which way, Blansky? The elevator's faster. Let's take the chance. The service elevator could turn out to be their coffin, Bolin knew, but every second counted now, and hustling their prisoner down 18 flights of stairs was no way to save time. For that matter, a firefight in the stairwell would be no significant improvement on an elevator ambush, especially if they were dueling with police and Bolin was forbidden by his private code from firing back. They hurried to the service elevator, Wagner prodded by Mindel's AUG all the way. An empty hallway yawned before them, mocking their preparedness. They emerged from the elevator. Bolin turned toward the back door and the alley as Mindel and McCarter left the elevator, Wagner sandwiched between them. Hurry up. We're all out of time. Grimaldi had the Camry parked in back of the apartment building, ten feet from the service entrance, sitting at the wheel with a Beretta in his lap. He had the lights off, engine running, all four doors unlocked. Move it, you bastard! Ow! Mindel piled into the back seat, half dragging the hostage behind her. McCarter bringing up the rear and making it a sandwich. Bolin leaped into the shotgun seat. Grimaldi swung left onto a street with one of those tongue-twisting names Grimaldi couldn't pronounce. He flicked on the lights, slowed their pace to something in the neighborhood of legal, and relaxed as flashing lights bore down on them from the direction they were headed. Two, three, four police cars raced toward the scene, more sirens wailing in the distance as the first four cruisers passed him by. Grimaldi turned right at the next light, drove two blocks, then turned left to resume his former course. They merged flawlessly with traffic, Grimaldi minding his speed, going with the flow. Is this the guy? One of them anyway. Where are we taking him? Some place with privacy. Hey, people, I already told you I'm cooperating. Nobody screws Jared Wagner twice. You'll want to save your breath. Not a problem, Chief. We're all friends here, right? Not even close. I'm thinking waterfront, something in a nice dark warehouse. Fine by me. No argument from this kid. Anything you want, it's cool. In fact... Shut up! Hey, I'm just saying. Ow! Damn, lady! Grimaldi frowned. He didn't trust any prisoner who came on too friendly. Bolin's team may have saved the man's life, but any sudden change of heart, much less from one so highly placed among the opposition, smelled to him like rotten fish. Grimaldi took them north, away from downtown, toward the waterfront. Jakarta was western Java's largest port, no shortage of docks and warehouses to choose from. The trick would be finding some place where crew didn't work around the clock, sufficient privacy and darkness to let Bolin and McCarter work their prisoner. With any luck, they wouldn't have to squeeze him much. The warehouse had that long-abandoned look that featured dust, cobwebs, and wind-blown trash collected at the base of walls outside, with rust and mildew taking over the interior. It was the kind of place that Jared Wagner might have purchased for a low bid in his early days with Global Petroleum, when he was still a field representative, before he moved upstairs to the executive suites. Tonight, it was the kind of place where Wagner might die and not be found for days or weeks while rats gnawed on his bones. That prospect made him queasy, nearly turned his legs to rubber, but he swallowed the panic and tried to focus on something constructive. The trick to surviving a hostile takeover in business was to refrain from any obvious resistance and to make himself seem indispensable. The first part had been easily accomplished by Wagner's surrender in his apartment. 
although admittedly the fact that he'd had two machine guns pointed at his face might make him seem like less than an enthusiastic convert. As far as indispensability went, his captors plainly wanted something or they would have killed him in his bedroom. All he had to do was work out what they wanted and do everything within his power to supply it, while suggesting, subtly, mind you, that nobody else on earth could provide the same quality service at any price. When he was seated on a dusty folding chair, hands cuffed behind his back, Wagner took another stab at conversation. We could save some time if you'd explain exactly what you want and let me help you. You're a uh, helpful sort, are you? It's like I told you in the car. When Global's goon squad tries to take me out, that severs any ties between the company and me. You want to burn them for whatever reason, I'll chip in for matches. Just like that. Hell yes! How many chances should I give them? Dempsey was about to blow my friggin' brains out when your girlfriend stopped him. What I want is to keep breathing. That's job one. So ask me anything. I'll answer if I can and point you in the right direction if you're chasing information I don't have. This Dempsey didn't work for you? He worked for Global, just like me. Of course, I thought he was supposed to be my bodyguard. Nobody mentioned that his goons were set to clip me at the first sign of trouble. And that order came from Arnold Napier? So I was told. Always the last to know. Why would Napier want you dead? My predecessor bought the farm last week. I'm guessing you may know more about it than I do. Am I right? Never mind. Before he shuffled off this mortal coil, I'm told he passed along some information that the company held near and dear. Dempsey and friends were an insurance policy assigned to make sure I didn't repeat that mistake. But now you want to talk. Why not? They condemned me without giving me a chance to prove myself. If I'm paying for the sin regardless, I may as well commit it, right? Out with it then. What is it that you want to know exactly? Bottom line, what saves my life? Napier, we want him, and we're tired of playing catch-up. Then you won't be pleased to hear you've missed him by about nine hours. Right now, my guess would be that he's cruising over the eastern Mediterranean, sipping a cold glass of champagne. And where is he off to? A little vacation with two of his partners. You know about them, I suppose. I'm betting you had something to do with the big noise in Macau. Is Lindmark with him? Should be, unless they had a spat and Mr. Napier put him out to walk at 20,000 feet. They're going to see Andrastus. Bingo! Seems like you folks don't really need me after all. If you could ditch the cuffs and drop me at the airport, I'll be out of here before you can say American Express. Not so fast. We still need to know where they're meeting, and I mean exactly where. Didn't I mention that? It must have slipped your mind. <sighs> Sorry. Andrastus has a private island. You're astounded, right? Greek billionaire, an island hideaway, who'd ever think of that? Location. I'll need coordinates. Can't help you there. I I'm not among his thousand closest friends, so I don't rate an invitation. I can tell you that it's Greek, which ought to narrow down the field, and that he calls it Tira. T-H-Y-R-A. We'll need to check this out. And when it checks out, which it will, because I'm telling you God's honest truth, we're cool, right? I mean, right? We'll need to talk this over. Right. Don't wander off, all right? Why don't I wait for you right here? They huddled in a corner of the warehouse, out of earshot from their hostage tethered to his chair. I wouldn't trust this character as far as I can throw him. Give me an option. We have to check it out. Someone in Washington should have the lowdown on Andrastus and this island. I'll make the call. I'll need to make a call as well. Greece puts us back within the region where my people may wish to be kept informed. They're still your people, then? I thought they cut you loose for playing with the bear boys. I suppose we'll see. Do keep us posted, will you, love? Inquiring minds and all that rot. Let's see it checks. We've still got Wagner on our hands. I can't see giving him a pass. No way. No. I hate to ice him if he's played it straight. He's a part of it. The same as Napier and the rest. Late in the game, though. If he just replaced Holbrook last week. He knows too much to be a novice. What if we could find another way to take him out of circulation? Such as? I'm working on it. No free walk. Not an option. I'll abstain then for now. Same here. All right. I'll find out if his story hangs together. We can go from there. Nods around the circle sent him off to find the warehouse loading dock where he could use the satellite uplink without a metal roof to interfere with any signals. Mendel would be reaching out to Tel Aviv at the same time, he guessed, albeit with some trepidation on her part. Bolin found the open air he wanted, propping the warehouse door open behind him. He palmed his cell phone, pressed a button to enable the scrambler, and tapped out a long string of digits. He heard another phone ring in Washington, halfway around the world. Hello? It's me. What's the word? 
Bolin ran it down in brief, naming Wagner and summarizing his comments, requesting the Big Fed's suggestions for non-lethal disposition if his story checked, with coordinates for the supposed Greek island of Tira. I never heard of it, but if there's such a place, they'll have it filed and indexed at the farm. And Wagner? That's no problem. We can always take him off your hands. What did you have in mind? He needs to do some time. That means a statement and a plea. You think he'll go for it? He's had a look at the alternative. Your call, then. If he tries to weasel out... I'll handle it myself. Suits me. I'll reach out to the embassy and put the wheels in motion. Can you give me half an hour on this other thing? No problem. Right, then. Let me call the bear, and I'll have something for you when you call me back in 30 minutes. That's affirmative. Aaron the Bear Kurtzman was the top man with computers and intelligence collection on the team at Stonyman Farm. If Tira existed, he would be able to track it down and report the coordinates to Brignola in Washington, D.C. From there, it would be Boland's task to find the place and deal with any adversaries seeking shelter there. He checked his watch and grimaced. Half an hour wasn't long, but waiting stretched it thin and made the time slow to a crawl. Bolin considered going back inside to tell the others what was happening, then shrugged off the notion. Calling upon his hunter's patience, he sat on a discarded crate and waited for the time to pass. There was no question of a landline this time, but Mindel called Tel Aviv anyway, half expecting to be disconnected when she asked for Gideon Herzhaft. Instead, after a wait lasting no longer than the average four-course meal, she heard him. Rebecca, should I ask where you're calling from? You'll be more interested in where I go from here. Will I? I guarantee it. I suppose you'd better tell me, then. We're on our way to Greece. So it's the shipper, then? They had to talk around the subject, since her cell phone had no built-in scrambler. Yes. That's in our backyard. It's why I'm calling you, to let you know. That's very thoughtful. Can you tell me where you'll be, exactly? No, not yet. As soon as possible? Of course. Perhaps, since you'll be nearly home, you'll reconsider the arrangements that you've made. She blinked at that. Oblique or otherwise, there was only one possible interpretation to Hertoft's remark. He was asking her to desert Blansky and McCarter, to give them up, in effect, and cast her lot entirely with Mossad once more. That would be premature, in my opinion. I'm sure you know what's best, Rebecca. But delaying the decision could be hazardous. You'll recall that I was ordered to resolve this matter on my own. In China, not in Greece. It's all the same to me. You're making a mistake. I'll live with that. Will you? I'm going now. I'll call back if I need your help. Don't wait too long. The offer isn't good indefinitely. Instead of replying, she broke the connection, embarrassed to find that her hands were trembling. She had defied Herzhoft and the Mossad, perhaps for the last time. If he was in a spiteful mood, Herzhoft was capable of making life difficult for Mindel and her companions, staking out the major airports in Greece and shadowing them to their final destination. What would he do after that? Was a covert strike force on tap to swoop down and eliminate Israel's enemies, as in the past? Or would Herzhoft let Rebecca take the risks again, as he had throughout the rest of the mission so far? She didn't know the answer to those questions, and it troubled her. Despite the treatment she'd received from her superiors since Uncle Yakov's disappearance and subsequent death, Mindel still felt as if she owed a debt of loyalty to Mossad. Her patience wasn't infinite, however, and she had grown weary of the attitude displayed by Herzhoft and his masters, pleased to use Mindel and her companions until they were slaughtered, only then willing to risk a more substantive involvement. Folding the little telephone, she returned it to her pocket, shifting the Steyr AUG on its shoulder strap. How, she wondered, would Washington wish to deal with a scheming traitor like Jared Wagner? Granted, he was a mere upstart compared to Napier, Andrastus, and Lynn Mock, but his designs on Israel had been equally destructive. By Mendel's reasoning, he earned no special dispensation simply for arriving late at the scene of the crime. If Blansky's chief in the United States decided to release Wagner, she'd find a way to stop it, to stop him. That much Rebecca Mendel promised to herself. There would be no free pass for anyone who plotted genocide against her people and her homeland. Never again. It was the motto that commandos fighting for the wrath of God had carried into battle when they hunted Nazi fugitives and later Arab terrorists responsible for atrocities like the Lod Airport Massacre and the Munich Olympics slaughter. 
Some in Israel and abroad suggested that the time for nonviolence had arrived and that forgiveness should become the order of the day. Mindel had very nearly joined their ranks, and not so long ago. But that had been before her uncle was assassinated, before she learned that a cabal of wealthy men plotted the destruction of her homeland for personal profit. Mindel could no more turn her back on that knowledge than she could forsake her own flesh and blood in time of need. Israel was her birthplace, her home. For better or worse, her destiny was intertwined with that of the tiny beleaguered nation where she had first drawn breath. Her uncle had known that feeling. He had died because of it, defending his homeland. Mindel, in turn, could do no less. Ragnola. It's me. I have news of your subjects beyond what you asked for. Go ahead. We owe this to our friends in the UK. They've been sitting on a Ukrainian arms dealer, operating out of London and Paris for the past six months or so. Sometime last night, they got a flash that he was taking orders for a suitcase nuke, the dirty kind, with delivery scheduled for this afternoon in Bratislava. Long story short, they teamed up with Austrian authorities and bagged it coming across the border at 5 o'clock a.m. with three arrests. The delivery boys aren't talking, but their bill of lading for machine parts shows delivery scheduled to a paper front for global petroleum. Napier. That's the consensus. From Austria, they could have trucked it down through Italy and ferried it across to Syria or Lebanon, maybe right into Tel Aviv if they were feeling nervy. Take out the capital and overrun the rest while everybody's still in shock. It's your basic 21st century nightmare. And Israel's probably the most vulnerable target on Earth in terms of size and location. Is Tel Aviv aware? London's been burning up the lines. They knew before we did, or I'd have tried to tip you earlier. Call it a setback for the global team. We should move on them before they have a chance to activate a backup plan. In which case, you'll be wanting those coordinates for Tira. I'm all ears. It's north of Crete and northwest of Carpathos. Brignola read the map coordinates he'd written on a scratch pad, dictated by Aaron Kurtzman from the data room at Stony Man. Bolin repeated the numbers from memory. One pass, all he needed to lock them in tight. Any background or sit rep? A bit. Andrastus bought the island nine years ago from another shipping tycoon he drove under. He's done some construction since then, described to the Greek tax collectors as residential improvements, but no one's bothered to inspect the place, as far as we can tell. Andrastus has enough friends in the government that no one tries to twist his arm for details. It's his home away from home, and paparazzi are discouraged. Over the years, Greek authorities have filed missing persons reports on three tabloid types, who went looking for stories on Terra without invitations. Officially, they were all lost at sea. And unofficially? No one seems to care. For all we know, there could be others, but they didn't make a splash. Call it a hard sight, then. Sounds like it. We get nothing on defenses, though. You'd be going in blind. We may not have a choice. Just so you know, Andrastus prefers retired Special Forces personnel for his security team. He uses everything from Navy SEALs to Spetsnaz on the team. At last count, he had 200 employees authorized to carry firearms in Greece and abroad. That's some security. I doubt they're all on Tira, but since we can't pin any of them down, you ought to be prepared. I'll keep it in mind. Any chance of an eye in the sky? I'll see what I can do. Okay. What's the word on our guest? If you've got a mind to, you can drop him at the embassy in downtown Jakarta. They'll have papers waiting for him in the nature of a plea bargain. Should he refuse the deal for any reason, they've agreed to sit on him for 48 hours, lose his passport and file or whatever. But after that, they'll have to let him go. The way it stands right now, there's no case against him if he decides not to play ball. I'll make him an offer. We need a connection for hardware and transport in Athens. Someone reliable who won't mind losing a boat if this thing falls apart. Call me psychic. I already made some calls. You have a pencil handy? Hit me. First, the hardware. Try a pawnbroker named Anatole Spinias. If he doesn't stock the tools you need, Ferris Milanus should be able to accommodate you. And transportation? Cletus Panopoulos. He runs a dealership, Callistos, out of the marina, with a sideline doing contract work for Langley. I'm advised his product won't come cheap, but he'll forget about police reports in the event of loss or damage. Fair enough. You sure this is the way you want to go? I don't see any other way, do you? Guess not. 
If I can help in any way... I'll let you know. Okay, then. Watch your back. I always do. McCarter had grown tired of watching Jared Wagner squirm and fidget in his chair. Granted, the handcuffs were uncomfortable, but the leader of Phoenix Force felt no sympathy for the man who was willing to sell out his country and participate in genocide to fatten his own stock portfolio. He supposed Wagner hadn't been involved in Katz's death per se, but McCarter was willing to snuff him on general principles to help restore some balance in the deadly game they played. Mindel had worn a sour face when she returned from talking to her boss, not offering to share whatever might be preying on her mind. McCarter let it go and waited thirty minutes more for Boland to return. We're set. I've got coordinates for Tira that should let us plot it on a map, in case it's not on any we can find in Athens. Also, sources for equipment and a boat to get us there. I guess we can't fly in? Fly, yes. Land, no. We take for granted that the place is fortified and staffed with shooters who know what they're doing. How many? That's unknown. Andrastus has a couple of hundred professionals on his payroll, but I'd be surprised to find more than half of them hanging around on the island. Only half? That's encouraging. The good news is we ought to find all three of our primary targets waiting for us when we get there. If we get there, don't you mean? Call it the power of positive thinking. My people want help. They're interested, but not enough to get involved. It's just as well. They'd want to run the show if they pitched in. Too many cooks. We could use the reinforcements, though. I'm thinking we could go another way. As long as the target area is restricted to hostile personnel, why not just hit them from the air and take the whole place down that way? It's quicker than a boat ride, and you don't risk losing anybody on the beach. We need target confirmation. There's no way to get that from the air. Too bad. We're off to Athens, then? ASAP. So, what about our friend? He has a choice to make. The executioner moved to stand before their captive. Wagner risked a smile, trying to keep up his facade of optimism in the face of danger. Are we all set now? I wouldn't mind a change of scene. Be careful what you wish for, mate. I've talked to Washington. There's an offer on the table, but you don't have lots of time to think about it. Spell it out. We drop you at the U.S. Embassy. They're waiting for you as we speak. You make a full and detailed statement. Names and pertinent specifics, A to Z. They'll look at your cooperation when it comes to sentencing, but you'll do time. That's not the sweetest deal I ever heard. It could be when you think of the alternatives. Which are? We settle it right here, right now. I see your point. This kind of bargain might be shaking on appeal, though. Have you thought of that? First thing. And you could be right. The thing you have to ask yourself is, do you really want to hit the streets again too soon? That would be bad because... For one thing, Napier and his pals may think you sold them out. And if we miss a few, hell, even one, they're bound to nurse a grudge. Then, there's the disappointment factor. Care to spell that out? The four of us would all be deeply disappointed if you tried to weasel out of your arrangement with the state. The chances are we'd feel obliged to look you up and register our disappointment personally. I get your drift. So, it's your call. Wagner sat up a little straighter in his chair and flashed a brittle smile. Let's go. I wouldn't want to keep them waiting at the embassy. Bolin left Jared Wagner at the U.S. Embassy gates in care of two well-armed Marines. Now Grimaldi had the wheel, McCarter rode shotgun, and Bolin and Mindel occupied the back seat. I still think this bit has snafu written all over it. Five minutes talking legalese across a shiny desk and friend Jared will have a lawyer rushing over to complain about the violation of his civil liberties. Could be. And that doesn't bother you? I told him what would happen if he blew the deal. Suppose he thinks you're bluffing. Then he'd be dead wrong. McCarter could have mentioned that locating Jared Wagner might be hopeless when he had the whole wide world to hide in, but he let it go. So what about this island, anyway? We've got no intel to speak of, but I'm hoping for some details when we're closer to the target. Our transport connection should know something about islands in the region, if he's working with the company. Location's only half of it. I'd feel much better if I knew how many shooters we'd be meeting when we go ashore. Hal's trying to arrange an overflight, but it may not be feasible. Anyway, with modern construction, you can't count slit trenches or privies and try to extrapolate troop strength. It's better than nothing. Let's hope he can pull it off, then. I still say that an airstrike's the clean way to go. Bolin had considered the pilot's proposal, but he'd already experienced too many near misses with Arnold Napier and Lynn Mock. 
Even if they raised the island and sank it beneath the Mediterranean's whitecaps, he'd never be sure of a clean sweep unless he saw the targets for himself, unless he saw them dead. He owed that much to Katz, at least, the certainty that he'd not only been avenged, but that his killers hadn't wriggled through the net to fight again another day. We'll hold that in reserve, just in case. Even if they managed to obtain a headcount on the Fortress Island's personnel, there would be questions that no aerial photography could answer. Were fences electrified or not? Had the beaches and footpaths been mined or otherwise booby-trapped? Were security cameras or motion detectors in place on the island? How well were the defenders armed, and were they adept in the use of their weapons? Bolin had a partial answer to the last question, at least. According to Brignola, Christos Andrastos had hired the best security he could get, favoring ex-military personnel from various elite forces. That meant rugged types, proficient with all kinds of military hardware, and skilled in hand-to-hand -hand combat, though some might never have served in actual combat situations. Either way, they would be tough, well-paid, and highly motivated to succeed, which meant they'd also be bad news. How long to get us airborne? Between fuel and flight plans, say an hour and a half with any luck. It could be longer. Right. We need to ditch the hardware first, then head back to the airport. I don't want to stall this any longer than we have to. Napier could be checking in with Wagner any time. If something gets his wind up, he could run again, and we won't have a clue where to start looking for him. Same thing if we'd iced him. It's a gamble either way. Suppose we miss again. We keep trying. I don't know any other way to play the game. They'd traveled halfway around the world and back again, pursuing enemies who slipped away from them like phantoms in the dark of night, and there was still no guarantee the men they hunted would be waiting for them when they reached their destination. Bolin felt as if he'd stepped onto a treadmill that was running of its own volition now, compelling him to match its pace. In which case, there was only one thing left to do. He would pick up the pace and challenge the machine, run it into the ground and see which lasted longer, cogs and gears or flesh and grim determination. And before he reached the end, he meant to have the enemy within his grasp. Tira. There was a sense of homecoming Christos Andrastus felt whenever he returned to Tira's solitude, which he experienced nowhere else on earth. It wasn't his native soil, in fact. His birthplace was a mountain village north of Athens. But the first time he'd set foot on Tira, Andrastus had been captivated by its stark beauty, the isolation that set him apart from the outside world. The island's owner had refused to sell, prompting Andrastus to initiate a cutthroat war of attrition, eventually driving his competitor into bankruptcy, claiming Tira and the loser's fleet of tankers as his prize. The island never failed to soothe him, or, to be precise, it hadn't failed before today. This evening, as he waited to receive his self-invited guests, Andrastus felt a stirring of uneasiness that spoiled the sunset for him, making him regret the day he'd shared the secret of this place with Arnold Napier. But how could he have known their partnership would come to this? The plan had always been risky, of course, but Napier had minimized the danger, while Andrastus had let wishful thinking carry him away. Repent at leisure? Andrastus refused to let the others spoil Tira for him, as they'd ruined everything else. He wasn't sure they could still salvage anything from the original master plan, though Napier feigned confidence and spoke of impending victory. His latest gambit was the most dangerous yet, but at least it had some prospect of succeeding. And if it failed, what then? A clean sweep, Andrastus decided. He would save himself, his empire, at any cost to the others. Napier had virtually ceased consulting him on strategy. Why should he telegraph his moves at this point in the game and thereby jeopardize whatever hope he had of saving something from the ruins? Napier and Lynn Mock had run to him for help, but now Andrastus thought it might be time to help himself. If there were any further troubles, if the latest plan fell through and left them dangling, well, it was a long flight from Jakarta to the Med, and there were often storms at sea. If he declared that some disaster had befallen his two visitors, who was there in the world to contradict him? No one. Andrastus was a man of action, relegated by Napier to an advisory role that ill-suited him. He looked forward to seizing the initiative once more. It was almost enough to make him hope that something would go wrong with Napier's backup plan. That was madness, of course. Smooth sailing was the best kind, always. 
If Napier's latest effort carried their scheme to successful fruition, so much the better. But if it failed, it would be his last effort. Andrastus checked his diamond-studded Rolex watch, confirming that his yacht should be returning soon, with Napier and Lynn Mock on board. A phone call from the airport had confirmed their arrival in Athens. Customs would have slowed them a little, but there were seldom any untoward delays for the filthy rich. Another half hour or so, and the yacht should be visible, steaming toward Tira on a southwesterly course. Andrastus hoped that Napier would come bearing good news for a change. He was fed up with the incessant litany of disaster that had become routine of late. What good was wealth and power if a mogul couldn't shape events to suit himself and make his own life easier? He heard his houseman coming. He waited, facing westward through a giant picture window toward the fading sunset, darkness settling in the corners of the room around him. He would have to turn the lights on soon, to hold the night at bay. Excuse me, sir. What is it, Nico? The radio, sir. Twenty minutes to arrival. Thank you. Yes, sir. Andrastus slipped a lightweight jacket on, considered taking a pistol along, then decided against it. Two bodyguards were waiting for him on the patio as he left the house, falling in step behind him as Andrastus led the way to the pier. It was a minor show of force, but he wanted Napier and Lynn Mock to know who ruled Tira from the moment they set foot ashore. If there was any doubt in their minds, any sneaking suspicion that they called the shots on this island, Andrastus would swiftly disabuse them of such notions. And he would especially enjoy the look on Napier's face when he saw the strapping young men with their weapons on display. It was two hundred yards from the house to the pier, but Andrastus enjoyed the excursion. He felt better already, now that his mind was made up. Step into my parlor, said the spider to the fly. Napier could see Andrastus waiting on the pier while they were still a quarter mile from shore. The pier was lit by floodlights in anticipation of the Aristotle's landing, making human figures clearly visible despite the hour and descent of darkness on the med. Behind the Greek, two flankers stood at ease, light glinting from the polished barrels of their automatic weapons. He couldn't blame Andrastus for being prepared. But Napier wished there had been a way for him to bring along more than the slim quartet of bodyguards that had accompanied him from Jakarta. Here they'd be outnumbered and outgunned if anything went wrong, and given the course of recent events, what were the odds of something going right? Stow that, he warned himself. Negative thinking was a trap, self-perpetuating, that could undermine any man's best efforts. He'd suffered a run of bad luck, it was true. They all had, in fact. But luck came in cycles, and Napier's was past due for a change. As soon as he had confirmation that the nuke was on its way from Austria to Israel, stashed in one of Global's tankers, putting in at Tel Aviv for some emergency repair work, Napier could relax. They'd all be winners when the smoke cleared, laughing all the way to the bank. And in the meantime, it couldn't hurt to have a few extra shooters on standby, just in case. Lynn Mock joined him on deck as the yacht slowed, finally stopping dead in the water. They were still some distance offshore, but the great yacht could go no farther without danger of running aground. They would transfer to a motor launch for the run to the pier, one last dash across open water before Napier set foot on dry land again. It was a smooth transition, Napier enjoying the smaller boat's speed, though Lynn Mock was clearly on the verge of being seasick. Napier tried to ignore him, concentrating on the pier and their welcoming committee. Up close, he could see that Andrastus had chosen his bodyguards well. Aside from the fact that one was Teutonic in appearance, the other inky black, they could have been bookends. Both men were sculpted from the same hard stock, grim faces under close-cropped hair, athletic bodies straining at their clothes as if intent on shedding them for combat. Both regarded Napier as if he were nothing but a target in their sights. Disembarking from the launch was more difficult than boarding or leaving the yacht. It rode the swells lightly, trying to shift out from under his feet as Napier rose, moving toward the starboard gunnel. One of the shooters stepped forward, offering a hand, and Napier noted that it was his left, leaving the gun hand free for action if the need arose. Professionals. The oil man didn't know if he should feel relieved or ill at ease. He settled for a pose of studied relaxation, hoping that his men would pick up and follow his example. Andrastus, beaming, moved to greet them, momentarily outnumbered by Napier's retinue. It didn't seem to faze him as he shook Napier's hand, then Lynn Mox. 
What word of the delivery? Are we on track? I'll need to make a call to check. I didn't want to use the radio. Oh, of course, by all means. Come with me, my friends. I have secure lines in the house. Napier trailed Andrastus back along the pier. He glimpsed the stylish bunker that the Greek called home, a box-like shape against the fading gray of twilight, bleeding into velvet night. A man could disappear on Tira, and no one might ever find him. So could six men, if it came to that. Napier decided he would have to watch his step around Andrastus and make sure he gave his host no cause to take offense. It was a long swim back to Athens, and the sharks that worried Napier most were right there with him on dry land. Lin Mock's room was larger and more luxurious than the hotel suite he had lately vacated in Jakarta, but the trappings of wealth failed to put his troubled mind at ease. He worried that it might already be too late to salvage his position with the Chinese government, imagining the glee of his rivals when he couldn't be found to explain bloodshed at his residence in Macau. Mock wondered if a formal warrant had yet been issued for his arrest. There were subtler ways to achieve the same end, but he knew several high-ranking party members who would revel in his humiliation and do anything within their power to bring him down. Mock had given them the perfect opportunity this time, and the hell of it was that he couldn't even call home to check his own status, since the inevitable order to return, and his inability to obey it, would only make his situation that much worse. Mock wished the scene at home had been his only worry. If that were the case, he could simply fall back on one of his three alternative identities and disappear, set for a modestly luxurious life in hiding with the money he'd already banked from Global Petroleum. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case. This night, Mock thought he had as much to fear from his own allies as from rivals or police in the People's Republic of China. In fact, he had begun to question whether he would ever leave Andrastus' island alive. Mock tried to tell himself that he was simply being paranoid, but a part of his mind refused to accept that bromide. He knew that Napier's gunmen were capable of sudden, unpredictable violence, but they weren't his only concern at the moment. He had noted Napier's shifting glances as they came ashore, watching the riflemen who flanked Andrastus and the others stationed all around the house, inside and out. And for the first time in their criminal association, he considered that the Greek might pose a greater threat than Napier in the present circumstances. The Greek had several times voiced his reserve about certain moves Napier made, suggesting that the oil man's strategy was too risky, a potential danger to them all. He'd never pressed the point, but now that their plans were disrupted, Napier and Lynn Mock in flight for their lives, Mock wondered if Andrastus might decide to cut his losses and dispose of them. Where better to make his move after all than on the fortress island he owned and controlled? safe from the prying eyes of journalists and the police. Who was there in the outside world to testify that Mock or Napier had ever set foot on Tira in the first place? They could vanish, weighted bodies dumped into the Mediterranean, and their passing would remain a mystery for all time. Mock poured himself a glass of whiskey from the wet bar that stood against one wall of his suite and drained the strong liquor in two deep swallows. His eyes blurred for a moment, brimming with startled tears before the whiskey lit a reassuring fire inside him, calming his razor-taut nerves. But not entirely. The Chinese communist could drink himself into a stupor, and the same doubts would remain when he woke. If he awoke. He simply didn't trust his partners, as he had when they began their venture, and he guessed that trust was gone forever. Napier's strange incompetence in dealing with their nameless enemies the past two weeks brought grim, unwelcome thoughts of treachery to mind, and Mock was unable to shake them. Like any ranking member of the Chinese Communist Party, Mock knew about betrayal firsthand. Treachery was second nature in Beijing, for all the talk of selfless sacrifice. He hadn't reached his present station without walking over those who'd been his friends and comrades, he expected no less from his partners in the present outlaw venture, but that didn't mean he had to take it lying down. Escape from Tira might be difficult, even impossible, but he could still take certain steps to help himself, beginning with the acquisition of a weapon. Doggedly determined now, Lin Mok began to search his rooms, seeking any humble object that might put him on equal footing with the friends whom he increasingly regarded as potential enemies. Athens. Having finally arrived via Jetstar in Athens, Bolan started by treating the city as enemy turf. 
He harbored no grudge against Athens or its people, quite the opposite in fact, but he had to assume that Christos Andrastos was so well established in Greece, so wealthy and influential that he had to know everyone who mattered. A local boy who had made good with billions of discretionary dollars in his bank account could pull most any string he wanted to, in Greece or any other country on the planet. It was just the way things worked, regardless of the setting or the political system involved. So they would have to watch their step in Athens, trusting Brugnola's contacts only to a certain point, forever conscious that Andrastus or his people might be lurking in the shadows, watching and waiting for an enemy to be revealed. To come this far and walk into an ambush would be the last straw. Grimaldi drove the rented car, a Nissan Maxima with Bolin riding shotgun, Mindel and McCarter in the back. They found the address Brignola had given them for Anatole Spanias, driving twice around the block to check for watchers on the street outside the pawn shop. No one seemed to have the place staked out, but Bola knew there could be sentries tucked away in any of the other shops along the street, in upstairs windows, even crouching on rooftops, and he would never spot them from the car. They made two passes. Looks clear to me, but I wouldn't want to guarantee it. Bolin understood his hesitancy, felt the same himself, but if they didn't risk the move, their play was stalled before they even started. Right. Let's try it. Grimaldi made another circuit of the block and found a place to park the Nissan, two doors west of the pawn shop. You want me to come in? Better wait here, in case we need to bail out in a hurry. Okay. Crossing the sidewalk, McCarter and Mindel falling in step behind him, Bolin remained alert for any pedestrians who showed a bit too much interest in his party, any passing motorists who stared too long or lifted a microphone to their lips. A white-haired man of sixty-something years came to meet them from the rear of the shop. He was all smiles behind a mustache and eyebrows so thick they looked fake, like theatrical appliances for the title character in The Wizard of Oz. The pawnbroker sized them up at a glance and greeted them. Good morning, gentlemen and lady. How may I be serving you? Mr. Spinius? That is me. You are American, I see. I was referred to you by friends in Washington. They tell me you're the man to see for uh, special hunting gear. <laughs> I may see your identification, perhaps? Of course. Bolin showed him the Mike Belasco passport, waiting while Spinius looked it over and returned it. When he was satisfied, the pawnbroker led Bolin's party to a storeroom in back, then up a short flight of stairs to the shop's second floor. He produced keys and found the one he wanted on a bulky ring, admitting them to a room that smelled of fresh paint and gun oil. Hmm. A special stock. I have a catalog if you require something larger, but uh, there may be a delay before delivery. Eyeing the racks of small arms and their crated ammunition, Bolin shook his head. This should cover it. Greece has no native weapons industry. Its military forces buy their arms primarily from Germany and the United States, while other weapons find their way across the border via black market channels. The pawnbroker's stock was a mixed bag, therefore. His assault rifles, including M16s, Kalashnikovs, Israeli Galils, and German HKs. Submachine guns ran the gamut from Uzis and MP5s to British Sterlings and a Daiwoo K1A from South Korea. The pistols included Berettas and Glocks in various calibers, Walther P88s, vintage Colt semi-autos, and the freak of the lot, a Russian four-barreled SPP-1 designed to fire darts underwater. Bolin bypassed the exotic models, consulting briefly with Mindel and McCarter before they made their selections. They chose four AKSU assault rifles, shortened versions of the Russian AK-74, backed up with silencer-equipped Beretta sidearms. Ammunition and spare magazines filled out the order, along with a mixed bag of fragmentation and incendiary grenades. Duffel bags held the lot, and Bolin slipped one of the Berettas under his windbreaker before they left the shop. Whatever happened next, at least they would be able to defend themselves. And with a little luck, they might survive the night. Tira. The conversation with his contact in Vienna left Arnold Napier with a headache throbbing in the space behind his eyes. He felt an urge to scream and punch the walls, but such displays would do more harm than good. Napier steeled himself against the inevitable reaction, knowing that he couldn't keep the latest news from Andrastus or Lynn Mock. They were bound to find out sooner or later, and if he delivered the tidings himself, at least he had a long-shot chance at spin control. He found them in the game room, 
sipping single malt whiskey and idling over a game of billiards. Lin Mok played poorly, distracted and unfocused, but Andrastus didn't seem to mind. Both men looked up from the table as Napier entered, Andrastus raising his glass in a mock salute. What word then of plan B? Napier crossed to the wet bar and poured himself a double whiskey. <sighs> the shipment was seized in Austria. Andrastus blinked at him, his face going blank. He didn't seem to understand the message. Seized? Uh, what do you mean? Seized by whom? The police, I assume. Maybe the military, I'm not sure. The point is, it's gone. Gone? What do you mean, it's gone? I told you! The shipment was intercepted on the border crossing into Austria. It's been confiscated. If you're asking where they take a contraband nuclear weapon, I haven't the faintest fucking idea, all right? Are we clear? Can they trace it? Given time, I assume so. They've taken the transport crew into custody. Ukrainians, they'll be. God knows if they'll talk or how much they know about the supplier. They'll talk eventually. Everyone does. The bill of lading leads back to a paper front, but breaking it down is only a matter of time and manpower. It's bad. Let's say that for a start. That strikes me as an understatement. Would disastrous not be a better choice of words? Uh, perhaps catastrophic? Now, there's no need to overreact. Overreact? Perhaps you think we ought to celebrate. I didn't say that we... What are you saying, Arnold? More importantly, what are you doing to salvage the situation? I've just found out about the problem, but since you ask, I've taken steps to dismantle the receiving office in Bratislava. The authorities will find nothing of consequence if and when they go looking. Nothing of consequence, Arnold. They have the weapon, for God's sake. Well, better that than us, don't you think? But there's another problem, too, I'm afraid. Andrastus dropped his cue under the billiard table, staring at Napier in frank disbelief. What now? I called Jakarta with a heads up on what's happened, and it seems my number two went missing last night. There's been trouble at the company apartments. Several members of the security team were killed. So they followed you from Macau to Jakarta, and why not from there to my doorstep? The two of you will lead these bastards to me yet. It pleased him to see Andrastas taken aback by the smile on his face. <laughs> Let's hope so. Are you mad? On the contrary, I'm thinking more clearly than ever. You have faith in your soldiers, I take it? Of course. Then relax and hope for the best, Christus. If the bastard somehow managed to trail us, we can finish it once and for all. Athens. Cletus Panopoulos looked out of his office window. He knew trouble when he saw it, and the four strangers approaching him along the dock had danger written all over them. It was nothing obvious. Indeed, he supposed most who saw them would take the quartet for simple tourists, but Panopoulos knew better. Their faces were hard behind sunglasses and casual smiles, the woman a part of the group, no more softness about her than the men. They were killers, Panopoulos decided, but he didn't think they'd come to murder him. Rather, he guessed they were about to put good money in his pocket. The Greek watched one of his salesmen greet the foursome, then turn and point toward the office, a small frown of disappointment on his face. No one liked losing a commission, but these four had asked for the old man himself. Panopoulos could sense such things. He had an eye for trouble and a nose for profit, tempered by an understanding that the two things often went together, hand in hand. He left the office, meeting them outside, near the dock, where the best of his smaller boats were tied. They'd come for transportation, obviously, and he guessed they'd want something average size or slightly smaller, merging speed and comfort with evasive capability. Good evening. Welcome to Callistos. We're looking for a boat that will accommodate the four of us. Something in a small cabin cruiser to take us around for a couple of days. A friend in the States mentioned you. May I ask the friend's name? Mr. Langley. Panopoulos held on to his smile through sheer willpower and years of practice. He'd heard nothing from his American contacts for nearly a year, but he dared not refuse. Money had been offered and accepted, promises exchanged. A man was only as good as his word. Of course. We're uh, old friends. What sort of travel did you have in mind? We're island hopping. Sleeping on board? I doubt it, but it's possible. Sport fishing? Just some cruising. To rent or own? The tall man glanced at his companions, who regarded him silently in return. The woman shrugged. 
We'll only need it for a day or two, but I want to be on the safe side in case we hit a squall and take some damage. Panopoulos knew what that meant. Twice before, he'd had boats returned by friends of Mr. Langley with suspicious damage. One had been pocked with obvious bullet holes, the other scarred along the bow and to port, as if it had rammed some larger craft. Panopoulos had cashed his bonus checks in each case and refrained from asking questions. In that case, perhaps a deposit against the purchase price would be agreeable, refunded in part if you decide against the purchase and return the boat undamaged within, shall we say, three days? Sounds good. What have you got in stock? The perfect choice, I think. He led them to the berth where a four-year-old Beneteau Antares 620 was moored. Twenty feet overall, with a two-foot draft. Ninety horsepower at full throttle over open water. A small galley and head below decks, with sleeping accommodations for three. Her cruising range is 800 kilometers. Panopoulos watched them do the arithmetic silently, each to himself. How much? She rents by the day for 200 U.S. dollars. For a security deposit, refundable on safe return, less rental fees and fuel, shall we say, 20,000 U.S.? For an instant, the dealer thought he'd blown it by asking too much. He cringed inwardly at the thought of having to apologize, bargain himself down, in effect, if they declined the price. He couldn't afford to offend Mr. Langley, after all. Panopoulos was on the verge of speaking, withdrawing the quote, when the tall American produced a fat wad of greenbacks from his pocket and started peeling off hundred-dollar bills. Twenty it is. Panopoulos couldn't help smiling now, cheeks stretched to their limit and beyond. Ho, ho, ho! I hope you will enjoy your cruise, my friends. Greece welcomes you! We'll see. Tira. Christos Andrastus lit a long cigar, his ninth of the day, and waited for the nicotine to do its work, combining with the ouzo he'd consumed to soothe his nerves. All things considered, it was no small task. He could have used a tranquilizer, but he wanted a clear head. There was so much to think about, so many preparations to be made. Napier had failed. That much was clear to him beyond the shadow of a doubt. For all his plans and speeches, all the hollow reassurances, the CEO of Global Petroleum was a beaten man. Not broken yet, he still had money and resources after all. His mind still spewed out strategies, each one more far-fetched than the last. But he was on his way. The morning's announcement of the losses in Jakarta would mean heavy losses on the stock market. If the reports went further and associated Global with some sort of terrorist activity, indictments were sure to follow. Napier would become a fugitive in his own homeland, condemned to roam the world or find a third-rate nation that would shelter him. No, it wouldn't come to that, Andrastus told himself, because he wouldn't let it happen. Pressed too closely, Napier might decide to make a deal with the authorities, sell out his partners for immunity or a reduction of his punishment. As for Lin Mok, who could predict what he might say or do to keep the Chinese execution squads at bay? There was a moral to this story, he decided. For decades, Andrastus had trusted no one but himself, dealing with subordinates and rivals alike from an attitude of natural suspicion, assuming that every man envied his wealth and wished him ill. It was a jaundiced view of life, granted, but it had kept him reasonably safe, and he had prospered. After letting down his guard with Napier and Lynn Mock, though, Andrastus had been swept along by a tide of events beyond his control, reduced to the status of a hanger-on while Napier called the shots. No more. His mind made up, Andrastus had only to speak with his chief of security and the arrangements would be made. Tomorrow after breakfast should be soon enough. He would give Napier one last night to scheme and come up with a plan to save himself, to salvage their design. If no such brainstorm visited the oil man overnight, he would be dead before the stroke of noon, buried at sea with Lin Mock to keep him company. After they were gone, Andrastus would still have some minor house cleaning to do, shredding some documents, eliminating sundry inconvenient witnesses, but that could wait. Without Napier and Mock, nothing of substance linked him to the plan that had gone sour. If and when the Greek authorities were moved to question him, he would acknowledge doing business on occasion with the CEO of Global Petroleum, but he wasn't accountable for Napier's madness or his movements. Who on earth could say Christos Andrastos was responsible for any scheme hatched in America halfway around the world? 
At last, he felt relaxed enough to sleep. Let the others cringe from nightmares, tossing in their beds. They had brought the trouble upon themselves. An innocent man had nothing to fear, as long as his money held out. Boland stood at the boat's starboard rail, beside the wheelhouse, scanning the dark Mediterranean for running lights, watching the sky for aircraft. He and McCarter were concerned about an ambush at sea, but there'd been no reasonable alternative to an amphibious landing on Tira. Dropping in by parachute would have placed them even more at risk, with no ready means of withdrawal, and even the sleepiest sentries would have been roused by a helicopter flying in to drop a strike team on the island. This way, at least, they had a fighting chance. They would approach without lights, the wind in their faces, and kill the engines far enough from shore to keep from tipping their hand. The run to the beach would be grueling, all three paddling like mad in the dark, expecting searchlights and muzzle flashes at any moment. But if their luck held out a little longer, they would have dry land beneath their feet again, and he could go to work. The Med was calm this night, without a cloud to interrupt his view of moon and stars. Out here, away from land, there were no artificial lights to dim the heavenly display. If not for the cruiser's engine, he could have imagined himself a seafarer from ages long past, perhaps viewing this bit of the world before any other living human. Mindel appeared beside him, leaning on the rail, a sea breeze running invisible fingers through her hair. How much longer? A couple of hours, I think. It's too easy. We aren't sure yet. I keep thinking we'll miss them again, miss them forever. I dream of chasing them around the world until we're all in wheelchairs. Don't count on it. You think they'll be there then? I'm not out here to get a tan. I think Uncle Yakov was a lucky man to have such friends. It didn't do him any good, though. Is that what you think? That he'd say you failed him? We're always playing catch-up. If I had a crystal ball, we could cancel the game. It's never done. We don't even see it all. We never will. Philosophy? Just a little. Don't let it get you sidetracked when we hit the beach. I won't. It's all business, then. The inflatable boat was jet black and powered by raw muscle, Bolan and McCarter plying its stubby oars while Mindel covered their approach to the island. Nothing stirred on the shingle of beach they'd selected for landing, but there could still be sentries prowling on the bluff above, watching their approach over gun sights and letting them close the range for an easier kill. Each passing second, each stroke of the paddles brought them closer to the do-or-die moment of contact. Bolan concentrated on the beach and its white curl of surf, trusting Mindel to cover them if someone ashore started shooting. In that event, retreat to the cruiser would be nearly as dangerous as forging ahead. He'd leave that call until the moment it was inescapable, if anything went wrong. But nothing did. They beached the rubber boat and dragged it well clear of the surf, against the sheer face of the bluff, and moored it to a tent peg driven deep. Among them, they were carrying the only gear they had, nothing abandoned at the LZ but the boat itself. Brignola's satellite photos had made the choice for them, revealing not only the beach, but a path from the sand to the crest of the bluff, a steep hike that made them walk hunched forward, muscles burning in their calves and thighs before they made it halfway to the top. It was another point where snipers could have picked them off or pinned them down with virtual impunity, but the defenders missed their chance again. Dumb luck, or were they finally about to catch a break? Bolan, on point, slowed his pace to an aching crawl as he neared the high ground. If there were sentries anywhere within a hundred yards, they stood a decent chance of spotting him as he crested the rise. Even black-clad as he was, hands and face darkened with war paint, he would still be a difficult target to miss at close range. The others hung back as directed, waiting for him to go over the top. When no one greeted him with gunfire, Bolan bellied down and covered the plateau for his companions. In moments, they lay prone beside him, one at either hand. They lay together, charting darkness, listening for any sounds of an approaching enemy. The night wind tickled evergreens along the island's wooded spine, but Bolan didn't reckon it was loud enough to cover the advance of troops. All right, let's go. They'd planned it out while they were still at sea, using Brignola's photos. They would stay together through the woods until they were within 200 yards of the house. From there, they would separate, encircling the residence as best they could to approach it from three sides. Triangulated fire should keep the home team hopping. Bolin hoped it also would make up for any advantage he surrendered by splitting his small force. 
Above all else, he hoped it wouldn't get the others killed. The woods were dark and fragrant, their aroma yielding to a man-made smell as Boland's team drew closer to their destination. The soldier pegged the smell as broiled meat, a draft from the Commodore's kitchen. If Andrastus and his guests had eaten well, they might be slower on their feet than usual, whatever usual might be. He'd half expected floodlights blazing all around the house, but it was nearly dark, the muted light from curtained windows barely leaking through, as if Andrastus had decided too much light would place his visitors at risk. It's time. Any questions now before we separate? Both shook their heads, emphatic negatives. Okay. Five minutes, starting now. He stood and watched them vanish into darkness. Mendel to his left, McCarter to the right. Five minutes wasn't long to wait after they'd come this far. Not long at all. McCarter pushed his limits, moving through the trees as he circled the house counterclockwise. He stayed within the tree line, but kept the sprawling structure in view, watching for guards along the way. He'd expected more in the way of defense, and his relief felt hollow, as if something about the layout was too simple, too good to be true. McCarter reviewed the bare-bones statistics on Tira. The island was shaped like a teardrop, with the broad end and the Greek's exotic villa to the east. It was a mile and change in length from east to west, and some three-quarters of a mile across its widest point north to south. A small army could maneuver within its confines, and Christos Andrastos employed such an army. More stats, all hypothetical this time. Andrastus had about 200 shooters on his payroll, if Brugnola's information was correct. McCarter guessed that some of them would be dispersed to other stations of his empire, taking care of business. How many for Tira, then? He couldn't guess, but only a fraction of the total number would be on duty at any given time, the rest held in reserve for an emergency. But if they did the job the way it should be done, the home team would be taken by surprise, some of them neutralized before they could respond effectively. As for the rest... One of them stood before him suddenly, a shadow with a glint of metal where an automatic rifle had been slung across one shoulder. Frozen in mid-stride, McCarter waited for the sentry to sound an alarm, bring others crashing through the trees. It took three agonizing heartbeats for him to decide that he was looking at the shadow figure's back and that the gunman hadn't noticed him. Not yet. It seemed to take forever, drawing the Beretta from its holster on his hip. It was muzzle-heavy from the fat suppressor, prompting him to brace it in both hands. McCarter had his mark lined up, a clean shot at the back of the gunner's head, when his target surprised him and stepped out of sight behind a tree to his left. McCarter moved forward, closing the gap, one step, then another. He was afraid to blink, eyes locked on the tree where his mark had disappeared. Third step. He felt the twig before he heard it snap, grimacing in anticipation of the sound. Around him, McCarter heard the woods go deathly still. The shooter stepped back into view, and he was facing toward McCarter now. The glint of metal had been transferred from his shoulder to his hands, the rifle angling toward the target he had yet to recognize. McCarter hit him with a double tap before the shooter found his mark. Two classic headshots, putting out the lights. But something fired between dying synapses as he fell, and the auto rifle spat out a three-round burst before it kicked free of his lifeless hands. Shit! There would be no five minutes now. His time was up. He veered off course and cut a path through ferns and low shrubs toward the house. Napier was sipping claret when the burst of gunfire outside sent a tremor through his body, and the wine spilled down his chin, staining his shirt with mock bloodstains. <coughs> Shit! He set the glass down and thrust his trembling hand into a pocket, safely out of sight. Lynn Mock stood frozen at the bar, a bottle tilted toward his waiting glass. Was that gunfire? It wasn't thunder. Napier made a beeline for the door, was reaching for it when a member of the house staff opened it and poked his head into the game room. Where's Christus? If you'll follow me, gentlemen, Mr. Andrastas is waiting. Napier's bodyguards moved in around him. Four to one, he liked the odds so far. I asked you where he is. And I'm prepared to show you, sir, unless you'd rather stand and argue. Frankly, I'm not sure we have much time. Time for what? To keep you alive, sir. Of course, if you'd rather stay here. Lead the way! The houseman retreated. Napier turned to his own men. Watch that bastard. This could be a trick. Mock left the bar and rushed to join Napier as they all left the room, two bodyguards in front of them with two more bringing up the rear. The Asian seemed about to speak, but Napier cut him off, raising a finger to his lips. He strained for any further sounds of gunfire and heard nothing from the night outside. 
Napier was on the verge of hoping it had been a fluke, the product of a nervous trigger finger, when all hell broke loose. It sounded as if half a dozen automatic weapons had begun to fire in unison. The sounds were coming from all around him, not just from the south side of the house, where the initial shots had echoed moments earlier. His bodyguards drew weapons without waiting for the order. They were pros, and knew when it was time to shift from words to action. Napier was encouraged by the hardware in their hands, but he lost the feeling in a hurry when he thought about the odds against them. Andrastas had close to 50 armed men on the island, outnumbering Napier's team by more than 10 to 1. So why were they shooting outside, he asked himself, frowning at the illogic of it. No ruse was required if Andrastas had decided to take them out. Quite the opposite, in fact, since the gunfire put Napier's men on alert, and it would have been easier to lull them with a false sense of security and take them by surprise. Napier was still grappling with that riddle when their escort brought them to a door, knocked twice, and entered without waiting for a summons. Napier urged his shooters through the doorway, following close on their heels. He found Andrastas standing in a room that resembled an arsenal, cradling a semi-automatic shotgun in his arms. Christus, what the hell? We have intruders, I'm afraid. I see your men already. Good. If you need anything before you go, please help yourselves. But quickly, if you will. There may be little time. That's twice I've heard that. I don't know what you got in mind, but I'm I telling you right... I was thinking of survival. You presumably have no objection on that score? You told me we were safe here, Christus. Yes, safe. Andrastas scanned their faces with his clear gray eyes, a thin smile turning up the corners of his mouth. Unfortunately, it seems I was mistaken. The troops were in a hurry, rushing through the forest, chasing sounds of gunfire. It was only natural for them to overlook the woman dressed in black, her face darkened by cosmetics, crouching in the shadows off to one side of the trail. They could have been forgiven for the oversight, but there was no forgiveness in the cards this night. Rebecca Mendel let them pass her by, then shot them from behind. The bursts from her Kalashnikov dropped the runners sprawling on their faces. She moved out, tracking the sounds of combat, wondering if Blansky or McCarter had run afoul of the Greek's private army. More lights were coming on around the house, blazing under the eaves and along flagstone walks through the garden and over the large swimming pool. The glare picked out soldiers in silhouette, sprinting here and there to their duty stations, communicating by hand signals in lieu of spoken words. Mindel admired their efficiency in the abstract, but it wouldn't stop her from killing them if they gave her half a chance. Rapid firing away to her right marked the point where Blansky should have been. He was catching hell from the sound of it, and giving as good as he got. The storm of fire drew several defenders away from their stations, rushing to join in the action, and Mindel took advantage of the gap in their line, working closer to the house. She pushed off from the tree line, jogging across the neatly manicured lawn, cutting glances to left and right as she ran. She was halfway to the patio and pool before anyone seemed to notice. Here! She's over here! It was a lookout posted near a utility shed, some fifty feet beyond the pool. He rose, shouldering his weapon as Mindel dropped into a crouch. Her stubby AKSU had the same range as its parent AK-74, but the much shorter barrel made long-distance accuracy a challenge. Mindel took the extra second to frame her target in the rifle's sights. Oh! She stitched him with half a dozen rounds from close to ninety feet away. The impact pitched him over backwards, smashing into the shed, leaving broad crimson smears on beige paint as the dead man surrendered to gravity, slithering down to the turf. It bought her time, but not enough to dawdle, as his backup caught the drift of what was happening and moved to close the trap. A couple of the stragglers running off toward Blansky's stretch of the perimeter turned back to find a target they could see. Choices. She could retreat and seek cover in the woods, or press on over open ground to reach the house. It was no choice at all. Sons of bitches! Running and firing from the hip, Mindel advanced on her objective, on the men who'd killed her uncle and could never wash the bloodstains from their hands. Christos Andrastus let his houseman lead the way, followed by half a dozen mercenaries, six more bringing up the rear behind his party of seven. The Greeks' first impulse had been to kill Napier's bodyguards while the oil man watched, then fling Napier and Lynn Mock into the night to let them live or die on their own. But his rational mind had won out, reminding him that his partners might still be useful as bargaining chips. Alive, perhaps they could be traded for his own safe passage. Dead? Well, there was always time for that. His predecessor on the island had been paranoid, with good reason, as it turned out, and one of his architectural surprises was an escape tunnel leading from the house to a separate garage. Cars were unnecessary on Tira, where a healthy man could walk the island's length in twenty minutes, but the garage housed a variety of smaller vehicles, including three electric carts for hauling luggage from the pier up to the house. 
More importantly, the garage was located downhill from the house and a hundred yards distant, invisible from the villa proper and outside the perimeter of gunfire now circling his home. If Andrastus could make it that far, with his escort intact, he had a chance of reaching the Aristotle and sailing away from Tira before his enemies noticed. Napier and Mach were welcome to come along for the ride, but they'd be disembarking before he reached Athens along with their gunmen. He would give them to the med. They reached the kitchen pantry with its special cupboard slotted in among the others. Andrastus nodded to his houseman, watching Napier's face as the cupboard was opened, a secret catch released, and the entire wall of shelves swung outward to reveal a narrow staircase leading downward into darkness. At the touch of a switch, fluorescent lights flared to illuminate the staircase and the tunnel mouth below. Oh, you're kidding, right? Hardly, Mr. Napier. It's our way out to safety. If you'd rather stay and fight, of course, I'll understand. No, thank you. Where does this go? It will take us indirectly to the Aristotle. Indirectly? Tunneling between the house and harbor proved too difficult, I'm told. We're wasting precious time, Arnold. So we just sail away? A simple cruise. We can return after my people deal with the intruders. If they do. Have faith, my friend. And hurry, if you please. You first. Of course, Mr. Napier. Andrastus let his houseman lead the way, then followed him downstairs, the shotgun heavy in his hands. Behind him followed Mach and Napier with their armed contingent, mercenaries bringing up the rear to cut off any last-minute retreat. They reached the bottom of the stairs and stood before the tunnel's mouth. Even with lights, it still remained an uninviting place, a serpent's yawning throat. I don't like tunnels. By all means, go back to the game room then and make yourself at home. You said this place was safe, Androstus. It always has been in the past. I'm forced to ask myself how we were found. Perhaps you left a trail, my friend. Perhaps you're not as careful and as efficient as you claim to be. Now wait a minute. You have a choice to make, Arnold. Accompany me or stay behind. In either case, make up your mind. I won't stand here and argue while your enemies draw closer every minute. My enemies? Listen, Stay Chris. or go. Decide now. <sighs> Lead on. A wise choice. Andrastus turned and stepped into the tunnel's mouth. All followed. Lin Mach didn't like tunnels either, but he had seen the futility of arguing with Andrastus about their escape route, the folly of remaining behind while gunfire raked the house and grounds. In spirit, he was already aboard the Aristotle. Anything was better than remaining in this shooting gallery where every passing moment brought him closer to untimely death. If he survived the night, Mach vowed, he would have nothing more to do with Napier or Andrastus. He would slip away from them at the first opportunity and fly to Switzerland, where he had ample cash and travel papers in three different names. Asia was lost to him, but that still left five continents, a world in which to lose himself and spend the rest of his life in reasonable comfort without dreading every telephone call, each knock on the door. They might hunt him at first, the Chinese or his two erstwhile partners, but Mach had faith in his ability to throw the trackers off his scent. The trick would be escaping from Tira, then ditching Napier and the Greek before they could draw him into another mad scheme. He hoped that it wasn't too late already, but he couldn't concentrate on that, not yet. Mach needed all of his resolve and courage to survive the next few hours. Ah! Scared, are we, Mr. Mach? What the hell was that? Grenades? Jesus! We're almost there. I hope so. Christ, I didn't know you were one of the fucking mole people. Y you surprised me, Arnold. Oh, yeah, how's that? So high-strung, so nervous all the time. Amazed you've come this far in business. <sighs> I strung my ass. Let these wild men chase you for a couple of weeks and we'll see how calm you are. I trust that won't be necessary. We should be able to resolve this matter tonight, once and for all. They had almost reached the downward sloping tunnel's end. Up ahead, another short staircase led to a door around eye level. They reached the foot of the staircase. Here we are. Where's here? Have patience, my friend. It won't be long now. The Greek's houseman mounted the stairs, pistol in hand, and opened the door. He checked whatever lay beyond, stepping across the silent threshold, then came back and waved for the others to follow. Moments later, they were standing inside some sort of garage. In place of normal cars, however, the rectangular building was filled wall-to-wall -wall with motorcycles, four-wheel all-terrain vehicles, and several larger vehicles resembling golf carts. 
Napier surveyed their choice of getaway machines. What's this? We're going golfing now? Mind your manners, Arnold. You know there's no golf course on Tina. Mind my... Listen, you son of a... Andrustus racked the shotgun slide and turned to face Napier. The oil man's bodyguard surged forward, cocking weapons of their own. Another heartbeat found them ringed by more guns, ready to explode. Mock closed his eyes and wished he knew a simple prayer. Is this the way you want to end it, Arnold? I'd have thought you were intelligent enough to save yourself, at least. What are we doing, then? I've answered that already. We're going to the Aristotle. What, on these things? Yes, unless you'd rather walk. I'm getting fed up with being surprised, Christus. That's the bottom line. Then let us hope the enemies you've led to my doorstep will stop surprising you. Napier had no response to that, glaring past Lynn Mock until Andrastus waved them toward the nearest golf cart. The Greek put on a brittle smile. Gentlemen, please, take your seats. Around the time guns had started going off, Grimaldi decided he couldn't sit offshore and watch the party from a distance. He'd already scoped the north side of the island through a pair of field glasses that had been left aboard the rented cruiser, picking out the yacht anchored in a sort of harbor there. It sat a hundred yards offshore and something like a half mile from the house atop the island's highest ground. There was a risk involved, of course, and Bolin would be pissed off at his deviation from the plan. There'd be hell to pay if he blew it, but Grimaldi liked the odds. No lights at all were showing on the yacht, which told him that the crew had either gone ashore or was sacked out for the night. Smart Money said the crewmen would have used a launch to go ashore after the passengers offloaded and they finished their last-minute chores. It would have helped to have some law rockets aboard the cruiser, maybe a grenade launcher, but Grimaldi thought he could make do with his AKSU and a couple of thermite grenades he'd squirreled away from their perches in Athens, anticipating a possible need to torch the rented boat when they were finished with it. Now the incendiaries might be put to better use. Grimaldi hadn't spent much time at sea, but the cruiser's controls were rudimentary. He'd had plenty of practice on the trip out from Athens, getting used to the console before he had to manage under fire, with friends depending on him. As he turned for shore now, all that really troubled him was the possibility of an armed watchman dozing on board the yacht, or the greater likelihood of his being spotted by lookouts ashore. In either case, he guessed it wouldn't matter now that battle had been joined on Tira and the shit had most definitely hit the fan. Pulling into the small cove, he throttled back and brought the cruiser slowly in beside the yacht. He left some twenty feet between the vessels, eyeballing the decks for any sign of movement now, but all the action seemed to be ashore. If there was anyone aboard the yacht, Grimaldi reasoned, they'd have been awake and topside by now, checking out the fireworks. He cocked the AKSU and left its safety off, slinging the short rifle over his shoulder for easy access. Grimaldi left the cruiser idling in neutral and palmed the two thermite grenades as he left the wheelhouse, stepping up to the boat's starboard railing. The ghostly white yacht, Aristotle, he saw from its name on the bow, rode silently at anchor, almost close enough to touch. He pulled the first grenade's pin and flicked it over the side, cocking his arm for a pitch toward the pleasure craft's stern. That's where the fuel would be, he reasoned, or close enough. Once the thermite got started, it would burn through decks and bulkheads as if they were cardboard, until it found seawater and turned it to steam. Fire in the hole! <sighs> he tossed the grenade. Bolin was pinned down, still 40 yards out from the house. He lay behind a tree, hugging the turf, while interlocking fire from three or four automatic weapons chewed up the soil and undergrowth about him, sprinkling him with leaves and shredded bark. The home team had reacted more cohesively than he'd expected when the shooting started from the Carter section of the line. He'd shown himself, emerging from the trees and moving toward the villa, but the Mercs had come from nowhere, nearly tagging him before he scuttled back to cover under fire. Whatever happened in the next few minutes, Bolin thought the Greek had got his money's worth. At one level, it seemed a shame to kill such men, but they had chosen sides, the wrong one in this case, and they were standing in his way. Because there was no way around them, he would have to take them down, unless one of them caught a lucky break and tagged him first. Risking a glance around the tree, Bolin drew fire and jerked back, swiping mulch and sawdust from his eyes. Too close. But if he couldn't even spot his targets, how could he return fire and reduce their numbers? Shake them up, that was how. He carried the grenades clipped to his belt. Bolin ignored the frags and chose one of the thermite canisters. It wasn't made for anti-personnel work, but he knew he wouldn't have a chance to drop it on his enemies precisely. Shrapnel from a frag grenade was limited in range, and much of it flew upward when the charge exploded in an open space, like the expansive lawn in front of him. 
White phosphorus, by contrast, gave off smoke and heat. Its flash was certain to distract his adversaries for a moment, even if it didn't singe their flesh. <coughs> he yanked the pin and made a sidearm pitch, lobbing the canister some 40 feet in front of him and toward the house. He rolled out to his left, around the east side of the tree. Somehow, he'd caught one of the shooters in the open, maybe rushing up to take him by surprise. The tables turned when the white-hot flash enveloped him. The guy was now dancing a crazy reel across the lawn, beating at flames an ocean wouldn't quench. Thermite would burn in water, underground, in outer space. It was the devil's breath, and there was no escape. Bolin let the flaming scarecrow run, seeking his comrades. One of them was kneeling on the grass some 30 feet away, gaping in horror as his sidekick stumbled past. Before he could recover his composure, Bolin put him down for good. That left one more, at least. Bolin spied him off to the right, dodging through a haze of chemical smoke, making a run for the tree line. The executioner led the runner, craning for the shot, and cut his legs from under him with a burst of 5.45mm rounds. The gunman fell across his line of fire, twitching as Bolin stroked the AKSU's trigger one more time to finish it. He rose, preparing to advance across the smoking lawn, but froze there. What the hell? Turning toward the noise, Bolin saw a four-wheeled ATV burst into view, swerving along a paved track through the trees, running downhill in the direction of the shoreline. Two more came behind it, gunmen in the saddle, and behind the ATVs, a pair of golf carts, their electric motors purring. Bolin saw a Chinese face turn toward the house, toward him, before the first cart vanished on its downhill run. Lin Mok? Who else? Damn it! The executioner ran after the retreating vehicles. <laughs> Mindel! McCarter, I got Mock in my sights. Heads up. Our targets are running on wheels toward the bay. I'm in pursuit. Damn! McCarter slammed a fresh magazine into his Kalashnikov's receiver and jacked the slide. Huddled behind a massive poolside barbecue constructed out of brick and black wrought iron, he wondered what he was supposed to do next. How many of their targets were escaping? All of them? Should he fall back and join the chase? More to the point, could he withdraw while three or four opponents sprayed his precarious cover with gunfire? A continued assault on the house was pointless, but that didn't change McCarter's situation. Before he could retreat and join the chase, he'd have to take out those who'd pinned him down with streams of interlocking fire. They were using submachine guns, all 9mm by the sound of them, at least two firing from inside the house, while another lay behind a kind of cabana, belly down on the pavement and sniping at McCarter across the deep end of the swimming pool. Engaging any one of them meant exposing himself to another, unless... McCarter calculated distance while he unclipped a thermite grenade from his belt. Call it 20 feet from his position to the glass doors facing on the patio, where two or more of his enemies had gone to ground. They posed the greater threat, with concentrated firepower, and McCarter also recognized that his incendiary device would have a greater impact on the house than on bare concrete and tile. He hefted the grenade, rehearsing the pitch mentally before he pulled the pin and lobbed the canister overhand toward the house. <clears throat> it didn't have to land directly on his targets, or even penetrate the house, but the closer it came to his marks, the more effective it would be. Fucking grenade! McCarter rolled out to the right of the barbecue, keeping the brickwork between himself and the cabana gunner. Peering through the smoke, he saw that one of his adversaries had taken a thermite hit, rolling on the floor and bashing at his torso with both hands, while the other was up and retreating to safety. McCarter helped the second shooter reach his final destination with a short burst to the spine that punched him through the pall of smoke and out of sight. He crab-walked back to see how the cabana shooter liked the fireworks, ducking as another burst of parabellum stingers rattled past his face. Damn it! The bastard hasn't budged! This time, McCarter palmed a frag grenade and drew the pin, holding the safety spoon firmly in place. <clears throat> McCarter waited for the blast and storm of shrapnel to pass before he broke cover, rushing the cabana in a sprint. The shooter from the home team wasn't wounded, but he ducked long enough to keep from getting stung. Returning to his vantage point, he blinked to find his target closing fast and tried to use his Uzi SMG. Too late. McCarter stitched him with a rising burst that laid the shooter on his back, a wash in blood. McCarter fell back, running across the patio and into the trees, seeking a shortcut that would take him to Tira's harbor. Ah! The golf cart veered around a corner, nearly pitching Lin Mok from his seat. He clutched the cushion underneath him, hands like talons threatening to rip the vinyl upholstery. Beside him, Napier sat hunched forward on the small bench seat. His bodyguards were in the next cart back. They had covered roughly half the distance from the garage to the beach, the trio of mercenaries leading the procession on their snorting ATVs. Christos Andrastus sat beside the driver of Mock's cart, the shotgun braced across his lap. Security? You call this security? 
I call it your responsibility, and I grow tired of your complaints. Oh, really? Mock placed a hand on Napier's rigid arm. The oil man turned on him, livid, but seemed to think better of his next comment when Mock shook his head, a silent warning. They were in enough danger already, without forcing a quarrel and spilling blood among themselves. How long before we reach the pier? We are almost there, Mark. And so they were. The Greek had barely spoken when their paved track left the trees and leveled off to parallel a beach. Mark craned his neck to see ahead and recognized the dock where they had landed only hours earlier. Offshore, the Aristotle waited for them, dark and silent, with a smaller craft positioned off her port side amidships. Mock pointed, leaning forward as their cart sped toward the pier. Christos, shouldn't the other boats come in and... and... Christos, what the hell? Andrustus fired a shotgun blast. Mock gaped in shock as a fireball erupted near the Aristotle's stern. He was amazed the shot could reach that far, much less do so much damage to the mighty vessel. Another explosion rocked the yacht an instant later. No shot from Andrastus this time. The Aristotle's stern was all ablaze now. Flames reflected on the water for a hundred yards around. Andrastus slapped his driver's arm and pointed toward the pier. Move it, you moron! I'm driving as fast as this goddamn pokey thing will go! The driver's head swiveled as he searched for enemies on the beach or at the tree line above them. They reached the pier seconds later. This blast seemed to emanate from somewhere deep below decks of the Aristotle, the vessel listing to port and settling deeper in the water. From his seat in the cart, Mock saw the smaller boat swinging clear of the stricken yacht. The Greeks' mercenaries opened fire from shore. Enough! They're out of range. Okay, what's plan B? To stay alive and avoid our enemies ashore until more transport can be summoned. Well, what about the launch? Be my guest. It has fuel enough for 10 or 12 miles, then you drift. I'll take my chances, Christus. Yes, my friend, you will. The mercenaries closed ranks with Andrastus as he spoke, blocking Napier and his four men from the pier. But you will take them here, with us. So this is how you treat your partners? Those who bring the devil to my doorstep and then try to run away? Perhaps. You're fortunate I care enough to save you from yourself. Oh, don't do me any favors, Christus. We have a chance to stay alive. But not at sea with three or four men drifting in a boat where they already have a vessel waiting. Stop and think. I know a man on Crete, a helicopter pilot. He will come for us if I ask him. And how do you plan to do that? Shout across the ocean? Andrastus smiled and slipped the cell phone from his pocket. You surprise me, Arnold. I assumed you'd be familiar with the marvels of technology. <sighs> all right, all right. So make your call. But can we do it on the move? I don't like standing here where any bastard with a piece can pick us off. Bola knew he couldn't have outrun speeding ATVs, and while it might have been a toss-up with the golf carts over a limited distance, they had a lead he couldn't close by sticking to the paved road they were following. Instead, after some yards, he took a chance and veered off through the trees, crashing down the slope toward where he knew the med lay waiting for him, dark and still. For all he knew, there could be tripwires, gullies, muddy slopes waiting to spill him, weaponless, with broken bones, down to the beach. And still he ran, trusting the pull of gravity to give him extra speed. Sprinting downhill was always faster if a runner didn't twist a knee or snap his ankle, trip on something in the undergrowth and crack his skull against a tree or stone. It wasn't skiing, granted, but he made good time angling across the slope as he descended, making for the pier that had to be the jumping off point for his target's flight by water. When he was halfway down the wooded slope, the explosion came from somewhere in front of him. The house was at his back and well above him, telling Bolan that the blasts had emanated from somewhere at sea, north of the island. He immediately thought of Jack Grimaldi on the cruiser, wondering if a patrol boat had surprised him after all, or if he'd run too close to shore and met disaster from a lookout with some weapon that could reach him from the beach. When he was near the bottom of the slope, Bolan saw firelight through the trees, reflecting on the harbor's glassy surface. From the tree line, he could see the source, a once great vessel now engulfed in flame for nearly half its length and plainly sinking. Water boiled around the stern as if the hull was breached and flooding her below decks, but it couldn't quench the fire topside. Even from a distance, Bolan recognized the smell and glare of thermite, and he glimpsed the cruiser nosing out of firelight into darkness there beyond the breakwater. Grimaldi, right. But he wasn't the victim in this piece. He was the player who exceeded his directions and, at least this time, might well have saved the day. Three hundred yards downrange, he saw the carts and ATVs parked on the grass and sand around the pier. 
He didn't bother counting heads. However many of his enemies were there, Bolin would have to take them all. If Mindel and McCarter couldn't help him, then he'd try it on his own. I'm on my way. Have you caught them yet? They're at the pier. Jack scuttled their ride. Good job. I'm there in five, if you can leave me some. <laughs> no promises. Bolin started down the beach. It troubled him that they'd heard nothing more from Mindel, but he didn't chase the thought. There could be any number of reasons for her continued silence. Bolin refused to write her off so easily, but neither could he count on her for help right now, when their primary target stood before him and he found himself alone. Even McCarter's five minutes might put him on the scene too late, if Napier and the others had a backup plan in place. But it looked like they were arguing among themselves. He saw it now, drawing encouragement from the delay that let him close the gap between them. It would be too much to hope they'd shoot each other while he watched. But if they only stalled a little longer... No such luck. His quarry began piling back into their vehicles. God damn it! <clears throat> Desperate, refusing to be left behind, Bolin found more speed somewhere inside himself, sprinting through dappled moonlight toward the pier. Driver, follow the beach due west. Give me time to make the call. The cart lurched into motion for a jerky start, rear wheels digging briefly at the sand. Then they were moving. Andrastas let the shotgun rest across his lap, glancing back at the Aristotle's flaming hulk as he punched the number into his cell phone. Yes? Andrastas here. I have immediate need of your assistance on the island. Yes, sir. I'll be right there. Andrastas's driver suddenly slumped forward over the steering wheel. Andrastas, still clutching his cell phone, spun around in his seat. He spotted a gunman sprinting after them along the beach. Get that bastard, you idiots! Andrastas's bodyguards started pulling away on their ATVs. Come back and fight! Andrastas triggered two quick shotgun blasts that brought them back, making U-turns on the beach and narrowly avoiding collisions with one another, like members of some inept motorcycle drill team. Now stop that bastard! Andrastas used the shotgun as a lever, shoving his dead driver out of the cart. He scooted across to the driver's seat. Napier, Mark, hang on. We're not done yet. It crossed his mind that his business partners were dead weight now, slowing the cart. But then Andrastas thought of them as shields, a fleshy wall to block his adversary's aim, and he felt better about taking them along for the ride. The second cart fell in behind them, racing west along the beach through darkness, looking for a place to hide. Heads up. Our targets are running on wheels toward the bay. I'm in pursuit. The bullet missed Rebecca Mindel's face by fractions of an inch, came close enough to warm her cheek in passing, causing her to recoil and return fire, a burst from her AKSU, making the sniper dance before he collapsed in a lifeless heap. Come in, Blensky! Come in, Blensky! Oh, shit! What's wrong? Mindel found a snapped-off sprig of wire and plastic where her microphone had been a moment earlier. Damn it! She left the dead man where he'd fallen and the house in flames, retreating toward the island's northern shoreline. It struck her as bad business, leaving sentries still alive around the house, but they were pawns and strictly low priority. If Napier and the other VIPs were slipping through the net, her place was with the other members of her team to stop their quarry from escaping one more time. It seemed a long run to the beach, though it was downhill nearly all the way, no farther than a quarter mile. She had to watch her step, afraid of crippling injuries as she ran on through the trees and darkness. The sounds of combat kept Mindel on course. Finally, as Mindel cleared the last 20 yards, she could see muzzle flashes, bobbing headlight beams, and the reflected glow of fire on water. She burst through the tree line in time to see four all-terrain vehicles roar past her, weaving zigzag patterns on the sand as they raced toward a lone figure standing away to her right. Linsky? She knew it had to be. Her next action was automatic. Swiveling to track the ATVs, Mindel triggered a burst from her Kalashnikov that spilled the nearest rider from his saddle. The four-wheeled vehicle ignored his passing and ran on without him, albeit losing speed and swerving toward the surf. The remaining hunters missed her entry into the battle, so intent on riding down their target. All of them were firing at Blansky now, the black-clad warrior answering in kind as he dodged toward the tree line and cover. Mindel stepped farther out onto the sand and raised her weapon, sighting down the barrel after her retreating enemies. The next nearest was rising from his seat, firing at Blansky with a stubby SMG, an MP5K or a mini Uzi. Racing the AKSU's folding stock against her shoulder, Mindel triggered a burst that ripped into her target's shoulder and sent his weapon cartwheeling across the sand, while he slumped across the ATV's handlebars. Still, the shooter hung on, fighting for control of his vehicle and grappling it to a halt on the sand. Slumping to his left, he dropped from the saddle and put the ATV between them, shielding himself for a moment while he tried to draw a pistol left-handed. 
Mindel didn't give him time to get there. She drilled the fuel tank. The wounded gunner vaulted to his feet and headed for the surf in a clumsy, shambling run. Mindel used the last half dozen rounds in her weapon to drop him short of the water. She faced eastward in time to see Boland finish the last of the mounted assassins. The tall man moved to join her, Mindel staying where she was and glancing backward to the west where a pair of golf carts were fast receding out of range. The VIPs are all aboard there. We have to catch them. <laughs> Sudden crashing from the tree line brought them both around, twin weapons tracking toward the source of the sound. McCarter. Bloody hell! Don't tell me that I've missed the show. Not yet. The last act's on the road. All right. What are we waiting for? Napier glanced back fearfully along the beach. Fuming, he turned back to Andrastus, himself busy steering the golf cart. Your strike force is shot to hell. Next bright idea? We still have men and guns. You give up too easily. Give up? In case you had noticed, we just got our asses kicked back there. The helicopter is on its way. We're to meet it at the west end of the island. Great. Now that's if we're still alive, I take it. You can go your own way any time, Arnold. I can't slow down for you, of course. Feel free to jump. Just hurry up, goddammit! We're at top speed now. Sit back and shut up or I will stop. Napier felt Lin Mock watching him, but wouldn't meet his Chinese partner's gaze. Napier had no more slick solutions up his sleeve, and while he hated finding himself at the Greek's mercy, there was no other way off his island of death. Napier swiveled in his seat again and looked back toward the pier, then passed it to the latest killing ground. Two of the ATVs were moving, and at first it gave him hope, making him think he'd misinterpreted the images his eyes had picked out from the shadows and confusion on the beach. Maybe the Greek security detachment had been victorious after all. That desperate hope vanished as the ATVs came racing after them, running swift and straight along the beach. But fucking shit! The rider in front started shooting at them. Napier knew they were in trouble. They're chasing us on our own goddamn bikes! What? Andrastus looked back and blinked at their pursuers, then faced forward and bent over the golf cart steering wheel, as if his posture could gain them extra speed. Two of Napier's gunmen in the second golf cart were already returning fire, dueling with the ATV riders. Napier leaned across the back of his own cart. One hundred thousand dollars to the man who takes him out! One hundred thousand dollars each! At that, the driver of the second cart slammed on the brakes and grabbed his own weapon, stepping down from his seat to the sand and turning to face the enemy. Around him, the others piled out and did likewise, forming a skirmish line across the beach. What have you done? Just what it looks like, old son. I bought us some time. At least he hoped that was the case, but with Andrastus at the wheel, he wasn't sure. Their cart seemed incapable of doing better than 20 or 25 miles per hour, while the ATVs were capable of twice that speed. Heedless of the shotgun now, he poked Andrastus in the ribs. Hurry up for Christ's sakes, we don't have all night! Bolin had one of the ATVs to himself, while Mindel rode double with McCarter. Hunched forward on the buddy seats and firing past him as they chased their quarry westward, with the glassy sea off to their right, dark forest looming on the left. Bolin himself squeezed off a short one-handed burst, but wasn't happy with the AKSU's kick and concentrated on his steering as they closed the gap. He ducked when gunners in the second cart began returning fire, then switched off his headlight to make their job harder. Beside him, McCarter did likewise, while Mindel kept firing short bursts for effect. She hadn't scored yet, as far as Bolin could tell, when the second cart wavered, then lurched to a halt, its passengers hopping out with weapons in hand. Here we go! Deprived of options, Bolin braced his Kalashnikov across the ATV's handlebars and started down the beach, McCarter joining in as they raced toward the enemy picket line. 60 yards. 50. 40. At 30 and counting, the skirmish line broke, two of the shooters crumpling where they stood, two others breaking for the trees, while the last leaped back into the golf cart and gunned it for safety. Too late. Boland veered toward the tree line and the runners. McCarter and Mindel rode up on the cart driver's blind side and shot him to tatters, leaving him dead at the wheel. Boland's targets had given up fighting, but he strafed them anyway, dropping one on the sand, catching the second with a lucky shot just as he reached the trees. As he swung back from the trees, rejoining the second ATV, Bolin registered the chill sensation of cold liquid splashing his thigh. A downward glance showed him the clean hole where a bullet had pierced his fuel tank, gasoline jetting out in a simulated arterial spray. Shit! Bolin used his teeth to tear a strip of fabric from his sleeve, throttling back while he wadded it up in one hand and wedged it as a makeshift plug into the bullet hole. It was all he could do, but the ATV's fuel gauge was edging toward empty. He didn't know what kind of mileage the vehicle got, but guessed there were 10 or 15 minutes worth of fuel left in the tank at the outside. 
Bolin racked his brain for details of Pregnola's satellite photos. He knew that less than half of Terra's northern coastline featured beaches, the rest a line of rocky crags where breakers threw themselves against sea-scoured stone around the block. And while he couldn't see the far end of the beach yet, lost in darkness up ahead, he knew his adversaries had to be running out of road. Ahead of Bolin, the cart's driver appeared to panic, swerving toward the tree line for security. It was a serious mistake. The cart lost speed and traction all at once, sand spurting from beneath its fat rear tires. The driver tried to gun it, and the cart tipped over. Bolin slowed as its three occupants scrambled clear, one of them squeezing off a shotgun blast in his general direction. He couldn't tell if the others were packing, but Bolin took it for granted. Better safe than gut shot by an unarmed man. The executioner gunned the ATV and kicked free of its saddle at the same time, leaving the four-wheeler to roll on without him, losing most of its momentum before it collided with the capsized golf cart. Bolin saw his target scatter, one breaking for the woods, one toward the surf, the third sprinting on down the beach. Afoot, he took the nearest of the three, noting the shotgun in his target's hands. Behind him, Mendel hastily dismounted and pursued the runner who seemed bent on hiding in the sea. McCarter racing on after the third man. Bolin's adversary turned briefly to face him. He missed with both shots, then dropped his empty weapon, drawing something from his belt. The executioner knelt and tracked him with the AKSU, leading just enough to make it count. Bolin trotted forward and found Christos Andrastas stretched out on the sand, a cell phone clutched in his right fist. He had no other weapon. Mr. Andrastas! Mr. Andrastas! I'm on my way! You're too late. Bolin pitched the phone toward the trees. He turned. He saw Rebecca Mendel wading back to shore, knee-deep in foam, reloading her Kalashnikov. Lin Muck! I guess he thought he could swim back to China. How's that working out for him? Not so well. They both faced westward, marking the taillights of McCarter's ATV no more than a hundred yards distant. They found McCarter 30 yards beyond the ATV, standing atop a bluff that faced the sea. He peered down into thrashing darkness, where the breakers hissed and fumed on jagged rocks. Where's Napier? Crazy bugger went over the side! It was a drop of 40 feet or so from where they stood. Bolin leaned over, staring into the void, marking the place where waves drew phosphorescent patterns on the rocks. For just a moment, he imagined a pale face uplifted on the swell, then dashed against the cliff and sucked away. It didn't reappear, and after counting off two minutes, he drew back. He had counted on seeing the oil man dead, but there was nothing to be done about it now. They could drag the sea until doomsday and still find no vestige of Arnold Napier. Perhaps it was better that way. We finished here? Suits me. Yes. Good. Bolin keyed his microphone. Floater, do you read me? Five by five, where and when? The pier? Okay. Why not? We could have company along the way. Well, that's their problem. The beer floater, if you're finished bombing yachts. I'm on my way. Jerusalem. The bus stopped at the summit of Mount Herzl to disgorge its passengers. Every seat had been filled for the ride from downtown Jerusalem, the passengers riding in reverent near silence to their destination. Those who spoke at all did so in whispers, as if fearing to disturb their fellow travelers. From the bus stop, it was a ten-minute walk over sun-baked pavement to Yad Vashem, the Israeli memorial complex dedicated to Holocaust martyrs and heroes. Bolin made the walk that morning with Rebecca Mendel, David McCarter, and Jack Grimaldi, the four of them taking their time while others hurried on to make their guided tour of the facility. Bolin and his three companions were here on a private errand. They needed no tour guide to show them around or remind them of how they should feel. Two days had passed since they scourged the island of Tira with fire, and reports of the event had waffled through a 180-degree rotation, helped along with strategic news leaks from the States and Tel Aviv. Initially, it was reported that Christos Andrastus and a group of unknown guests had been attacked by terrorists and massacred on Tira, but later accounts suggested the Greek and his visitors had been engaged in some criminal conspiracy, the details left deliberately vague, when competitors from a rival syndicate had crashed the party and wreaked havoc with the home team. At the moment, while Bolin and his friends approached the solemn Hall of Remembrance, Greek police were scouring Tira for survivors and evidence of a far-reaching plot that imperiled Greek security and her relationship with Israel. 
Various employees of the Andrastis shipping empire were already in custody, along with certain executives of Global Petroleum, arrested in New York, Jakarta, and Cairo. No mention of a nuclear device or global terrorism reached the press. Charges could always be finessed as the legal proceedings dragged on. Andrastis was already dead, Arnold Napier listed as missing, though no one appeared to be pursuing him. No ID was available for the Chinese national found washed up on the beach a quarter mile west of the point where Andrastis's yacht, the Aristotle, had burned and sunk. Beijing officially ignored the whole affair, but rumors of a small-scale party purge in progress were reported by observers in the field to CIA headquarters and the White House. It was cool inside Yad Vashem's Hall of Names, where some 3.2 million victims of the Nazi Holocaust were memorialized. That still left nearly half of the Third Reich's Jewish victims unidentified. But the collection of names was ongoing, as it had been since 1955, and would remain in perpetuity. Adjacent to the Hall of Names, another chamber held the pages of testimony penned by survivors of those slain, preserved as Mazavoth, literally tombstones for the dead. Bolan had toured the Holocaust Museum in Washington and found it moving, but there'd still been something distant about that memorial, built as it was on American soil, so far removed from the scene of the crime. Granted, Jerusalem was nearly as far from the killing fields of Poland, Germany, and Russia as the District of Columbia, but Israel itself was a kind of living memorial to the victims of those dark years, lending a greater immediacy to the sacrifice. Uncle Yaakov visited this place a week before the madness began in Tel Aviv. He called it the heart of our nation. I never quite thought of it that way before. McCarter scanned the walls inscribed with names surrounding an eternal flame that flickered in the middle of the room. It's easy to forget. Here too. It's before us always, in our fiction, art, and history, of course. But current events always seem to take precedence. Today's victims and tomorrow's overshadow the past. For what it's worth, there'll be fewer victims tomorrow, thanks to Katz. Thanks to you. It doesn't matter what I've done. But he would be pleased to hear you say that. He was never far from Israel in his heart, I think. Even when he was traveling around the world. It makes me wonder, now. Wonder? If we ever really make a difference, all these dead, and some folks say it could have been avoided if Hitler was killed at the start, somehow I, I can't help thinking that some other monster would have come along to take his place. I mean, it, it feels inevitable somehow, if you follow me. Perhaps it was. I need to say Kaddish. Excuse me, please, I won't be long. Take your time. She knelt before a railing near the flame and began to intone the Hebrew prayer for the dead. <laughs> Bolan didn't understand a word of it, but the recitation still had a visceral power, drawn from Mindel's faith and from her grief. In some small measure, Bolan knew those attributes reflected the soul of a nation besieged, fighting for its life for more than half a century from the day it was born. Fighting forever? Endless war? He knew the feeling from personal experience. The bitter loss and lust for vengeance tempered into something more enduring than revenge. The soul of a crusade. Where would the battle take him after this? Would he prevail? Surrounded by the dead, Mac Bolan closed his eyes in homage to a fallen friend. Tomorrow's enemies would come when they were ready. And the executioner would be there, waiting for them. One more battle in the everlasting war. It was his promise to the dead. <laughs>